Hello everyone. In this video you will see the full version of the Mantua Dark Moon The Blood Altar. You can jump to any part of the video via the timecode in the description. I ask you to put a like and subscribe if you liked my video. After all, it will help a lot in the development of the channel. So, let's go. One day, a man told a girl named Sua that whatever people said about her, he would believe in her. Everyone in the village was stunned by the death of a boy named Chris, for he was only 12 years old. Everyone immediately noticed the bite marks on the boy's neck. There was no blood left in the body at all, which meant only one thing. The vampire had done his best. Some of the villagers objected because there had never been a vampire in their village. Everyone immediately thought of a girl named Suha. It is said that after her appearance in the village constantly occur misfortunes. Just recently Chris's house caught fire and now his family has suffered a new sorrow. Are the rumors about vampires really true? One spring afternoon, Chris approached a girl sitting alone under a spreading tree. He said that he had heard from the villagers that the girl was a real vampire, so he decided to ask her directly about it. She looked surprised at first, and then looked away embarrassed. But the boy wasn't confused and reached out to her to try and befriend her. He said it was the first time he had seen her on the street during the day and asked her what the girl's name was. The girl turned away and snickered in response, and the boy decided to turn it into a joke and asked if the girl's name was Ham. To this she got angry and said that of course that wasn't her name. The boy then called her Suka and asked if that was the right name. He said that he actually already knew what the girl's name was, for she was something of a celebrity in the village. It's true that the adults rarely call her by her name. More often they just call Suha the recently moved vampire, to which the girl said she wasn't a vampire. The boy was surprised by this and said that according to the local Suka, often moves from place to place doesn't come out during the day, and at night she hangs around alone and catches pigeons to eat them. The girl said this was not true, especially the last point. The boy said he didn't believe it either. Suka sat on her knees and with her hands in her hair, asked why she was always surrounded by such strange rumors. The boy asked why then Suka did not appear outside during the day, for that way she could go out and tell everyone that it was a lie. The girl thought that no matter how much she says, no matter how many dozens or even hundreds of times she denies it, no one believes her because they think she has strange powers. For as long as she could remember, she had been told that she should never use her powers, because if she showed them to the rest of the people, they would begin to suspect the girl, and her family didn't need to draw attention to themselves. Her parents always said that if Suha showed her abilities in front of people, everyone would consider her a vampire. Because of this, the girl began to wonder if she might be a vampire and was afraid that it would all turn out to be true. However, the boy said that he was sure that Su Ha was not a vampire. He said he was lame from birth. And when you think you are different from everyone else, it becomes scary to cross paths with them. After all, so many people gossip about those who aren't like them in any way. The boy said that once he heard from his parents that they would regret his birth and he was afraid that these words would become true. But now he is not afraid of it because he knows that these words are not true and his parents love him. That's why the boy doesn't fall for such nonsense anymore. He once again offered Suka to be his friend and said that the other boys don't take him to play either. The girl agreed to be his friend. From that moment on, Suka had a friend for the first time. It was the first time she enjoyed every day. The first time she wanted to tell someone her secret and she was finally able to do it. She thought the boy would be scared but he was only a little surprised and said it was a very cool ability. Saha was surprised and asked if the boy really wasn't afraid that she might turn out to be a vampire. He said he wasn't scared at all since he knows the girl. She was very surprised and asked if that was true, to which the boy replied that he wasn't afraid at all. Saha thought that she was still afraid that she might be a vampire, but her thoughts were interrupted by the boy who asked, in all seriousness, if she wanted to try to bite his neck. The girl was very indignant at such a suggestion and said that of course she would not do it, for there was little chance of anything going wrong. The boy said that everything was alright and he believed her. The girl trembled at such words and hugged herself, 
She could not accept such an offer because she thought that there was a chance that she herself would turn out to be a vampire. The boy said there was nothing wrong with her doing it not now. He said she could bite him when she believed she could trust the boy, and when she believed in herself. He asked Sua to promise that. When she could believe in herself, then she would bite him on the neck. The girl thought that now, for the first time in her life, there was someone who believed in her more than she believed in herself. She thought that meeting Chris was the greatest happiness of her life, and every moment together was filled with joy. She was looking forward to what was ahead of them. She wanted to call Chris to admire the fireflies next week, and this time she wanted to go to him herself, to his village, to his home, to him who always came to her first. However, when she arrived at the boy's house, she found a burning house and panicked villagers. Some of the people were shouting that Chris was still inside and at that moment, Suha realized that she had to save him because he couldn't get out on his own. She rushed toward the burning house and remembered her parents' instructions that she should never use her powers, that she shouldn't show them to strangers or she would be suspected of being a vampire. But right now, the girl didn't care. She ran forward and thought, that she didn't care what people would say about her, and it didn't matter how they would look at her. Such nonsense didn't bother the girl anymore, and she was determined to use her power to save her friend. As the roof of the house began to fall, the girl caught it with her bare hands and held it above her, as if it had absolutely no weight. Seeing her friend, Chris was overjoyed and said that since she had come to save him, it didn't matter what people said. Chris will always believe her, he said that a person with such a warm heart just can't turn out to be a vampire. Sua cried at such words, because all this time she thought that she was haunted by misfortune, but now she knows that it was all just for the sake of their meeting, so that she began to realize her value and that she never forgot such a friend. After a long time, the girl transferred to a very famous academy. The mentor said that she was the first transferred student in a long time and asked to be reminded of the girl's name. The young lady said that her name was Suha. The mentor told the girl that Dizelis Academy, in tribute to their founder, as the girl herself might have noticed, operates at night. Classes start at 9 in the evening. It might be difficult for Suha to get used to it at first, but she was sure she would quickly get used to it. The woman also said that, so far they had no rooms left in the new dormitory, so they had to allocate a room for the girl in the old wing. No one uses that room so it might be a mess. Sue so said it's not a big deal. The mentor said that according to the rules of the academy, uh, it was never allowed to leave the school grounds after sunset, and that didn't even concern the academy rules so much as the girl's personal safety. The woman said that recently not far from the academy de Zealous was committed a murder, and according to rumors it was the work of the vampire. The mentor assured the girl that their academy was known for its strict admissions procedures so she wouldn't meet any vampires within the walls of the academy, but it could be dangerous outside its walls. Suha listened attentively to her mentor and accidentally bumped into some guy. They stared into each other's eyes for a couple of seconds. Then the young man averted his gaze and walked away from the girl and the mentor, apologizing. The woman had already led Suha to the room where she would be staying. The room was the most extreme of all and was far away from the other students' rooms but the mentor immediately promised the girl that as soon as space was available in the new building, she would immediately move Sue into the new room. The girl said that she didn't need to worry about it or change anything, as she was happy with this room. The mentor accepted the girl's decision and said that in that case she could go to her room, settle in and rest. As soon as Suha entered the room and closed the door, she immediately looked around. The room was a mess, things, books, even some clothes were lying everywhere. The window was open wide open. She wondered if this was her room. Even with all the chaos that was going on in there, the girl was still glad to finally have a room of her own. She had been so worried while she was talking to her teacher and hoped her mentor hadn't noticed. Right now, Suha was over the moon. She was able to transfer to the best school in Riverfield, which was known for its strict policy towards vampires. So definitely no one here would consider her a vampire anymore. Because of Sua's strange abilities, she was always labeled as a vampire, so she had to move to new places again and again. Even if her room was in the middle of nowhere and dirty, she could clean it up. But the girl began to think about her powers again. They had done little good in her life. Now she remembered what Chris had said to her in the house on fire. 
He had said that a person with such a warm heart simply couldn't be a vampire. She recognized that meeting Chris and revealing her secret to him had been one good thing after all, except that she would never be able to see it again and feel as much trust from someone as strong as him. The moment the girl lifted the bed over her head to move it to another place, the door swung open abruptly. Standing on the threshold was the same young man she had accidentally bumped into in the hallway. At first they looked at each other for a couple of seconds, and then the guy, having recovered a little from the shock, said that he had forgotten a book in this room. Sua immediately threw the bed on the floor and began to say that the guy had misunderstood everything and of course was unlikely to believe her after what she had seen. And no one would believe her. But she really wasn't a vampire. At these words the girl realized that she cried and thought that everything was lost because she had transferred here with such difficulty. But the boy had already said quite calmly that he knew Suha was not a vampire and believed her. The girl raised her head at the young man. She couldn't believe his words. The guy said that no vampire could penetrate the walls of this academy because the school has strict rules regarding the inspection of entrance. And looking at the girl's face, you can immediately understand how upset she is. Sua sincerely thanked the young man for believing her. She said that anyone in her shoes would feel like that. But she certainly doesn't want to be considered a vampire because she despises vampires more than anything else in the world. That's why she told the guy that he couldn't even imagine how happy Suha was to be able to transfer to Dicellus Academy because there are no vampires in that school. She's so happy now that she won't be confused with vampires anymore. The guy said that the girl must have suffered a lot from that in her life and she replied that that was still putting it mildly. She said that she couldn't count how many times she had been suspected and all because of those damn vampires. According to the girl's parents before she was born, Vampires were nothing more than stories from books, but apparently something went wrong. Suddenly, the girl remembered that the young boy had come to get his book and ask where he had left it to look for it. The boy replied that there was no need to do that, and he would find the book himself, but the girl had already done so. Examining the cover, she said that the book must be very old. The guy replied that he was a bit interested in such books. Sua so asked if by any chance, this was why the young man had entered Decelis Academy. After all, this school is famous for its library and collection of ancient editions. The boy replied that it was partly because of that. The girl said she liked to read too. She didn't have much friends at school before, and so all she had to do was read. Suha thought that in truth, she could only call Chris a friend, but she said out loud that this was the first time she had seen a person who reads such books because not many people read books nowadays. The girl casually asked what the book was about. The boy was a little embarrassed, but he said that in general terms, the book contained all kinds of old stories. Suha said that since it was such an interesting book, she would also take it to read later. Suddenly, as if realizing something, she apologized to the young man. The guy didn't understand it and asked why the girl decided to apologize. Suha said that she apologized for probably being too annoying because she was very happy to meet them. She said that it had been a long time since she had interacted with people without prejudice. The guy said with a smile that it wasn't a big deal as he enjoyed chatting with the girl too. Suha blushed a little and gave the guy the book. He thanked the new girl and said that he had to go now. As soon as the door closed behind the guy, the girl thought that she should have at least learned his name and offered to meet again sometime. After all, this was a chance to make a friend and she ended up losing him. As soon as the girl thought about it, the door opened again and the same guy stood on the doorstep. He said he forgot something else and asked what the girl's name was. Sua told him her name and immediately stared at the floor in embarrassment. The guy asked if she wanted to know what his name was. The girl in even more embarrassment asked what his name was, to which the guy said with a chuckle that he had asked for it himself. And now he was silent, but he would tell her. The boy's name was Heli. He was in the 12th grade at DeSalis Academy. Heli proposed Suha to become friends, to which the girl willingly agreed. After recognizing the girl's name and telling her his, Heli left, saying that they would meet again. In the hallway, someone called out to Heli, calling him Chun. The guy turned around and saw a kid with red hair, Gino, who was smiling happily and waving to his young. He said that Heli had been gone for a long time, and he thought the guy had disappeared somewhere. He wanted to go home without him, but he was lucky enough to meet Heli. 
The young man apologized to his friend and said that he had gone to talk to the new girl for a while. Suddenly, another guy appeared abruptly behind Gino's back and asked who the new girl was, since they said it was a girl. Heli replied that it was indeed a girl, and that she was staying in the room that no one but their company was using. Gio was surprised and asked if Heli was definitely talking about that old room that looked more like a warehouse. He thought it might be very uncomfortable to live there. The third guy said he liked it so much because of the remoteness of that room, and now they wouldn't be allowed to go there. Heli said he wasn't sure about that because if they made friends with the new girl, they could safely look in there. It would be very easy to do because Hiaran very easily finds common language with many people. Suddenly, another member of their company appeared behind the guys. He mentally said that making friends with a human was just nonsense. Healy immediately recognized the guy. That was Solon. Healy also mentally told him that he had already introduced himself to the new girl and offered to be friends with her. He also told him that the girl's name was Suha. In this telepathic conversation, the fifth guy intervened. He said that Solon is right and they're not allowed to socialize with others. Solon confirmed this and said that they didn't need to. Heli thought he knew what Solon was worried about, but there was something wrong with this girl, for there was something about her that was like themselves. Sion was surprised and asked how that was one of them. Gino asked how this girl was able to get into the academy then. Solon said that there was no way she could be like them, since they were one of a kind. Heli confirmed that the girl is not one of them, but she is also not an ordinary person. He senses something strange and appealing about her. Sion wondered what it was that Heli was saying and if he was really just falling for the new girl. Solon thought, where would they get such feelings? And even if they do, they can't be friends with humans because they wouldn't accept them anyway. The fifth boy supported Solon and said that humans getting close to them in vain would only bring danger upon themselves. Heli remained silent and Solon interrupting the telepathic link said that, be that as it may, none of them should go near the new girl. At that time, Sua was just standing behind Solon's back and heard his last words. Solon said that no matter what, none of them should go near that new girl again. And Sua was standing at the guy's back just then. She heard those words and she felt uneasy about it. Heli noticed Suha and Uhe quietly. The girl thought she was already hated and remembered a moment from her childhood when she wanted to make friends and play with the other kids. And they surrounded her. And the most powerful boy in the company said that the other kids shouldn't play with Suha because she was a vampire. He said that according to the stories of the adults, I one befriended her, misfortune would await everyone. The girl lowered her head and thought that it was the same as then. All she wanted was to make friends with someone, to make a new start, but it ended up the same as when she was a kid. She thought that now these guys would look at her the same way those kids did in the distant past. But looking up, Suha was surprised and didn't understand why all the guys were staring at her like that. Suddenly, Sion, with a happy smile, approached the girl and, holding out his hand to her, asked if she was the Suha he had heard so much about. He asked if it was today that the girl had transferred to their academy. Suha confirmed these words, and then Sion told the girl his name and offered her friendship. The girl gladly accepted the hand extended to her and agreed to be friends with Sion. Suddenly, Gino intervened and said that Sion was always causing trouble and that the girl should not be friends with him, but instead should be friends with him. He also told the girl his name and shook her hand. The fifth guy, who had previously supported Sion in thinking that he shouldn't be friends with the new girl, somehow changed his mind and after rubbing his hand a little on his own shirt, extended his hand to her and said his name was Ian. The girl was excited to meet all the guys. Thane told her to ignore what Solon said because none of them agreed with the young man. He also said that it was natural for people to show friendliness towards the new girl. When all four guys introduced themselves, Sua looked at the last one who hadn't introduced himself to her. She thought it was probably Solon. However, the girl didn't like his wariness and what he had said before. Just as she thought, Solon just disliked her. That's all. His cold stare made the girl's heart clench every time. And yet, it was the first time she had ever been welcomed by someone as much as these guys. They all seemed so cold to her at first, but are they really all Heli's friends? Suha didn't know what Heli had told them about her. Solon was about to leave and waited for his friends to follow him, but Ayin said Solon could go without them. Heli asked where Suha was going now. 
the girl said she just wanted to look around the campus a bit. Kelly then suggested that they take a walk together and give her a familiarization tour at the same time. At first, the guy decided to show her where the library was because he remembered from their last meeting that the girl loved to read. The girl agreed, but then Cyan intervened and said he wanted to go with them and asked her to take him along. Suha agreed, and after that Ian and Jeonga also came along. Ian said that they would love to show her around the academy, and Jeong confirmed that they were serious. Suha was a little confused by this, but agreed and said it was very nice of the guys. Salin was angry at his friend's behavior and asked if they were all going to herd around the academy for some sort of tour of the school. Cyan said that Salin was right. It wouldn't be convenient, so he might not go with them, but Jayan tried to persuade his friend to go. Salin was reluctant at first, but he went with his friends. Just as Heli had said, they went to the library first. It really was a luxurious place with an incredible amount of books. Suha asked Heli where he had gotten the book he was reading now. The guy replied that this book was very old, so to take something like that you had to have special permission. The girl was even a little upset that she couldn't take something like that. But Heli said that he would tell her what the book was about when he finished it. That made the girl happy, and she thanked Heli for that. The next part of their tour was the classrooms. Ion was showing Suha where the 9th grade classrooms were. Right around the corner were the 10th grade classrooms, and the 11th and 12th grade classrooms were a little farther away. The fact that Zion was in the 10th grade, just like Suha also had to be mentioned. Ian and Gino were in 11th grade, but he decided to leave out Solon for some reason, but he said that Heli was in 12th grade. Suha was surprised by this and said that even though the boys are in different grades, they are still so close. She said that it's really cool. Solon was the only one walking a little behind the cheerful group and looked at the girl suspiciously. Heli explained to her that it was no surprise because all the boys had grown up together. The girl didn't understand that and asked how that was possible. Heli said that they all came from the same orphanage. All of their parents had died and the boys had been sent all to the same orphanage where they had met. Solon was incredulous that Heli had given the girl such details and mentally asked why he had done it. Heli ignored the question and the girl apologized to them. The next destination was the sports field. Gino said that all the athletes were busy practicing right now because an important eight ball match was about to take place. Most likely the remaining two were just on the field right now. The girl asked why two and Gino said that they usually go in groups of seven. But the guys who were absent now were taking the game very seriously. Being confirmed that those two just love to compete. So they practiced tirelessly. The guy was sure that their team would win anyway. The girl wanted to ask what kind of game it was. IT ball but suddenly a ball flew at them. Ian reflected the ball, and the other guys immediately rushed to cover Suha from the blow. Seeing the ball, the others realized that it was launched by the two guys who were practicing right now. Closer to the edge of the field, two guys ran up and apologized for the ball hitting the wall. One of them asked if his friends were okay. Ian called the guys by name, Noah and Jaka, and said they needed to be more careful next time. Jaka said they were lucky that the ball flew right back in Ian's direction. The guy got a little angry and those ran back onto the field. Ian turned back and asked if Sua was okay, if she was too scared. But he saw an interesting picture. Heli cradling Sua against her, seemingly without even realizing it. Realizing that their friends were looking at them, the guy and girl pulled away from each other. Heli apologized for that and asked if Sua was okay. The girl replied that she was fine thanks to the guys. She blushed a little and lowered her head and said that she was very grateful to all the guys for today. They had purposely taken their time to help her. Hallie said they all had fun, but the girl said she had to go and quickly ran off to her room. Sion didn't understand why the girl ran away, and Ian assumed she was just scared of the ball. Already standing by the door to her room, Suha tried to catch her breath and thought about how it was so strange to have a guy hugging her like that. It was the first time. Suddenly, the girl was called out by someone's voice. She turned around and saw Solon in front of her. Selen came almost close to Sua and asked her if she knew his name. The girl didn't understand the question at first, but then answered that the guy's name was Selen. The guy was about to leave, but the girl suddenly thanked him for that incident. The guy didn't understand and asked what incident the girl was referring to. 
She answered about the incident at the sports field when a ball flew at her. That's when Solon grabbed her by her clothes and pulled her back. Solon was a little embarrassed by this and said that it was nothing like that. He just noticed dust on the girl's uniform and decided to shake it off that way. Suha thought that was nice enough too. She replied that she was grateful to Solon anyway and offered to be his friend. But the guy suddenly became serious and told the girl not to even think of getting close to them. They don't make friends with other people, especially people like her. Solon thought to himself that he had some strange feeling from this girl's presence, some incomprehensible strong attraction. As he left, Solon told Sua not to even talk to him or his friends from now on. Later, the boys all gathered in one room and discussed what had happened. Sion said that he seemed to understand what Heli was talking about when he said about the strange attraction. Gino said it was probably about this new girl. Na is definitely not one of them. Then why does she cause such inexplicable feelings, as if some strange force is leading the heart itself? Ian agreed with his friend, but could not find a suitable description. Then Heli intervened and said that it felt as if they wanted to do whatever the girl wished. All three boys agreed with that description. Sion couldn't believe it. He thought it was true love, but how could it be possible for everyone to fall in love at once at the same time? Gino interrupted him and said that they couldn't experience emotions like that. Ian said that he feels something else besides all that, but many times stronger. Meanwhile, Saha was standing outside her room and was already starting to cry a little. Solon, who was about to leave but turned around for some reason, asked what was wrong with her face. The girl almost cried and said that since Solon wanted her to, she wouldn't even say hello to guys. The guy was embarrassed by this and said that the girl could say hello to them and talk a little and generally do whatever she wanted. Solon asked the girl not to misunderstand him right now. He didn't hate the girl. There was another reason. He wanted to give a reason already, but at the last moment he changed his mind. After all, the other guys will definitely disobey anyway. So the girl doesn't need to focus on Solon's words. The guy turned around and left, wishing Sua a good night. In the evening, the girl was more excited than ever, for it was her first day at Dizelis Academy. As soon as she came out of her room, she immediately ran into Heli. He said that he had come specifically to go to classes together to get better friends because that was what Suha wanted. The girl thought that Heli was taking care of her so that she wouldn't feel uncomfortable after transferring to a new school, and that was very nice of him. As they walked down the corridor of the academy together, everyone said hello to Heli or waved at him, and he would say hello to everyone in return and wave back as well. Saha thought Heli was really popular, although it was understandable since he was so cool and friendly. Saha thought that Heli wasn't just polite to her, and for some reason blushed at the thought. The guy noticed this and leaned closer to the girl and asked if she was uncomfortable being around him. The girl started to deny it, saying that it was just the opposite and she herself was afraid of making the guys uncomfortable because of her. She said that all seven of the guys have been very close since she was a little girl and now she is trying to fit in with them. She realized that not many people would like that. Heli replied that it's all nonsense and it must have been Solon who said something like that to her. Sufa said that wasn't true but thought to herself how Healy could have guessed that. The guy said that Solon had said all those words then not out of malice and asked the girl to ignore it. He said that the reason for Solon's words was not because of Suha, but because the guys had a secret that no one should know about. Heli said the last words already in the girl's mind, and she was very much surprised by it. Heli said that only Suha knows about his gift of telepathy, except their company because Heli trusts her and believes that the girl will not reveal this secret to anyone. After that, Suha and Heli separated, wishing each other good luck in class. When Saha entered the classroom, Cyan was already there. Seeing the girl, he was very excited. Suha thought that she was very lucky to study in the same class with Cyan. The guy pointed to the seat next to him and told the girl to sit there. Suha looked at the desk and noticing things told Cyan that someone was already sitting there. On Cyan, smiled and said that it was okay. It was Solon's seat and he could be asked to sit somewhere else. At that moment, the girl felt something wrong and turned around and saw Solon behind her, angry as hell. Saha, so noticing the boy, said that he didn't have to find another seat as she could sit somewhere else. Solon said he didn't care and could sit if he and Sion wanted to. The guy gathered his things and moved to the seat right behind the girl. 
When the bell from class rang, Sion came up to Sua and asked what they were going to do now that class was over. The girl said that she wanted to clean up her new room after class. Sion happily replied that he would help the girl with that. As Suha was walking down the hallway towards her room, in her thoughts she heard Heli calling her name. She turned around and saw a guy smiling sweetly at her and waving. He walked up to the girl and asked her how her day and lessons were. Sua said that she was fortunate enough to be in the same class as Sion, so everything went smoothly. Heli asked if it was true that since Suha was in the same class with Sion, she was also in the same class with Solon. She said that was correct. She was sitting next to both guys since Solon had given up her seat. Heli was surprised at this behavior of her friend and at the same moment Solon passed by them. The guy said that he didn't give up his seat at all. I was just taken away. Ayn came up to the company and having heard the whole conversation, said that of course Solon should have given up his seat to Suha since she was new. Then Gino joined in. He said that since Suha is new, they would need to look after her and help her out. Sean said that his friends were right, and if Solon didn't like something, he could move to the very back of the class. Solon was not happy that his friends were now supporting some new girl instead of him, but there was nothing he could do about it. While the rest of the guys were busy squabbling amongst themselves, Saha told Hallie that she wanted to do some cleaning in her room today, and they dramatically wanted to help. Using telepathy, the guy asked if he could join them then too. Sua replied that he could do that. Solon, noticing something strange, began to guess that Heli had shown the girl his gift. In Saha's room, the boys had already started cleaning, but the girl insisted that she could handle it herself. Putting the box away, Ian said that the girl should just stand there and breathe. John confirmed his friend's words and said that they could handle everything themselves much faster. Sion, beaming with joy, said that he loved cleaning more than anything else in the world. Sua replied that she would help, and going to the first box that came into sight, which was covered with a cloth, she got ready to take it in her hands. He wanted to warn her not to try to lift the box herself, but it was too late. She picked it up and asked why she shouldn't and what was inside. Suddenly, the cloth covering the box came off and the girl saw the weights. He said that these weights weighed 100 kilograms and everyone was stunned that a girl like Suha could lift it so easily. The girl was starting to panic, but Heli came up to her. Smiling sweetly as always, he said that the girl should give the box to him. When the girl was surprised at such a suggestion, Heli used telepathy and said that she could be calm because he had that ability too. He asked if that was the reason Suha was scared of him or if she might hate him. The girl said there was no way she would do that. Heli assured her that they wouldn't treat her differently either because of her power. At this point, Solon realized that Heli was communicating with Suha through telepathy, thus giving away her gift, and it made the guy very angry. He decided to ask his friend directly, to which Heli replied that yes, he was indeed communicating with the girl using telepathy as of late. The rest of the guys realized it too, and when Ian wanted to say something, Heli turned to Suha and asked if the girl would keep his ability a secret. The girl immediately replied that of course she would. He said that in that case, it would remain only within the confines of their company. The guy also said that Suha has cool power too. The girl said that at first she was surprised by Heli's abilities, but then she realized that telepathy was cool. Suddenly, Cyan jumped into the conversation. He said he could walk on walls and, as proof, demonstrated it by walking on the ceiling. Solon was very unhappy that the two had already revealed their abilities, but no one thought to stop. And picked up the gym equipment with ease and twirled it on one finger, saying that these were his weights, and while Suha didn't live here yet, he had been practicing here. John came up behind the girl with a flame lit on his hand and jokingly said that if Suha's hands got cold, she could always turn to him. Now Solon was just furious at the boy's recklessness, but he noticed the glint and anticipation in Suha's eyes looking at him. He asked what she was looking at him like that for and said that he was no good at any of that. The girl seemed upset with the answer to which Solon said that he can do some things but he will never show it. He said that if the guys were done cleaning up, it was time for them to leave and left the room slamming the door loudly. Heli said that they all really should be going by now and wished the girl a good night. Suha thanked him for the day. When all the guys had left and Suha was alone, she thought how nice it was that she had met such wonderful guys here. Thanks to them, she learned that there were more people with different abilities and she wasn't the only one. She wondered if the other guys thought 
something similar when they saw her and where they got their powers from. A thought popped into her head that these guys might be vampires, but she immediately dismissed it. She thought she had been bullied her whole life because of this misunderstanding, and there was no way she was going to do the same to the guys. She figured that Heli was the first person since Chris who'd ever believed her, so she'd believe him too. She figured that since there were people like her in the world, like Heli and his friends, she wouldn't be alone anymore. Under the cover of night, when all the students of the academy were already asleep, some unfamiliar figures snuck onto the grounds. One of them said that the place smelled so disgusting that there were obviously vampires around here somewhere. Soha looked around her room and couldn't be happy that her room was cleaner in no time thanks to the guy's help. She noticed a bag of garbage in one corner of the room and thought she should take it out. Taking the bag and walking outside, the girl thought that the path to the trash cans now looked a lot darker than she thought and far away. Classes would start at 9 o'clock in the evening and end around 2 in the morning. It's worth the slightest distraction and suddenly it's 3 o'clock. She remembered her mentor's words that there had recently been a murder near the academy and it was rumored to be the work of a vampire. Soho wondered why she remembered it now. She really wanted at this moment to tell all those who thought she was a vampire that she herself was afraid to face them. She tossed the bag into the dumpster and thought she'd be back in no time, but some male figure appeared behind her back in a flash and tried to grab her. The girl was immediately the first to grab the stranger's arm and throw him over herself. She wondered who the stranger was and if he was really a vampire. The girl only now noticed her attacker's school uniform and was surprised by it. She looked back and saw two more guys running towards her. The guys apparently not seeing the girl in the darkness, thought that one of the academy students dared to touch their friend, Kana, and decided to attack Suha. As soon as one of them approached the girl, she crouched down sharply and kicked him in the stomach. The guy bent in half and another one ran up to him. He said in amazement that she was able to take down even Nijak and asked what the girl was all about. So I asked the same question and in addition asked if the uninvited guests were vampires. The guy who had just approached said for the girl to take back what she said as they were not vampires. The two guys were approached by another guy who appeared to be named Angie. He turned to the second guy and after calling him by the name Putty, he told him not to mislead the girl. Angie said there was no worse insult to them than that. The newly recovered guy said they wouldn't stand for such accusations and Angie said they hate and despise vampires more than anything else in this world. The girl said she had the same opinion of them and gave the guys her name. She apologized for what had happened because she was very scared, though she was acting on automatic. One of the guys apologized to her for scaring her. A guy who introduced himself as Najak apologized to Suha for running up to her so abruptly. Another guy named Tahel said that Kang and Najak are pretty tough guys, so no need to worry about them. Angie apologized to Suha once more. And the girl thought at this point that usually in situations like this she was always mistaken for a vampire and these guys were talking to her like nothing had happened. Sua turned to Khan and said that he and his guys were wearing school uniforms but they were not the same as in their academy. The girl asked why they came here. Najak said that they are students of Sunshine City School and they came here to find some jerks. Suddenly from nowhere two guys appeared behind Sua's back. One of them asked what the students from the other school were doing here and why they were surrounding one of their students in the middle of the night. Kang said that they decided to do their own investigation into the murder that happened the other day because one of their school's students had died. Sua was stunned by this answer, and the guys who stood up for her asked what this murder could have to do with them. Kang said, how can the guys insinuate that they had nothing to do with it? The guy with Sua behind him said that such a thing is more about the Sunshine City students, which made them very angry. Kang asked if the guy was afraid of regretting his words. He said that the group of boys came here under the bright moonlight, and that was because they weren't even a match for them on normal days. These words made Najak very angry, and he was about to fight with Sua's advocate, but the girl was able to stop them. The guy who stood up for her was amazed that she could do it so easily and didn't understand how she had such strength. The other guy, who had been silent until then, said that they thought the guys from the other school were bullying the girl, but Sua said that wasn't the case. There was only a small misunderstanding between them, so there was no need to swear. At this time, from the back, 
Heli came up to all this company and asked what they were all doing here at this late hour. The guys from the other school seemed to grin, but they couldn't take a step under Heli's intimidating gaze, and the guy told them all to move away from Suha immediately. Turning back to the guy, the girl said that she had only gone to throw out the trash and they had had a little misunderstanding. Heli walked over to her and gently asked if she was hurt. Hearing that the girl was safe and sound, the guy was overjoyed. He said it was late and dangerous to be outside. So he would walk her to her room, but the girl didn't really want to leave without understanding the situation. The head of the company of strangers asked why Heli thought he could just leave like that, since they weren't done yet. Heli's gaze became rigid, and he said that he had nothing to talk to them about, so they could get out of their academy. Kang decided to take a chance and asked directly if the death of one of their school's students was the work of the academy students. Heli replied that they had nothing to do with it. Um, angry Najak asked if they thought it would be enough to just deny it. One of the guys defending Suha said they don't do that, to which Kang asked if they could prove it. The other guy said they have the same question for outsiders. Kang said they came to the academy for a reason, and they have reason to be suspicious of the students here. Heli asked what in that case he was going to do if it turned out to be them. There was an intimidating energy emanating from the guy, and Suha felt it, and was even a little scared. King was ready to get into a fight, and Heli was ready to defend himself, but they were interrupted by Suha, who asked Heli not to start this again. When Heli looked at the girl, his gaze immediately softened, and he apologized for making her worry and said that they wouldn't fight. He also said he knew why Khan suspected them, but it really wasn't their doing and he hoped the guys would believe him. Dahal asked Khan, if they really have to take Heli's word for it, Heli says that even if they don't, he wouldn't want to fight with the other school students right now since Suha is scared enough as it is. But if they do want to settle things, there's a neatball competition coming up. Why not settle things on the field? No fist fights, but civilize settling things through sports. King and Heli glanced at each other, after which the leader of the outsiders turned to the girl and told her that they would be leaving today and apologize to her again for scaring her. But this incident and the nightball have nothing to do with each other. So the academy students should not act rashly because the Sunshine City students will be watching them. Likewise, Khan added that they will wipe their team out in the game. King told the others that it was time for them to go. But Tahel didn't understand why they would just leave like that. Najak said that the academy students seemed to think they could win this year's nightball competition though the other guys would be back in this match and they could win. Heli offered Suha to walk her to her room, to which she agreed. On the way, the guy apologized to the girl, but Suha didn't understand it and asked why. Heli said that he apologized for almost getting into a fight right in front of her. The girl said there was nothing wrong with that since Heli stopped when she asked him to. Walking to her room, the girl couldn't understand what was going on with Heli at that moment. Even though he wasn't doing anything, but she felt on an instinctual level that she had to stop the guy, for she had a feeling that if she didn't, something terrible could happen. In the academy's garden, Solon looked up at the nearly full moon, holding out his hand to her. The skin on his hand was beginning to furry, and he was already getting excited thinking he was getting the hang of it. Suddenly Angie appeared behind him. He told him that Solon was a werewolf. The boy didn't expect to be here with more than one, and turned around sharply to see the speaker. Angie said that, come to think of it, they had seen each other before, but this was the first time he was introducing himself to Solon. He gave his name and said that he too was a werewolf, though not a half-blood like Solon. Solon said he was different from the other werewolves. Angie said there was no point in hiding it since he'd seen it all before, but he was more interested in how it was possible since Solon was half vampire and half werewolf. Angie couldn't understand how it was possible, since they were born to be enemies historically and by instinct, so he asked how it was possible. Solon retorted by asking why he should tell. Angie agreed that the guy didn't have to answer, and if Solon didn't want him to, he didn't have to answer because the guy had asked it just out of interest. Solon said that Angie should be the one to tell him what he forgot at their school, especially at this hour. Angie replied that he and the company just wanted to ask them a couple questions about the murder that happened the other day. The guy said that one of the students at his school had died. There were clearly visible bite marks on the victim's neck, and there was not a drop of blood in the body. 
Solon was angered by these words and asked if that was the only reason they thought it could be the work of the academy students. Angie said that they were the only ones in those neighborhoods, but Solon objected, saying that they didn't do that sort of thing. He said it was pointless to deny the feud between the two schools, but the werewolves themselves were far from angels, especially on the eve of the day of the full moon. Angie said that was true, as they too feel intense thirst and give in to their innate instincts when the moon is full, yet they do not harm humans. Solon said that they don't touch humans either. Solon's company is different from other humans, or rather, from their point of view. It is humans who are different from them. Angie asked why on earth they think they are different. Solon says that just now Angie asked how he could be of mixed blood. Solon himself doesn't have an answer to that question, because the guy himself has no idea what he is. But he's not the only one who thinks so. His friends don't know about their origins either, as if they were artificially created somewhere and woke up from a long sleep. Solon said that it wasn't them anyway, and though people will think that they and those creatures are of the same origin, the guys themselves don't believe they belong to them. The guy said that if Angie doesn't want to believe him, that's his right and he's not looking for understanding from werewolves. Angie said she hopes Solon isn't lying too because at least half the time, but they're still of the same blood. Suddenly Angie heard the voices of his friends who were already looking for him everywhere. He told Solon that he had to go now, but added that next time, they met they could at least say hello. Angie said goodbye to Solon and left the guy alone to ponder what had happened. Outside the room, Suha thanked the guys for walking her out, but Heli said she shouldn't do that. He suggested that from now on they throw out the trash together, especially at a time like this. The girl agreed and remembered the guys who had helped her. They were Noah and Jaka. She thanked them separately for showing up at just the right moment. She asked how they knew what was going on. If they'd heard the commotion and come to help. Aka said that was the case, but now Sua wondered why Heli had come there. The guy was a little embarrassed and said he was just passing by. Sua thanked Heli again and wanted to say something, but she stopped herself. She thought to herself that she had almost blurted out that she was actually glad that Heli had come, saying goodnight to everyone. She went to her room. As soon as the door closed behind the girl, Noah and Chaka asked in one voice through telepathy who the girl was. Heli said her name was Suha, and she had recently transferred to their academy. Heli asked if they had gotten to know each other yet. Chaka asked what kind of person Suha was, since she was definitely not an ordinary person. While they were walking down the road from night of all practice, the guys felt suspiciously strong waves and came to the source. Jaka said that the source of the power was exactly that Suha. He had never felt such a thing before, and this force was overwhelming him. Noah confirmed this and said that when they wanted to attack the werewolves, Suha stopped them. Her words had made the boys unable to move, as if mesmerized. Jaka asked if Suha was one of them, to which Heli replied that she wasn't. He said that he realized from the girl's words that she hated vampires more than anything else in the world. In her room, Suha thought back to her meeting with the guys from the other school. She remembered Khan's words that they came to the academy for a reason, and they had a reason. Sua didn't understand why Khan had said that, and whether it was true that Hallie and the guys had something to do with that murder. In the boys' room, Ian was surprised and a little angry that the werewolves from Sunshine City High had broken into their academy grounds. Hallie said that it was all true because the victim of that murder case was a student at their school and the werewolves would probably blame them for what happened. In was angry about the accusations. Sullen walked into the room and asked that they were all exactly in his room. Ian replied, that that the room where they had met before was occupied. Gino said that Sullen's room was the cleanest and centrally located, which was very convenient. Sullen replied that Sion's room is also centrally located, so why aren't they meeting there? Sean replied that he doesn't want to let everyone in so he doesn't have to clean up afterward. Solon wondered why he was against it since when they were cleaning Suha's room. Sion said that he loved cleaning. Sion said with a cute smile that Solon was stupid for not realizing that because mentally he said that wasn't true. Jaka told Solon that their school was recently raided by werewolves. Solon said he remembered that. But when asked by Ian how he could have known, he said it was just that there was a nasty smell going around the school, and he suspected something wrong. He said that all the werewolves were disgusting and wild. Heli told the boy not to overreact. 
for it seemed to him that the werewolves were sure of what they were saying. Chaka was outraged and said that they weren't capable of such a thing, and why did the werewolves think it was their doing? In fact, Gino said, there had been rumors recently that the murder had been the work of a vampire, because the blood had been sucked out of the victim's body, and there were bite marks on his neck. On the contrary, it would be logical to assume that it was the work of the vampire. Vampire attacks on ordinary people had become more frequent lately, so it was no surprise. Heli said that, even though they knew they hadn't done anything, he wished Shuhu knew about it. Sullen said that they'd all done enough to make the girl have doubts. So he'd been right to warn his friends not to get close to her, but they hadn't listened and had shown her what they were capable of. Jocko was surprised at Sullen's words and asked if it was true that the guys had shown the girl their powers. The guys decided to pretend that they were doing something important. And Sullen said that it was true and that the guys had gone crazy trying to show off for Suha. The only one who didn't show her his powers was him. Noah said that even they didn't know Solon's abilities. So it wasn't surprising. Suddenly the boys themselves were curious about Solon's abilities, and when he refused to show them, Jaka suggested that the older man might even be a normal human. Cyan said that if that was the case, they could bite Solon to test who he was. Solon got angry at such suggestions and said that he was definitely not human, to which Cyan said that they were just jokes and no one was going to bite him because they believe him. The guy said that Solon has a unique ability after all, and that is to grunt like no one else in the entire world. Sean said that it really is a very powerful power. Heli said for Cyan to stop bullying his friend and added that he doesn't want any misunderstandings with Sua to happen anyway, especially in a negative way. Gino said that, for what it's worth, she said that she hates vampires, and Ayan replied that he doesn't want the girl to hate them as well. Solon said that if they didn't want that, they needed to be careful from now on, not to talk to the girl unnecessarily, not to show that they were somehow close. One could just say hello. But no more than that, Jaka said that Solon was right and that the other boys had been very reckless and that they should be more careful from now on. The next day, after classes were over, Sua was approached by Sain and asked if she wanted to go out with him this weekend. She asked where her boyfriend wanted to take her, to which Sain said they would go to the main square, eat ice cream, walk around, and they could also go to the beach. The girl liked the idea, but she also asked if they would be alone or if they would call the others. Suan replied that it would be just him and Suha, but then Solon intervened and said he would go with them too. Using telepathy, Cyan asked indignantly why Solon was interfering with their plans. Solon replied that he didn't know what Cyan might say if he was alone with Suha, so he would never leave them alone. He also said that they had already decided that they would not get close to the girl, to which Cyan replied that he had told himself that he had lied that time too. This made Solon angry, so he decided to tell all his friends that Sean had decided to call Sua to go out to the main square this weekend. Upon hearing this, all the guys said they were going too. Solon didn't expect such a decision from Jack and Noah. After all, they supported not getting close to Suha. While Sian and Solon were arguing amongst themselves, Heli decided to mentally talk to Suha. He asked if Suha would really go to the main square on the weekend. Earl said she was, then the guy asked her permission to go too. Suha couldn't refuse him in appearing behind the girl's back. Heli said that he would look forward to seeing them on the weekend. At the appointed time, Sua was waiting for the boys in the center of the square. Sion was the first to appear, and waving his hand to the girl, said that the girl had come early, though he had intended to come before her. When Saha didn't see the other guys, she asked where they were, to which Sion replied that they had some important things to do, but it was no big deal, because they could have fun together. Shin offered to show the girl the square first, and she agreed. Sua thought about the fact that Heli must be busy since he couldn't come. What if he had something important come up? Suha wanted to ask what happened, though then changed her mind, deciding that would only distract the guy, after all. Still, the girl wished Heli had warned her in advance. Sean led Suha to the ice cream tent and told her she could choose any ice cream she wanted. The girl chose vanilla. Sion ordered a mountain of vanilla ice cream. Shaha at this time thought that Heli could only use telepathy when he himself wanted to. She thought that she could always contact by phone, but she liked this way better. The ice cream man made a huge cone of vanilla ice cream for Saho, which Sion handed to her. 
He said that he asked her to make her ice cream as big as possible. The girl thanked him for taking such care. As they sat on the bench and ate their ice cream, Cyan asked if it was really good to have fun like this, just the two of them. The girl agreed. But at that moment, Ian's indignant voice sounded in Cyan's head. He was asking where Cyan was because he'd made an appointment for 7 o'clock at night, and it was only 5 o'clock, but he was nowhere to be found. Shin decided to play dumb and said that he had said from the beginning that the meeting would be at 5. But the guys had misunderstood and gotten the time wrong. Solon said he wasn't just going to let the guy get away with it. And San replied that, let him try. After all, he and Sua would be riding on a boat and no one would definitely get them in the sea. Suddenly, Suka thanked Sion. The boy asked why. The girl replied that everyone had important things to do and they couldn't come. But he had come, so he had sacrificed his own things for her. Sion said that he was just caring. The girl said it was the first time she had ever been in a square, for she was afraid of crowded places. Then Sion suggested that she take a boat ride where there would be no people. The girl agreed and Sion went to buy tickets. While the girl was waiting for Sean, Heli mentally contacted her and asked if Suko was in the square. The girl said that she was and asked if he didn't have any urgent business to attend to today. The guy replied that it wasn't that the matter was very urgent, but it was definitely important. The girl asked what the business was, to which the guy replied that it was a meeting with her. The guy apologized for being late and told the girl not to go anywhere because he would come running to her. The girl agreed and suddenly remembered that Zion had gone to get the tickets. She thought that if Heli was coming now, she would have to warn him not to buy tickets. The girl went to look for Zion and turned into an alley thinking it would be quicker that way. But suddenly someone grabbed her and dragged her down a dark alley. The stranger clamped a hand over the girl's mouth and Suha looked at the stranger trying to figure out what was going on. She noticed the stranger's red pupils and pulled herself together and threw him over herself. She began to examine him. Sua thought his claws were too long and sharp, and also those red eyes. Could this creature really be a vampire? Just as the vampire opened its mouth to bite the girl, it was sealed into the wall by a powerful blow from the evil scion. Soha was facing a real vampire. Her face was blue with fear and her skin was sticky with sweat. The unexpected encounter took her by surprise. The creepy monster's fangs adorned its mouth. The monster's neck was instantly encased in the strong arms of another opponent. Sean easily threw the distraught vampire away and broke through the wall with its body. His gaze read emptiness, as if his emotions had consumed his mind. But the red pupils gave away his true nature. The adrenaline made him look like a predator, like he was fighting for his prey. Soa tried to reach him. That's probably what helped him come to his senses quickly. The guy came to his senses and wondered if his buddy was okay. The heroine began to explain that she had gone to look for Shion, as suddenly this strange man appeared. She spoke with interrupted phrases because the very fact of meeting with her potential enemy seemed impossible. Soa trembled at the sight of those red eyes, whose master only grew more furious. The mad creature broke free of the student's grasp and lunged at him, knocking him to the floor. Sean himself did not expect such an outcome. The girl rushed towards her classmate, now no longer afraid. She had to help him, and in order to do so, Soha made the decision not to hide her true strength. As she approached the monster, she cracked the ground where the monster was. Unfortunately, the vampire turned out to be much more cunning and agile. He appeared from the right and reached for her terrified face. Abruptly the space filled with green smoke, behind which Jan's figure lurked. He managed to throw his opponent away with a single blow so hard that dust clouds rose from him. Jaka picked up Suaha in his arms and rose into the air, which was a shock for her. And in order not to scream, the girl covered her mouth. Her stalled reaction made the guy want to explain that he did it because he was in a hurry. Suaha joked back as if she had been a princess in her previous life. The guy went down to the others looking to see if their friend was hurt. Fortunately, Suaha was fine, but now they had to do something about the vampire. The sun hadn't set yet, and the monster had shown up in a crowded place. Sure, this alley barely gets any sunlight, and the vampire was covered in clothing. Except for the protagonist's new pals, other creatures were not supposed to be active until the sun had fully set. Suddenly, the mysterious man ordered the girl to be given to him, 
It was now clear that Suo had been his target all along, and the vampire was not alone. Several other dark figures appeared behind the guys, exuding dark energy. The vampires looked like crazy people. Jane instructed Jaka to get Suha away from there faster to a crowded place. This provoked the enemy to activate and rush after their prey. They failed to reach her as the student was faster. In an instant, the two figures disappeared into space, ending up in an empty place after a while. Suha mentally decided that Jaka's superpower or it was teleportation, because even then he too appeared abruptly, picked her up and took off, and now the guy was carrying her at such a fast speed that she started feeling dizzy. The girl asked him to stop because she was getting motion sickness. At this moment, Gino was plowing the bodies of the vampires with fire, demanding that they tell him who sent them. With each question he asked, the size of the flames only increased. Noah, however, explained that these guys were from a lower class of vampires who had almost no intelligence, which meant answers were not to be expected from them. Jaka took Soha to the center of the square, but Solon wanted to know from Shion, who was with her, how this could have happened. The guy only had time to step back. He was clearly upset, but dared to explain himself. Sean stepped away for a minute to buy tickets, and when he came back, Soho was gone. Solon was angry that his friend had left a man who didn't even know the way. However, no one could have foreseen this outcome of events. Besides, it wasn't a coincidence. The girl was trying to recover from her motion sickness. Jaka was worried and wanted to support her somehow. He fidgeted from side to side until Soha thanked him. The guy's face flashed when she said she was glad for his help, and he couldn't even get a word in edgewise. The protagonist even wanted to know how Jaka had managed to pinpoint her location with accuracy. A second later, another thing caught her attention. A tall silhouette stood in the distance and looked directly at her. The guy with blonde hair was smiling, but Soya's face became increasingly lifeless, as if she had seen a ghost. The main character recognized him as Chris, but the eyes of the once joyous lad were nothing but emptiness. While Soha was trying to make her way to her old friend, someone was trying to reach her mentally. Hilly inquired about her condition, wanting to find her right now, but the girl's attention was completely focused on Chris's silhouette. Suddenly Khan appeared in front of her, so she froze in place. He was happy to meet her walking in the square. So apologized to him because she had to go. But the werewolf didn't let the new acquaintance take a step either. It was already too late though, Chris's silhouette had disappeared. That's when Jaka covered Soha with his body, which made her embarrassed. But the same could be said of Khan because he tensed when he realized that they were together. The protagonist wanted to refute that, but Jaka interrupted her. Suddenly, the guy was called by his friends who suggested a boating competition. They too were excited to see Soha until they spotted him, their blood nemesis. On the other side appeared the vampires who were also rushing towards their friends. The two species met each other with heavy glances, but Heli saw fit to approach the protagonist specifically. He apologized for the lineup because he was worried. It was all right as they made it in time to come to the rescue. Khan, on the other hand, was curious as to what the reason was, and Suha explained that vampires had shown up. The young werewolf hadn't expected her to say that, it seemed, and so each of them shuddered and hated her. What was strange was that the monsters were wandering around at the wrong time for them. Fortunately, the vampires had dealt with them, so there was nothing to worry about now. But Khan was in a terrible mood because they would not have originally allowed Suha to be in danger, and that provoked John. Gino appeared behind him just in time. The young werewolf, on the other hand, saw it as an excuse for the girl to stay away from those rascals. He was saying it for her own good, and the next weekend they asked her to go out with them, but Sean didn't let them talk, pretending that Suho had already promised them. In that case, they could meet the week after. The vampire glowered as if the protagonist would be with them forever, as if they already had all their time crammed in. It didn't come to a fight because they were separated. By the way, Sean's birthday is coming up in three weeks, and the guy invited her. One of the werewolves didn't believe it, so the vampire invited him too. But they were so pissed off, though even though there was strife between the races, the guys agreed because that's what Suha wanted. 
and so when she was in her bed, the girl remembered the man she had seen in the square. As she thought the silhouette of the stranger was very similar to Chris, if he was still alive. But that could only have been her imagination. It only looked like him. Soha herself didn't understand how she couldn't help but recognize him. Had the guy been alive all this time? But then why hadn't he been looking for her? Tears of grief streamed down her face, which was covered with resentment because the old one had just disappeared. She didn't care about any of that right now, as long as Chris was alive. The protagonist tried to reach out to him, convincing herself that he hadn't forgotten her. They had been close in the past, playing together every day. Moreover, the guy said he trusted Suha and asked to bite him. And that was the truth. Chris really remembered it. His bright smile graced his snow white face, but the protagonist's skin was damp with tears. It all turned out to be a realistic dream. Her gaze became glassy with the realization of reality. Chris couldn't be there, but that remained to be seen. Soha was nervous about the fact that it was darker that day than before. The reason was because of the full moon, except where was all the moonlight? Goosebumps ran down her skin because stray dogs appeared on the right. Soha was wrong. The creature was much bigger. Someone called out to the girl and asked what she was doing all alone at a time like this. It was Khan, and the guy was unlike himself. It was like a different personality. It was clear by the blush on his cheeks that Khan was nervous and shy because the girl was wearing the same pajamas. Soha got a strange feeling, as if this was not the Khan she knew. His eyes and those fangs were different. So the girl figured it was a matter of late. Though though, it might have seemed like it to her. Now Soha deigned to remember her inappropriate appearance. But the guy told her not to worry about it. It happens to him every day. What was more important was what the protagonist was doing in such a place. She didn't give a real reason, but lied that she wanted to see the night sea. Khan was confused that Suha came here alone so late just because of that, and in such a dark place. By the way, she thought there would be a full moon that day, but there was a lunar eclipse. When the sun, earth, and moon line up, the moon hides behind the shadow of the earth. It was an incredibly special night. Suha knew about it. But this was the first time she had ever seen it with her own eyes. So it was a lunar eclipse night. Khan's face flashed. The protagonist changed the subject and asked what he was doing here at such a late hour. The guy replied that he only wanted to admire the eclipse. Had Khan really come alone? The others were asleep right now. His face was covered with drops of sweat, as if he were worried or ashamed of the truth. Suddenly the boy offered his new acquaintance to escort her for the girl had met vampires today. He was worried, but he wanted to spend some time with her. Soha admitted that she was a little scared, and those vampires and stray dogs of all sorts. About the latter, Khan didn't realize it at all. On the way here, the protagonist had seen a pack of huge stray dogs. They were so gigantic, just like wolves. She was glad it wasn't them. Stray dogs couldn't be allowed to attack someone. Khan, on the other hand, exclaimed that they would never do that, especially those wolves. In his opinion, wolves were not bad animals. The girl agreed with him because she thought they were cool. That sentence made the man's face shine even brighter. He was glad that Suoha liked wolves. That turned out to be true though when she saw them on TV. In reality, to her, they were scary. This made Khan's face droop. The next day, Hili Rajani greeted Suha, who had come to borrow a book. The guy had just finished this one and came to give it away. The book was about ancient myths that had survived to the present. There were stories written about vampires, werewolves. They were known there to have harbored a grudge against each other since ancient times. Many examples could be cited where they clashed together. Soha knew that werewolves were humans who turned into wolves under the full moon but she wanted to know what happened to them on the night of a lunar eclipse. And could werewolves turn if the moon was covered by a shadow? Heli didn't know for sure, but these creatures would fall in love with the first girl they met on the night of a lunar eclipse, and they would love only her for the rest of their lives. It was so romantic, but lunar eclipses didn't happen very often, so it was rare for werewolves to fall in love. Soha decided to share that she recently witnessed such a natural phenomenon. She was worried, 
but still shared that the night after they went to the plaza, the main character went back there. The student wished to know what made her do that. But Suodha didn't give away her secret. She thought there would be a full moon there, but for some reason it was so dark, and as it turned out, it was because of the lunar eclipse. That's what Khan had told her. The phrase that they'd met by chance made Healy shiver, as if something irreparable had happened. The boy stood motionless, clenching his fists in anger. He pressed his lips together and looked down frantically. At her, when Soha inquired if anything was wrong, Heli smiled and asked to take him along next time. Though the girl noticed his face drooped for a moment, Suet guessed that he didn't like the fact that she was seeing Khan. By the way, Healy loved the sea too. The main character grew sadder. She wondered why Healy and Khan's company got along so horribly. Was it because their schools were rivals? So how it heard that they competed for the grand prize a nightball every year. In that case, she was justifying their feud. Oh, and the nightball tournament was just around the corner. The vampire decided to accentuate her attention on something else. So he asked how her school days were. If something suddenly happened, the protagonist could tell about it at any time. Fortunately, she was doing great. It seemed to be the first time in her life that she had ever been so happy to go to school. And it was all thanks to Heli. She'd even made friends with the boys because of him. Suddenly they were interrupted by Gino, who had expected the girl to be in the library. He caught sight of the two together and assumed that they had come to get books together. Sua didn't deny it, but she wondered what they were doing here. John confessed that his hobby was reading books and Sean had also picked up a book on introduction to quantum mechanics because it had become his passion lately. Jaka, on the other hand, asked them to stop lying and Noah held the book upside down in general. As it turned out, Gino had shared with them that Suha was in the library, which was why they had tagged along. Apart from Healy, none of them would read a line. The guys got to talking about the contents of the book. Healy said it was about myths that had survived to the present. It even talked about werewolves and vampires. Soha also cheerfully explained that on the night of a lunar eclipse, a werewolf would fall in love with the first person he met on his path, and that he would forever love only him. She thought that was pretty cool. The boys froze though. Watching her reaction carefully, Sean pretended to agree with her, even though he thought werewolves were just mere mongrels. Jan also added that if you just stood next to them, you could end up in the wool. Werewolves don't even have 10% human in them. And Solon was nervous when he heard that his friends thought werewolves were assholes. He had no choice but to agree. Gino, on the other hand, asked them to stop talking nonsense because Zoha thought werewolves were romantic. Solon compared them to vampires who were more well-mannered, neat, and aristocratic, except they couldn't feel love. The protagonist was firmly convinced that they originally lacked the warmth of a human heart. That's why they probably had no idea what love was. To her, vampires were just cold-blooded, cruel monsters. Compared to vampires, werewolves were many times better. Though Suha didn't even want to compare, she exclaimed that vampires were disgusting. Those words echoed in the boys' heads. Seeing their reactions, the girl apologized because of her emotionality. Gino explained that it was their fault. Of course, they understood why the protagonist heroine hated vampires. No one loved them. That was probably why Sean was too shy to give her the letter. When Soa stayed in her room, someone knocked on the door. On the doorstep stood Healy, who asked her to give him a moment. She apologized again for her recent behavior, even as he tried to leave her alone. The vampire knew that the protagonist had suffered greatly in the past due to false suspicions. But there was actually a far more compelling reason for her. The particular reason for her hatred was because the vampires had killed Chris. The tension made her clench her fist tighter and press them to her feet. So I explained that as a child, Chris had been her only friend. When everyone shunned the girl, calling her a vampire, he was the only one who believed her and played with her. Chris had even offered to bite him once, because he believed, though even Sua didn't feel that way about herself. Until one day the vampires did. How could she love vampires after that? Her body began to shake from the resulting anger. Would the girl ever be able to find a friend like that again? After a long pause, Hallie asked Suha if she wanted to bite him. 
He looked into her tearful eyes and waited for an answer, but that phrase only made the girl embarrassed. She would never do such a thing. It wasn't that she was uncomfortable. It was just that Sua and Chris had been very young then, and now the guys were growing up like that. It was unacceptable in a situation like this, though it was very hard for her to say it. Healy, on the other hand, didn't think there was anything special about it and even opened his neck himself. It was awkward and strange for the main character. She screamed and twirled around in different directions in disagreement. Still, it was an indication of her mate's trust. The guy was serious, even though he was looking forward to it himself. Soha decided to outplay him and asked him to bite her. For the request was embarrassing, which couldn't be said for Hilly. The guy was caught in a prostration and stuck in his thoughts, and fear was red in his eyes. The girl, on the other hand, decided it was embarrassment. She just wanted to show how close and trustworthy. A friend Chris had been throughout her childhood. He was the most precious thing to her. That was the reason for her vampire bickering. In fact, one of the reasons Soa wanted to transfer here was because of the local library. The protagonist confessed that she wished to find among the books the deliverance from vampires. The girl wished to avenge Chris. However, when she encountered the real monster that day and saw it with her own eyes, it was the first time she felt a shivering terror. She felt as if her whole body had been turned to stone, but Soa was finally convinced that vampires were the real monsters. Hilly was sad to hear that. Suddenly the girl asked him why he had come to her, which brought him out of his thoughts. At this moment, Sean was saddened by his girlfriend's words. A dark aura spread throughout the room where the others were. Gino, even though he didn't think so, he replied that Suha didn't speak then out of malice. If she found out who they were, would she be disappointed in them? That was a question everyone was asking, and not everyone was ready to give an answer. Solan, however, accepted the situation and explained there was no difference. That's why he told his friends not to get close to her. After all, guys should stick together. Sean seemed to be flying in the clouds and was already imagining how Sora was holding Soha. They wondered what was the reason for her hatred. The half-breed mumbled that from the human's point of view. It was understandable. Except they didn't hurt humans, but no one cared because vampires were the same to everyone and no one would believe they were different. Gino agreed with that point of view especially since they couldn't ask Suha to take their word for it. At best, the guys could accept to destroy all the other vampires. Sean, on the other hand, made a smart look and suggested telling the protagonist that only Solon was a vampire among them and getting Suha out of the water themselves. He was already imagining how they would protect her from the monster, as if it all turned out to be true. His friends would not forget his sacrifice. Solon will forever remain in their hearts. They kept joking around, and John decided to make this a plan B. Sure, it angered the already grumpy vampire half-breed, but right now, they would just have to try not to get caught. The boys were willing to even minimize the use of their powers. But if they were caught, would they be hunted again? After all, they had all barely escaped from the orphanage. Even if Soho found out that her new friends were vampires, she was unlikely to tell anyone. But Gino couldn't know that for sure. Solon didn't understand how he could trust people so easily after what they had been through. That day, the little girl had found a small group of other kids who had come out of nowhere. She let them inside and explained that this warehouse was unused. The little girl didn't linger and went to the door, trying to convince the newcomers that everything was fine and that they could feel at home. She asked them to trust her. But it wouldn't have occurred to her that real monsters had taken up residence in her home. Her panic had caused the hunt to announce itself. In the space was the sound of clicking from the guns. The locals had prepared. The men were looking for the vampires they were going to deal with immediately. But the boys were already running for salvation through the dark forest, holding each other back. Until someone found them. A tall silhouette explained that danger awaited them outside the shelter. The woman insisted that everyone return to Wamfield House. That meant the boys could only count on themselves. As it turned out, Holly had come to give an invitation to a birthday party that everyone would be having. It was the day they all ran away from the orphanage together. The main character was pleasantly surprised that the house was located in the middle of the woods. It must not have been easy to get there. 
Who would have thought that a luxurious mansion would be standing in such a wilderness? Sean pretended to have built it himself, but the boys had inherited it by pure chance. After escaping from the orphanage, they hid here for a long time at the goodwill of a benefactor. And after his death, he bequeathed the mansion to the vampires. They'd been in a pension school though, so they'd only been here on weekends and Sean had admitted to tending the garden. That was a lie too. Suddenly, the milky werewolves appeared behind Sua's back, which the girl was also pleased to see. Khan stood right in front of her and was covered in sweat as he was embarrassed. Sean covered the girl with his body and exclaimed that they were invited on a prank, which meant they should have realized that it wasn't necessary to come. Tahel was angry and replied that there was no point in celebrating the appearance, as if there weren't enough evil things to go around already. Suha interjected into their argument and offered to come inside. It was really cozy inside, and the atmosphere was conducive to a pleasant celebration. Khan wandered in embarrassedly, tail wagging behind Soha. His embarrassed reaction was cute, especially when he admitted that he missed his girlfriend. She, on the other hand, didn't pay much attention to those words and smiled broadly, admitting that she felt the same way despite the fact that they corresponded almost all the time. John heard Suha's words and was outraged that this guy was texting their friend. And how dare he even write to her? The main character intervened and showed a picture of a little kitten. Khan sent her adorable little kittens like that every day. The vampire glowed with feigned happiness and asked her to forward those pictures to him. Khan said that he loved animals and so did Suha. Gino, on the other hand, noticed that she had a lot of pictures of wolves. Did that mean she loved them too? And as the affirmative answer was heard, Khan turned as red as a tomato. It was hard for him to string a few words together, but Soa loved cats the most, and after them hamsters, bunnies, squirrels, sheep, deer. Suddenly, the main character remembered that she hadn't yet handed over the gift she had prepared for everyone. It was a vampire self-defense kit. Not everyone was happy about this gift, but Soa was worried that anything could happen at the moment so she prepared it for their own safety. Gino tensely thanked her while the rest of the vampires tensely watched the scene. The werewolves cheered because Suha was so thoughtful. Sean freaked out and asked what they even brought them as a gift. If the students came empty-handed, they should have gotten the hell out of here. Uh, the young werewolf showed pebbles, grass, a greeting card, and dust that wouldn't be too bad for the vampires. But Suha saw a gift behind Khan's back. As it turned out, it was meant for her, which was so unexpected and strange at the same time. The guy asked her to open it quickly. The gift was a picture of adorable wolf cubs. It was the cutest picture she'd ever seen, which made Khan even happier and redder. He was mesmerized as he watched his friend's reaction as she looked at his baby picture. As dusk began to fall, Soa decided it was time to leave. She had had a wonderful time, which Healy was very happy about. The boys would stay in the house tonight because there was still some cleaning up to do. The main character even offered her help, but the vampire refused and asked her to be careful. At that moment, werewolves appeared out of nowhere and offered to escort Sua out. And after walking for a while, the girl remembered that the photo Khan had given her was Shion's. The vampire never returned it, so she said she had to go back. The main character was nervous because she had to get her gift back as soon as possible before the sun went down. Once the girl was there, she called out to her friends, opening the door and greedily gulping air to catch her breath. She stood at the threshold and observed the mess of the house. It seemed the young vampires hadn't started cleaning up yet. Had they really decided to take a break first? Yes, and for some unknown reason there was a sepulchral silence inside the house, as if the guys had vaporized. But in one of the rooms a light was shining behind that door. Were they? In their true form, a shiver gripped the body of the protagonist, in whose eyes darkness appeared. In the bloody room, the young vampires were eating their prey, and when they saw Soha, they froze in surprise. A hot blush appeared on their faces, as if they were embarrassed. The predators watched the reaction of their friend, who tried to take a step back. Her own body was not obeying her. As Soha stepped back to escape, she was called out by those she despised more than anything else in the world. 
The girl's face was filled with fear. She seemed to be mesmerized by this picture. Healy was one of the first to try to stop the protagonist, asking for a chance to explain. But the boy's fangs were bared more strongly, which alarmed her even more. Soha had rushed away down the stairs while the vampire ran after her, embarrassed that the girl had learned their secret. He even allowed himself to get inside her head where he repeated his words again. I mean, she had ordered him to stay out of her head with telepathy. That was creepy. The phrase echoed in Hallie's mind. However, everyone was startled because of her sudden appearance, but now the protagonist was running away through the thicket of the forest. She was trying to recover from what she had seen. Was it real? Had Healy really turned out to be a vampire? Were they all vampires? Then that was the reason why the guys possessed such abilities. Tears washed away the sadness and hatred. That was why the werewolves had come to the celebration, with good solid reasons, and why Hallie had been petrified when Suo had asked to bite her. Was that really the reason he asked to trust him? The protagonist couldn't believe it? For the first time since Chris's death, she felt like she had found real friends. She thought she was lucky to have met someone with whom she could share similar interests. The protagonist felt the charm of school life for the first time, and they had been lying to her all along. Her body was no longer listening, and now Soha sat on the grass, sobbing from the pain she was in until she felt someone's presence. To her left stood a tall silhouette with intimidating brushes. He was moving straight in her direction, but the protagonist for some unknown reason thought at first that it was Healy. The girl demanded that the guy stay away from her because she hated vampires more than anything, who was now standing right next to her. But it wasn't Healy. So a frozen fear, as her friends tried to come to their senses, Heli had told his brothers that he was going to go after her and explain everything. But what would happen next? Did he really think Sua would listen to him? Especially after the girl had seen them like this. No one knew what they were going to do now, but Solon was pretty sure that now rumors would spread throughout the school. That meant they would have to run away and wander again. But would Sua tell what had happened? He knew that she hated vampires more than anything else in the world. So the protagonist wouldn't ignore them being in the same school with them. John, on the other hand, thought it would be a good idea to try to set up a meeting and talk quietly first, at least through telepathy. But if Healy did that, he might scare her even more. Jaka was tasked with finding her location. He explained that the waves coming from her were pretty strong, so the guy would do it in no time. But something wasn't right. There were a whole lot of vampires near Suho. In the thicket of the forest, the protagonist was surrounded by monsters. Her body was petrified and her speech was incoherent, but help was on the way. Soha was trapped by the vampires who were enjoying her sweet smell. Mentally, the guys were trying to contact each other to find out where the main character was now. Luckily, Healy was running straight towards her. The others would be there soon too. But the monsters had already started rushing at the girl. Cutting through her hair in space, she managed to break free from the circle. She couldn't even scream in fear, only her tears spoke for her. When one of the monsters practically grabbed her shoulder, Soha managed to deftly turn around and make a footstep to keep her opponent out of the way. Her strength was incredible because one light punch and the vampire would fly away in different directions. However, they had the advantage in numbers. One of them grabbed the girl by the neck and began to squeeze. Someone had to help her, and but even Healy, the one who always came to the rescue, turned out to be her worst enemy. She managed to scream out Khan's name. The rest of the wolves heard the voice of the main character trying to fight off the monsters. Fortunately, it was all behind them now. The first to arrive was Haley. Of course, he realized that he was scaring her with his appearance, but they weren't who she thought they were. Soha didn't believe his words, but wished it wasn't true. But the man's reaction was the opposite. He could not lie to her because he realized that Soha was not one of them. And it pissed the girl off that she trusted him so easily. The protagonist was called out by someone. She turned her head and saw Chris, safe and sound. Sua couldn't believe it was true. Jika contacted his brother and asked if he was near Suha. At the moment, they were the ones fighting off the vampires using their powers. 
so were the werewolf. Jaka right now was feeling the same kind of waves of strength as hers right next to the girl. Healy was startled after hearing the phrase. He had just dealt with all his opponents, and now the girl was talking to some Chris. Soa trembled at the sight of him. Tears rolled down her skin, washing away the dirt, and her eyes couldn't change the point. The boy himself, however, pulled on a slight smile of embarrassment. Care and restraint could be read in his gaze, but he confirmed her hunch. The protagonist could not believe his words, as if she was afraid of something. Each phrase was heard sharply and inarticulately, but Chris decided to help her by asking if his old friend remembered the day he asked her to bite him. His facial expressions kept changing, as if the guy was playing with emotions. Soa's reaction proved that the girl was now convinced. She threw herself into his arms, flooding with tears. Chris was real after all, and she hadn't imagined it then. The protagonist exclaimed that she missed him a lot and that she never even forgot about him for a second. Healy silently watched the revelations of the two friends, though something cautioned. Probably for the reason that Sua thought Chris was the only friend who believed her. The guy himself apologized for not showing up sooner since he felt the same way. Chris was afraid that the protagonist wouldn't believe that he was alive again. No one would believe such a thing. They admired each other for a while, listening to what the interlocutor would say, but Faith was stronger. The boy supported the girl and held her by the shoulders. He felt a sense of satisfaction, for his wish to find Saul had been fulfilled. But Chris was beginning to play differently. It had taken him too long to find her. The aura around him thickened and his gaze became more focused, Healy noticed. But Sua continued to believe him, because that was enough. He was alive. Those seemed to be the words Chris had been waiting for. The boy pulled his old friend's hand, as if he wanted to kiss her. She was his princess forever. Suddenly Chris was drawn into trust, and was already waiting to fulfill his plan. It was the look of victory. Healy sensed that something was wrong, but stood idly by. The lovely smile was adorned with fangs, and his eyes became insane. Suha was left in prostration at what she saw, because she realized that a friend had become a vampire. Suddenly, someone's bloody hand appeared on Chris's neck. Hilly wanted to disarm the offender, but the protagonist stopped him. She saw the young vampire turning into a beast, but Chris was only amused by it. He was the one who couldn't have Hilly anywhere near Soha. The boy intercepted his arm, looking into his opponent's eyes until Jaka appeared. He tried to throw a punch at his brother's abuser, but in vain. Chris threw him back a few meters away, still holding Hilly. The protagonist was confused by what she saw. An old friend announced that he wished he could save her from these vampires. At that moment, the others appeared, but Chris could anticipate every move. Therefore, it became a game to him. He had no problem disarming the guys as if they were capable of nothing. Chris was completely convinced that the vampires didn't remember anything. And that was even better. Shadows crept across the ground, which tensed him up. Black energy twisted his body subsequently engulfing the entire forest. Noah's gaze was fearful, though Chris was also tense with the phenomenon. The werewolves appeared behind him, running to Suo's rescue. They all wanted to know what this stranger wanted with their friend. But Chris only got more excited because his species really didn't understand anything. A huge stream of magic exploded in the dark forest, eating everything in its path. The young vampires lay immobilized on the ground, wounded and unconscious. Healy looked over his brothers while Khan searched Suo's eyes. That's when they noticed the girl was gone. Chris held her in his arms and carried her away from the pile of werewolves and vampires, but she resisted and begged to be let go. The protagonist was angry, despite her boyfriend's words that he was protecting her. His gaze became gentle, while Healy's visage became remembered as bloodthirsty. Chris carried her to safety. But did she trust him? Soa covered her mouth with her hand and listened as the guy called himself her old friend who trusted her. He would just trust her and him in return. But the girl was scared of something. Haley appeared out of nowhere on her left. He looked wild, as if a predator was fighting off its prey. Chris clearly hadn't expected such an encounter, so he wouldn't have been able to dodge if Suha hadn't stopped the vampire. He was affected by the strange and unfamiliar vibrations, which Chris was very happy about. 
He took advantage of the situation and disarmed his opponent, but the protagonist was not agreeable. She pushed the blonde man away and pulled out of his embrace, but he managed to grab her arm. Chris grinned from ear to ear, baring his fangs, reminding Suha whose fault it was that he had died. When she heard the phrase, her face contorted, making sure it wasn't Chris standing in front of her. The guy didn't deny it though. He was interested in playing with her, and so now the stranger could not restrain himself. The vampire prepared for the bite that was eventually inflicted on Solon's arm. Chris was gaining strength in playing with his prey. Soa tried to intervene, but her opponent threw her side so hard that she passed out. Now Solon was no longer in control. He began to change from his vampire form to a completely unfamiliar one. His hands were covered in fur, his nails grew, and his eyes glistened. Soa stood up, wanting to make sure he was okay, but even Chris was surprised to see his new hypostasis. He was holding a wolf. Solon opened his mouth and grabbed his opponent. His multicolored eyes were a sign that the werewolf was indeed Solon. Fortunately, the stranger pretending to be Soha's old friend could not resist such weight. He punched the wolf in the chest, which knocked him aside. As Chris tried to pull himself together, other werewolves came to his aid. How he was getting so wound up, Suha rushed over to him and tried to stop him. The blonde declared that if she kept interfering with him, he would have no choice but to knock her out and take her with him. But Healy managed to cover Soa with his body and intercept from his opponent. It was clear Chris was no ordinary vampire, which meant they had to attack at full strength. The opponent was surrounded by the wolves who wedged their teeth into different parts of his body. At this time, the vampire was examining his friend and trying to make sure she was okay, while he himself was bleeding. He was getting weaker by the minute. Soha, on the other hand, didn't realize what was happening. This was not the Chris she once knew. The guy bowed his head and apologized to the girl. He was apologizing for the person he was. Healy declared that she could have hated him for the rest of her life, but begged to let him take her away from here. The vampire wished to hide Suoha somewhere safe while Chris tried to fight off the werewolves. To his dismay, a new adversary had appeared, Jaka. But he tried to replenish his magical balance, which was probably why the black sticky energy was wrapped around his body. The rest of the vampires rushed towards Chris at the same time, but they were blinded by the magic. Everyone was trying to catch their breath from such a release of energy, until they noticed that the enemy had vaporized. Jan suddenly remembered Suha, who was alone with Healy. The moonlight illuminated their figures hiding in the tree. There was nothing wrong with the girl, and that was thanks to the young vampire. Both were embarrassed by each other's company, but each worried about their friend's condition. Healy asked Suha not to worry because he wasn't going to die anyway. She apologized to him, but it was for nothing because the vampire felt guilty. He had tricked her. After escaping from the orphanage, the brothers had lived hiding their identity from everyone and especially her, he couldn't tell the truth to. They were afraid to appear as vampires in front of others, afraid to disappoint Soha. So Healy asked for forgiveness for everyone. The main character confessed that she was having a terrible mess in her head right now because of the fact that her new friends turned out to be vampires. Tears streaked down the guy's face. Suya asked how they had become vampires, assuming that they had been bitten by a vampire as children but he didn't know the answer himself. None of them knew how it had happened. They'd been vampires for as long as they could remember, growing up in total confinement in a place that was only nominally a shelter. Had they been bitten by a vampire, or born them, or had someone made them that way, the brothers couldn't be sure of anything. Unlike other members of their species, sunlight, crosses, and holy water had little effect on them. Soha explained that, in that case, they would not know for sure. That they were vampires. They may have each had special powers, but they could have been regular humans, just like the main character, after all. But Healy explained that they were attracted to blood. They had a bloodlust instinct, and made them more terrifying. The guy looked at his hands with fear, and added that they didn't need any other food or water. They wouldn't die, even if they ate nothing. Healy sobbed and screamed about, how he and his brothers only fed on blood one day, a year on their birthday. They only drank the blood of animals that had just died, 
never attacked humans and never knew the taste of their blood. The boys had made that vow. Right now he was not lying, and so he asked Suha to trust him. It was okay if she didn't want to now, but Healy would try his best to earn her trust. After all, it's more than natural for her to feel terrified of them. The protagonist asked why he had come after her. Wasn't Heli afraid she would curse him or tell the whole school what they were? But the vampire had seen fit to do so. He felt he absolutely had to do just that. Ever since Heli had first met her, it was as if Soha was his destiny. The answers to the questions of who he was, what kind of life he was supposed to live, what the purpose of his existence was, eluded him. But then the boy felt, for the first time in his life, that he had finally discovered a clear answer. He was born to protect Suoha, and so he must live to protect her. A slight blush appeared on his cheeks at these words. The guys stared at each other for a long time, until the protagonist suggested Healy bite her. The guy was even more embarrassed, but still refused. He swiveled his head in different directions, but Suoha stopped him, because she believed him. Eventually, it did happen. As it might seem, the bite was an exciting step for everyone, but the protagonist didn't even resist. This went on for a while, and no one was going to be the first to back down. Healy slowly pulled away from her neck, burning with anticipation. He was breathing heavily, catching his breath from the intoxicating feeling. But he was still concerned about Suha, who was fine because the vampire had only touched her with his lips. The guy himself, however, didn't look good. Sweat dripped from his face. His eyes glistened with desire, and his mouth remained open, as if he was trying to memorize the position of his lips on her neck. If Heli said that the lust had not awakened in him, I would be a lie, but he was far more afraid of not living up to her expectations. The guy didn't want to disappoint her, since the girl herself had trusted him, knowing he was a vampire. And to be deprived of that feeling, Heli did not wish to lose. Soha explained that it had never happened once. He himself knew that all this time the girl despised vampires the most, and considered all of them, without exception, to be the most dangerous creatures. But the guy every hell came to the rescue when she was in danger, so the protagonist was glad every time he appeared. Even though he was a vampire, but the girl did not oppose his company. Neither did any of them. So Ha apologized for those horrible words. Haley, on the other hand, had always been himself, and now they just got to know each other a little more and the protagonist wished that their bond would only grow stronger from now on. Suddenly someone called out mentally to Heli. Jaka added fearfully that the creep had disappeared. Sua's condition could not be worried about and neither could they. The vampires were a little banged up, but they would live. They were upset because they thought the protagonist didn't want to see them, but she asked them to tell them that they would come on their own. Everyone was happy to see Soha unharmed, while everyone else was battered. Thanks to them, she was unharmed. Han sobbed with happiness, but still explained that they were much stronger than they look, and surely the girl had already noticed that it was their nature. Were they all werewolves? For some reason, her words saddened them, but the boys didn't try to hide the truth. Khan apologized for all of them, because they especially didn't want to talk about their Sua nature. The reason was that the protagonist would stop seeing them as such people, and would be scared, they were also afraid that the girl would be disappointed in them. These words were reminiscent of Heli's speech. The werewolves couldn't do otherwise at that moment, but when her salvation was at stake, they didn't care if she hated them forever or not. Sua didn't hate them. No matter what they all were, werewolves or vampires, to all of them, those words had become symbolic. She was grateful to each one. The main character had lived a long time hiding her abilities and when they took to the real one, she was immensely happy and grateful. So Soha asked for a chance to do the same for them. The guys didn't dare ask for more than that. Uh, each of them was happy about this outcome. Now they would definitely become even closer to each other. With a new day, the boys played a game of neat ball. Ayaka received a pass and as he sped up, he threw the ball and hit it right on target. They decided to take a little break and that's when Soha came up to them just at that moment. The girl had come to watch them practicing because the competition was just around the corner. She was curious how the process was going. But Ayn explained that she didn't need to worry because the victory would be for the vampires anyway. And he was going to dedicate it to the main character. Another guy, Healy, 
appeared behind her back, who was also happy to have her company. For her sake, he was ready to give his best. Of course. So Ahad didn't give up hope either. She was greatly embarrassed by the guy's words and was trying to come to her senses. They were interrupted by Solon, who exhaled irritatedly because if their friend stayed here like this, she might get hurt. The girl joked back that he was worried she might get hurt, even though the guy denied it, but the expression on his facial expression said otherwise. Solon explained that it was just that her presence was interfering with their competition, and she was distracting them. Was that the case? Once again, the vampire turned red as a tomato and said that Soya had misunderstood him. The girl suggested that he talk to her after practice because she had something she wanted to tell him. In the evening, a conversation took place between them. Solon was shy, though he was curious as to why the girl had called him over. She didn't rush him, but he didn't even change his clothes, but ran straight to her. He didn't want to stall for time, and so he asked to make things quick. Soha decided to thank him and apologize, especially to him. Obligatory. His multicolored eyes watched carefully the actions of this attractive girl, who had heard that Solon had kept it a secret for a long time, even from his friends, that he was capable of transforming into a werewolf. But that day, because of her, the guy had interrupted her and replied that he had done it because Chris had pissed him off wildly. It had nothing to do with her. And yet Chris was there because he wanted to take her away. It was hard for her to talk about it, but Solon asked who the guy was anyway. He was confused and asked what the reason for his actions was. However, Suha didn't know the answer herself. She revealed that Chris was her only friend, but he was not like himself right now. She felt bad because the guy might show up again, and that situation made her insanely sad. After all, Chris was the most precious and closest person to her, but Solon assumed it wasn't him. Maybe they just looked alike. Except Soa explained that this vampire knew the secret kept between them. She hadn't told anyone but him. Until one day, she shared it with Haley. Suddenly, the girl remembered the dream in which she had called Chris. That's where the protagonist told about their friendship and bite. As it turned out, at times, she had incredibly realistic dreams. So much so that she remembered all the sensations and even the smells but Solon didn't seem to be convinced that these were ordinary dreams. Little Chris had once told her that the girl moved around a lot. She didn't come out into the light during the day, and at night, she hung around alone. That last sentence was the key to the answer. Is it possible that this was sleepwalking? If so, something didn't add up. In the dream, Suha had seen Chris on the beach by the square, but how had she gotten there in such a short time? And how could a girl accidentally meet Chris there? It could only be explained by a dream. Solon asked her not to dwell on it, because if this stranger showed up again, they would all manage somehow. How hard that phrase was for him to say. The boy was embarrassed to be alone with Suha. They wished each other a good night and said goodbye. The vampire stood away from the door to her room, watching carefully until he noticed someone else was nearby. They dared to sneak into someone else's school, and even at this late hour. The defense said hello to Solon, and explained that it was none of his business. They just stopped by because they were worried about the main character, since some strange type was after her. The vampire replied that they'd handle it themselves somehow. So the werewolves should have left, except they couldn't trust them, because because of them Solha was in danger for once and not even twice. Angie tried to calm the guys down. Because the girl might have caught them, they should have kept a good relationship between their own. Solon pretended not to understand because he was a vampire. But they were still different from other members of their species, even if Khan didn't think so. Did he really think the boys had become vampires on a whim? They'd been born in an orphanage. And even so, Solon wasn't sure if they'd been born that way or become that way. They had been vampires for as long as they could remember, and had grown up in confinement as if in a prison. The caretaker of the orphanage watched their every breath around the clock. The boys lived there under the strictest supervision, and they never met anyone else, so they didn't learn about their vampire nature right away. Living under supervision, their whole lives they barely managed to escape from that hell. Sunlight didn't affect them like it did other vampires, and they only drank blood once a year. Moreover, the boys had nothing to do with the recent incident either 
because they didn't drink human blood. The victim of that murder looked quite similar to Soa, so probably those monsters were stalking the protagonist to do the same thing. In the past few years, werewolves suddenly started disappearing. I could also be the work of those monsters. They definitely had some kind of purpose, and everyone was sure that Chris would show up again. They couldn't let Soa be in danger again. Solon agreed with them, but still didn't want the guys to interfere. Khan confessed that he liked the girl who had heard about it. By the way, she had accidentally raised her voice from her room, much to the werewolf's embarrassment. Soa didn't do it on purpose. He thought about it that way. A wolf on the night of a lunar eclipse would forever fall in love with the first person he met along the way. What Khan said was true. Werewolves are doomed to forever love only one for the rest of their lives, so now he was forever bound to her. The guy stood next to her door and listened to her breathing. So Hull froze in surprise and didn't answer anything because she was waiting to see what else he would say. The nightball competition was going to be held very soon, so Khan hoped that the main character would be cheering for him. She lowered her head and heard him apologize for being puzzled by such a confession. The werewolf said goodnight and disappeared. Solon couldn't believe what had happened, but his attention quickly turned elsewhere. The vampire was contacted mentally by Jaka, who was puzzled by something. He ordered him to quickly head to their room because the caretaker was now in front of them. The same one from the orphanage where they grew up. Mange had found them. From the place where they had been locked up. From the orphanage, the woman had managed to find them and was now standing in front of them. Solon came running, catching his breath after running. They were already waiting for him. The atmosphere in the room was tense as each of the vampires waited to see what would happen next. Inge lowered her head and added that she had something to tell them. But according to Sean, none of them wanted to listen to her so no one here was happy for her. It had been 120 years since their last meeting. Healy had thought their headmistress had retreated, but it turned out she was still tracking them down. So the vampires wanted to know how she managed to do it. Except the woman admitted. It wasn't really them she was after. The one she was looking for? Mange didn't reveal the secret because she didn't have time for them anymore anyway. She had kept them locked up for over 100 years. And now, uh, showing up 120 years later, asking you to take her word for it? Mange denied that she kept the boys locked up. Or rather, she couldn't have done otherwise. The caretaker did it for their own protection. No one in the room believed her words, but the woman explained that the danger was the first vampire. She was protecting them from Dardan, who proclaimed himself first and his inferior vampires to keep them safe. The woman could only lock the boys up. After all, the goal of the vampires was to destroy them. The guys didn't understand anything and waited for Margie to explain what the reason was. But Jane was angry and asked the brothers not to believe her. In his opinion, the woman had made it up to trick them into coming back. Weren't they wondering why? They were different from other vampires. They were not the result of an experiment. On the contrary, it was those vampires who were the unfinished project of the first vampire. That was why the monsters were so susceptible to sunlight, aggressive and unintelligent. But the boys were the ones in whom the ancient power lurked. They are the vampire lords. The first vampire was the first human who turned himself into a vampire using forbidden methods and afterward began biting everyone in a row, turning them into his subjects. Their numbers grew, and then using his power over this darkness, the original began to attack ancient kingdoms. At this point, the only vampire lords left alive were them and Monge. She'd rather the boys didn't know the vampires existed, if that were possible. Of course they resented it, because they'd been in orphanage their whole childhood. Solon was furious though, because it didn't seem to be true. As it turned out, the powers in them had been sealed and sent to the distant future. Subsequently, they lost all their memories and turned into babies. The woman searched for them all over the orphanages of the 19th century and afterwards brought them to this Vanfield house. They themselves must have noticed that they were growing more. That was their true appearance. Henceforth, vampires will never grow old again. The original couldn't find them all this time because their powers remained sealed, but 17 years ago the powers began to be released. 
Healy remembered Suha talking about how before she was born, vampires were nothing more than a story in books, but something had gone wrong. It coincided with the period when the inferior vampires started to be announced. Ange explained that the princess had been reborn that day. Seventeen years ago she'd been human, and all the seals she'd created had begun to break. Healy seemed to have already guessed who the speech was about. However, his brother Jaunan was unwilling to believe Manj's speech about some princess and her rebirth. But the caretaker explained that if they didn't believe her, the girl would be in danger because there was no more time. Sean, on the other hand, was interested in the identity of this very princess and her whereabouts. Manj watched their reactions carefully and slowly, pondering, replied that she was in this school. The woman could feel the waves emanating from her here that filled the entire school and school grounds. This information took them by surprise, though some speculation was already brewing in Healy's mind. As Manj had said, she had not come for them. She was led by the waves of the princess. The phrase sent shivers through the young vampire's body. The caretaker explained that as the girl matured, the power of her waves would increase as well. Moreover, there was a good chance that Dardane had already picked up on them. The stronger they became, the more accurately the princess location could be tracked. Manj turned to Jaka because the vampire was quite sensitive to this kind of magic, so he must have already sensed them. Everyone looked at him as if he were the culprit. The boy thought for a while and made one guess as to who the princess might be, and the thought made sweat break out on his face. If they had crossed paths with her somehow before, his instincts would sense what each one's purpose was, like the moment Healy had first met Salaho. After all, that's what they were. The guys were born to protect the princess. The guys rounded their eyes and tried to come to their senses after hearing that. They stood petrified and listened to the fact that with the rebirth of the princess, the powers of the ancients imprisoned within them also began to awaken. Mage's tail had opened the vampire's eyes, but it became known that Darden's waves were beginning to intensify as well. Feeling the princess's powers, forgotten for years, he began to restore his own. Dardan's ultimate goal was to get his hands on the princess, because the first vampire wished to seize the source of her powers. Now Solon too remembered how back then in the forest they had been trying to find out what Chris needed from Soha. He'd been going on and on about something they didn't know or understand. The monster that the main character confused was the first vampire, and that's why he wanted to get rid of the guys because they were the biggest obstacle to his plan. The room grew quiet. Everyone was frantically waiting to see what the one they had been hiding from for years would say next. The guys were mentally communicating with each other, but Healy couldn't come to a final conclusion yet because it was like some kind of delusion. Still, he had a feeling that this revelation answered. A lot of questions about the time when vampires lived in confinement. Jaka admitted that it had felt that way to him too. Could it be then that the princess was Sohoa and Darden was the stranger in the forest? Jaka turned to Mange and suggested that this incomprehensible nonsense was true. But what was this woman suggesting? The first vampire would gradually grow stronger. He was still regaining his former strength at a rapid rate, and the number of his followers would only increase. But it would be very difficult for Dardan to surpass the princess's strength. Before she transferred her powers and sent the boys into the future, she had given almost all of her strength to them. Suddenly, the expression on their faces became quite depressed, but Manj was going to take the princess with her, and that would have to happen as early as tomorrow. The woman would escort her to safety, and the vampires would have to find Dardan and get rid of him. They did not agree with her decision, and Sean was nervous that he shouted Sua's name. Thus, the caretaker was one step closer to her plan. She was right when she said that the boys had already met the princess. Xion was horrified as he realized what he had just done. They should have all been instinctively drawn to her, so it was safe to say that Suoha was indeed her. Mange raised her head and asked in a calm tone of voice where she was now. But Jan answered for everyone, saying that they wouldn't let the caretaker take the protagonist away. And why should they have trusted her? But as it turned out, the woman was the princess's main governess. She had been raising her since she was a diaper. But Noah speculated that the director of their orphanage might have been one of Darden's men. In that case, however, she would have been initially focused only on kidnapping Sioha, and she would have had no use for involving the young vampires in the story. 
If the princess ended up in the hands of the first vampire, this world would be a living hell. That was why Mange had to take her away with her. Except Healy explained that everything she said could be either true or false, but he couldn't let the caretaker put Sua's life on the line. Everyone else silently agreed with his point of view. As Mange had said, protecting the princess was their primary purpose. And the woman was just as much a potential threat to her. Until there was irrefutable proof of her words, the boys would not let her even come close to the protagonist. If the caretaker put her in even the slightest danger, Haley wouldn't let her get away with it so easily. He was no longer the little boy she knew. A short time later, a guy hit on the protagonist, citing that he wanted to go to class with her, of course, if it was okay with her. Soha was somewhat embarrassed. Even though she didn't give any sign of it, but she wanted to as well, the guys walked in silence and smiled. Mentally, the girl could describe that after the day she had let Haley bite her, being alone with him had become a little awkward. Her face was turning completely red. Fortunately, at least her hair was slightly covering that expression. But could it be that Soha was overthinking herself? She cast a glance at her friend who was also like her, walking with a satisfied smile stretched across his face. The eye contact made the girl flare up even more. When Healy turned to her, she even jumped up. The guy inquired about what Sua was doing after class. She just didn't have any plans, so the vampire invited her to come to the competition. Her enthusiasm and excitement was pouring out of her because the protagonist agreed without a second thought. The competition was going to take place very soon, so Healy wanted to know if she was going to cheer for them. The facial expression on his face was so radiant that Sua couldn't take her eyes off him. All she had to do was agree, but suddenly she remembered what Khan, standing outside her door, had told her about the upcoming Nightaball competition. The werewolf was asking for the protagonist's support, too. The girl hadn't shared that with the vampire, nor did she need to, as Heli himself interrupted her musings. He stretched a happy smile from ear to ear and said that he would do his best for Suyohe. Even the aura around him was resplendent. His appearance and dignified behavior made the protagonist blush, but abruptly her mood changed because her two close friends were enemies by blood. Inside at recess, there was noise and clamor. The students were chatting amongst themselves while Sua had been racking her brains for the whole lesson, but now she couldn't think of what she should do. She didn't know who she was supposed to support. Suddenly someone stopped her and interrupted her after much coaxing. At first it seemed to the girl that someone had recognized her, but when she turned her head and when she saw Healy, the doubts evaporated. The guy reminded her that Sua had promised to come and see them, so he wanted to go along with her. The protagonist, however, interrupted him and said that someone had called out to her. But Healy continued to smile naively. As if there was really no one in that direction, he quickly turned her body around and pushing her lightly in the back, asked her to walk faster. Soha agreed with his phrase, except there was Mange who silently watched as the vampire led the princess away in the opposite direction. The orphanage principal pulled harder on her hat to hide the nervous expression on her face, but Healy was ready to kill her with the look of his yellow eyes. On the playing field, however, the spotlight was blinding, but dark figures of the players, supported by the students in the stands, could be seen. A team of vampires against a team of werewolves. And between them Soa, who hadn't decided who to cheer for at the game. Wolf guffawed trying to hurt his opponent in this way, and clapped that the vampires had managed to make it to the finals. But Jaka, on the other hand, doubted that the werewolves would even manage to win. He remembered what the guy had said about their brothers joining, but they should be enough too. The vampires were determined to take the top spot again this year and to do it without straining themselves. Sean had been one of the first to notice Sohoha. He pointed out to the protagonist where their fan zone was and asked her to go there. Happiness sparkled in his eyes. Khan had noticed her as well. The werewolf was going to get a victory and dedicate it to Suho. If Mahan Ruslan and Kamil had come to today's game as promised, it would have been even easier, but there was no word from the boys. As if something had happened to them, the referee gave the order to take their positions. The opponents looked into each other's eyes, thus stirring up the excitement even more. The game was on.
The speed of the ball was so fast that it was impossible to track its movement. Jacko was only enjoying it though. The guy was concentrating on watching the actions of his opponent who had almost managed to intercept the ball. Both students looked at each other and froze for a while before the vampire passed the baton to Jion. The latter, in turn, abruptly began to circle the werewolf. While a victorious smile played on his face, Team Khan held formation to surround Jayant. The vampire threw the ball towards Gino, who managed to intercept it. Shanlin appeared next to him, who then got the ball, only to be tackled in the stomach area. Khan knocked him to the floor, and Angie managed to grab the object. The werewolf ran some distance and threw the ball to Tahel, but it was picked up by Ahili. The vampire used all his strength. His gaze read concentration and anger. The throw punched through the airspace, raising wind and clouds of dust. There was a whistling sound. Healy had scored the first goal. The score was now one on zero. The team was happy about this outcome, and so was Soa. The guy glanced happily at the princess, as if he wanted to make sure she saw it. On the opposite side though, anger took over the werewolves' minds, especially Khan, who was sure that they could still get even. The new ball was about to be picked up by Noah. A guy was in space in the blink of an eye, and it was only close it wasn't for Tahel who appeared right in front of his face. There was nothing ahead of him, and this could have been a great chance. He ran rounding the wind obstacle, until someone's silhouette appeared on his right. It was Jaka who overtook the wolf and blocked his path. The vampire was so fast that Tahel simply wouldn't have time to slow down. Except that it was Khan who appeared behind Jaka's back, intercepting him and moving him out of the way. The violent collision sent earth and dust flying into the air, but Tahel only got more excited and ran on. The vampires almost managed to catch up with him, but the werewolf jumped to the ring and threw the ball. Thus, the score was equalized. Now the wolf team was happy to have done a good job, while the vampires gulped greedily to regain their breath. After a while, the referee signaled the start of a new phase. This time, the ball was in the hands of Hilly and his brothers. The werewolves continued to use the same technique of disarming the opponent as in the second stage. Soha, of course, realized that this was a competition, but it was scary to watch. She didn't want anyone to get hurt, and her frightened expression said so. Suddenly, someone from the side turned to her. The protagonist turned her head and saw the person who wanted to speak to her privately. The identity was hidden by a black cloak, but Soha's facial expression was somewhat surprised. Under the hood, blonde short hair could be discerned. This woman turned out to be Mange. The girl was curious about what the stranger wanted to tell her, and why she had suddenly approached her. Except now her friends were competing on the field, so that would be difficult. Mane still kept her head down, as if she was afraid someone would recognize her. The woman said she would wait for the main character at the main entrance after the first half of the match. She insisted that the conversation was serious, so Soa would definitely have to come. The hooded figure abruptly turned around and left the protagonist with no answers. She even tried to stop her, but the orphanage principal was unfazed and seemed to vaporize. Now the princess wanted to figure out what was the matter. The score was already 9-9, but the boys were holding up pretty well. The ball was in the hands of Noah, who managed to pass it before two of the opposing teams surrounded him. A whistle was heard, which meant a goal had been scored. The boys were getting a little tired by now. It was just about time for the first half of the match to end. Khan mentally reflected on the fact that they had barely managed to catch up with the vampires in points, but he couldn't let his team lose. There was still a second half left, so they had to turn the tide. Soha, meanwhile, was troubled by the words of the woman who had asked her to come to the main gate. She wondered what kind of conversation awaited her, and whether she should go at all since she didn't even know her. Suddenly she was called out and forced to look. Sean was walking toward her with a beaming expression, wondering if she'd seen him score a goal. The vampire waved his arms and cheered as Sua said it was awesome. Solon. On the other hand, didn't think it was purely significant because Sean only scored one goal, and that with difficulty. The guy grumbled that he scored two goals, but didn't brag about it left and right, because everyone saw it. Well, the two were arguing amongst themselves. Gino tried to get the prince's attention, 
The guy pointed out which way their fan zone was so the girl could cheer for them from there. Soha pretended as if she didn't know that and made a surprised face, though it looked more like a guilty one. Their dialogue was interrupted by Khan, a slight blush appearing on his cheeks. The werewolf said that even though his team was losing now, they were going to win the second part of the match. And it was for her. That was why Khan had asked the heroine to support them. Sean, on the other hand, flared up because Sola was from their school, so she would be cheering for them too. Wolf ignored this and pointed to where their fan zone was. Shouts of support surrounded the princess from all sides, which made her nervous. But suddenly there was someone to her left who wanted her to have fun. Healy nestled against her neck, whereupon Solha turned as red as a tomato. The girl, however, reminded him with a stammer that the match wasn't over yet, so he wasn't allowed to be in the stands. The vampire didn't even deny it. He agreed that he would have to go back to the field soon. Healy just wanted to say something, so he went up to her. He leaned in close to her ear and almost whispered, but suddenly he offered to move. The vampire asked the girl to cheer for his team. Had he really left the field just for that? It seemed so because Healy decided to return to his brothers as soon as possible. He jumped over the fence and said goodbye to Soha. The audience applauded them and the protagonist smiled happily. Suddenly the thought that she never got to meet that woman popped into her mind. She felt ashamed because Mange might still be waiting for her. She said that the conversation was really serious and important. Soha decided to go after all, even if it was too late. The referee indicated the start of the match. Gino grabbed the first ball without giving a chance to the defender. He passed to Healy, who caught it successfully and focused his energy, but he was suddenly knocked to the ground by Khan. The guy snatched the ball and rushed towards the ring but Healy instantly got to his feet and ran after him. He managed to catch up to his opponent and grab his body, but Khan tossed the ball aside, not knowing who would even pick it up. By sheer luck, he hit it right into the ring. The score was now tied by 10-10. They had given away too much of their energy, but were still able to keep fighting for the win. Except Suo had been tossing between the two choices all this time. What if that stranger was still waiting for her at the main gate? Healy ran ahead of everyone straight toward the goal. The werewolves had begun to take their positions and two stood to his sides. Tahel and Khan stopped the boy, locking their hands around his stomach. They did this on purpose to once again throw him into the ground, except the vampire still managed to throw the ball right at the target and score a goal. In the next game, they already switched places and now Heli tried to block Khan's way but the wolf pushed himself off the ground and jumped over the vampire and threw the ball. He was glowing with anticipation in the changing numbers on the scoreboard. The two seemed to share the ball between them, rolling each other into the ground, thus raising earth and dust into the air. This went on for so long that they were already having trouble breathing, but the light was already 20-20. John mentally contacted Healy, asking how he was feeling. The guy had scored a goal for the second time in a row Gino was in agreement and asked him not to overdo it. The vampire replied that he was fine, especially as the match was coming to an end anyway. Khan was also not going to give up. On the contrary, he couldn't let these, in his opinion, upstarts take the win this year either. They had to win by all means, because he was doing it all for Soho. Healy and Khan were first to the ball again, but it was the vampire who grabbed it first. He had a murderous aura in his gaze, as if he were a predator. Time was running out and this goal was going to be decisive. The werewolf was setting himself up to take the ball, as he didn't want to lose, especially to his potential rival. Healy himself slowly glanced up at the stands, looking out for Suoha, who had disappeared. The protagonist was at the main gate. She apologized to the woman but still inquired as to what the matter was. Though she didn't feel comfortable, the princess eventually came around. Soha was going to quickly listen to Manja's request and return. A slight fear was read on her face. The hooded stranger raised her head and began her monologue until she felt someone behind her. The dark energy was coming from the inferior vampires who were already stretching their bony paws toward her face. Soha stopped her gaze at them fearfully and pulled away sharply. Helny's gaze on the other hand read fear. His pupils shrank as if he had seen a ghost. 
he let his guard down and let the werewolf get closer. But the vampires had already surrounded the women, just as the vampire was on the ground. The boy rose to his feet and shouted the princess's name. There was no face on it because the main gate appeared to be open, and behind it someone was holding Suha, dragging her farther and farther into the darkness. Khan was rapidly heading towards the ring because this time they couldn't afford to lose. He was bound for victory. And so a brilliant smile shone on his face from ear to ear, the long-awaited goal. The referee announced that Sunshine City High School had won 21-20. The werewolves surrounded each other and began to cheerfully thank Khan. The vampires, on the other hand, wiped the sweat from their faces and gulped air while Healy froze like a stone. All he could see was the empty seat where the princess sat. The guy started to dumbfoundedly call out for Soha, which the rest of the guys noticed. No one understood what happened, and so everyone tried to stop him. Halle was sure that she was definitely in the fan zone for the middle of the second part of the match, but then she went somewhere just before the finals. The expression on his face was becoming icy because he was afraid of the worst outcome of events. Suddenly, the vampire remembered that Mange had wanted to take her with her and had even told them about it. Had she really done it in their absence? Finally, Jino and Sean realized that Suha was missing. They would tell the others about it. Healy mentally contacted Gino and asked him to find out where the princess was now. The vampire asked to be given some time so that he could activate his ability. After a moment, his gaze went blank and the others noticed it. As it turned out, the waves coming from Soa were completely disappearing, which meant that Gino would not be able to find her. Was such a thing possible? No matter how much he increased the search spectrum, he still couldn't find the signal coming from the protagonist. There could be two reasons for that. Either the girl was currently unconscious or she was no longer alive. Everyone shuddered at those horrible words, but Haley continued his search and found traces of blood. His eyes practically popped out of his head and he was afraid that something had really happened to Soha. The werewolves, who were also looking for the main character, managed to approach him. But as Khan was killing the red spots, he stood in a stupor for a moment. He gave orders to find her as quickly as possible because he was sure it was the work of those scum. Except that no one could know where they had dragged her. The guys were optimistic though, because their gathering had always tracked down vampires. In that case, they'd be able to pinpoint their location. Angie explained that they needed to contact the other werewolves first. And that's when the vampires came through the gate. Healy asked Gino to track down Munch, but he had already tried. Her waves also failed to track her, which was also strange. Well, there was only one way out. The boys had to go back to the old shelter, the place they'd escaped from. Who knew they'd end up here again? So also by choice, now the place looked more like some kind of ruin. The dark stone of the building was hidden by cobwebs or vines of ivy. They all frantically looked around the place where they had been banned for a long time. Of course, it had been a hundred years since the young vampires had escaped, and now it was time to go in there again, only no one was in a hurry to do so. The boards crackled underfoot, and the slightest movement caused dust to fall from the walls and ceiling. Sean opened a door of some sort and called the others to look in. As it turned out, it was a room. For some reason, excitement played in his eyes. Everything had aged in this place, but it generally looked the same as before. Jayan even made an assumption that no one had used this room after them. And if Mange was to be believed, this Vamfield house was really just for them. The boys literally felt each other and knew how to continue their brother's thought. Still, Gino felt that there was nothing special here, which meant that they should go with the team of the orphanage's principal. Everyone agreed with his thought. Walking a little deeper into the old building, empty all these long years, vampires came to the office of the caretaker mange. It was quite sunny and spacious inside. It was clear that this room had been used for a while, so the boys looked around for clues. It had definitely been lived in here, even after the guys had escaped, as Gino had noticed, which meant that Mange was still living here. Even her suitcase was still there. John called out to Healy and said that it looked as if Soha had not been kidnapped by the principal of the orphanage. If that was true, then Mange would have taken her belongings with her. 
Gino suggested with a wistful look on his face that she might have intended to bring the princess to this place first, and then go on from here, disappearing without a trace. But apparently something had not gone according to plan. Given that Jaka couldn't pick up any signals from Soha or Mange, it was all the work of those inferior vampires. That phrase rattled his bones. Jan too agreed that they had both fallen into the hands of that vile Dardan and his gang. In that case, the orphanage principal was telling the truth. Hila listened silently as they spoke and remembered the woman's words about the first vampire, wanting Suha, which was why she wanted to take her with her and let the lords deal with him. He couldn't trust her with the princess's safety then, but things were coming out differently now. Should he have let Mange take the girl then? Had he really been the one to put her in danger? Suddenly, Jaka felt someone walking directly towards them. They watched the door in silence until the glass was pierced by someone's hand. It was the inferior vampires. They seemed to know the guys were coming to Vamfield House. The guys decided to act and activated their abilities, which only helped in getting rid of the enemies as soon as possible. John, Jaka, and Gino scattered them in different directions with ease. Except that wasn't all there was to it. The shelter was overflowing with these creatures. Healy mentally assumed that the inferior vampires had not come for them, so he grabbed one of them and demanded an explanation. Under his hard stare, the vampire began to shake and squirm. Except the monster could not tell the real reason. That brought one thought to the Lord's mind. If this orphanage was built for them, then why even after their escape manj never left this place? She stayed here not because she didn't want to leave, but because she couldn't. Halai asked his brothers to run to the library in as fast as they could because Vamfield House was what these creatures had come for. And that thing must not fall into their hands. Whatever it was. Absolutely not. There was a look of fear on their faces as if they might not make it in time, but they trusted Healy nonetheless. At this time, the protagonist lay unconscious on a huge stone circle accompanied by Dardan, whom she confused with Chris. He gently cupped her face, playing with her dark hair. The boy moved closer to her face and whispered for her to wait a little longer. In the old orphanage, his servants were already doing his bidding. More specifically, one of them had already found the book that would make them one. The first vampire stared mesmerized at her sleeping face, wishing his plan would come to fruition sooner rather than later. As the inferior creatures examined the red bound book, Sounds began to intensify outside the library door. John was using his fist to fend off the attacking vampires, as was Jaka, whose magic oozed from his hands. She, on the other hand, was figuratively sizzling his opponents with her heavy gaze. His frozen figure exuded a dark energy that choked and lifted the vampires into the air. The trio slowly made their way towards the library until they caught up with it. Jaka opened the door abruptly to see what the creatures were after but it was too late. Inside the room, everything was scattered, creating chaos, and the window was open, causing the wind to enter the library and play with the curtains, except that the shards showed that someone had already been inside. Fear was reflected on the boys' faces from the realization of what had happened. However, Healy didn't give up trying to reach the vampire. He still held him down, not giving him a chance to resist. The yellow eyes gave him even more intimidation, so Heli asked again what they were looking for. He already knew that one of them had already stolen something from the orphanage library. He was squeezing his neck so hard that even coughing and gaining air was difficult. Sean noticed that the guy was overdoing it a bit, so he decided to take the initiative. The short vampire didn't seem to mind, except that Sean wasn't so simple. He activated his ability, which caused his eyes to glisten. They were staring intently right at the monster, who couldn't tear his gaze away. There was a strange energy emanating from the Lord, as if he was able to hypnotize. And the words that made the inferior vampire speak had worked. Sean had gotten the bewitched prisoner to talk about the book. From his mouth came a slightly interrupted phrase, from which not everything was clear. The vampire continued to apply pressure and asked what book they had been instructed to take. Dardan's servant resisted with all his might causing his face to gnarl and his skin to become sweaty. It was about the moon altar. The phrase was so hard to say that it made him look like a black blur. But it wasn't enough for the brothers. 
Sean became angrier, he started investigating with renewed vigor and ordered the monster to give more details. Except the inferior vampire didn't have the slightest clue himself, because they just had to get the book where the moon altar was written. Healy hardened his gaze and demanded an answer as to where they were to take the item. Darden's servant had rambled that the place was in the Rilgun Bar, which was in Rarantani. Solon explained aloud that it was located very far from here. Now it would be necessary to find out who would be waiting for the guys in that bar and where Suha was located. Even with Sean's ability, they couldn't find out because the inferior vampire didn't know anything else. He was just following orders and Darden wouldn't tell them the details. Suddenly something strange began to happen to the monster. Its pupils, the same color as Shion's, suddenly disappeared and its whites were covered in red lines. He suddenly died. No one understood how it could happen, so the boys watched him for a while. As it turned out, the first vampire noticed that his servant had said too much, so he decided to get rid of him. He wished he'd done it sooner and that he'd given them so much information for nothing. Now, he would have to clean up his own mess. Darden was in a wide hall with a waterfall and an altar in the center. Here too, with beasts that appeared to be werewolves were making horrible noises behind cages. Behind one of these bars, Mange was trying to regain consciousness. Her body was wobbly, but her first thought upon awakening was of the princess. The first vampire noticed that behind her back someone was whispering about Soha. He turned his head and saw Mange holding on to the bars, demanding that he release the princess. In her opinion, what Dardan was about to do was completely unacceptable. There was no expression on his face for a couple seconds, until the first vampire suddenly snorted, saying that the woman had already said the same thing last time. Except now he had immense power. Dardan had become the strongest, which meant the truth was behind him, giving him the motivation to become superior to all vampires. His desire is to become the first creation of a completely new species and so from now on he would be called the first vampire. Excitement and anticipation burned in his crazy eyes as if he already had everything in his hands. The man saw fit to get rid of his past name to start a new life. However, the principal of the orphanage felt that his powers were still unstable and he should have known that better than anyone. The first vampire didn't deny the correctness of her words because now he would try to gain perfect power. His energy was unnerving the werewolves behind the cells making a noise curtain inside the hall. The first vampire explained that if Mange had obediently cooperated with him, the princess would have found peace long ago, and he was going to prove it again. At that time, someone's figure appeared in the middle of the quiet street near the railgun bar. The man was breathing heavily and moving around. He despised all the vampires in his head because they had kidnapped his fellow vampires for some unknown reason. The werewolf didn't understand what they were up to but it had to be told to the others as soon as possible. That same evening, at Sunshine City High School, the stranger staggered through the dark hallways, approaching room number 203. Inside it were other werewolves. Horror mixed with hatred lingered on Khan's face as Soa disappeared. He blamed himself for being so focused on winning the competition that he hadn't been able to protect what was most important. The boy didn't think himself worthy of being called wolf or human. His eyelids fell heavily, but Khan was unwilling to give up. The princess only had to wait for him, because he would surely save her. Inji said in a serious tone that their brothers had always been chasing vampires, so they might have figured something out by now. The only thing was that their connection with them had been cut off a long time ago, so they didn't know where to start looking. And that's when the very guy burst into the room. As it turned out, his name was Mahan. From the reaction of the others, it was clear that no one had expected him to appear, especially since they hadn't heard from him. They were so worried. Everyone wanted to know what had happened to him. The werewolf quickly told them that Kamala and Ruslan had been captured too. The guys had figured out that there were vampires snooping around the Rilgan bar in Parentanye, so they had broken in. Except this place turned out to be their secret lair and the guys were surrounded by a huge multitude of these monsters. Toward the end of the brutal fight, when they already thought they had finished with the lowly vampires, the one appeared. He was completely different from all the others they had met up to that point. 
The vampire was spreading some sort of black mist that filled the entire space. Mahan bowed his head and added that they lost consciousness at that moment. The werewolf barely opened his eyes and found himself in some kind of warehouse where there was a horrible noise of dogs barking. Cages held a bunch of their brethren. The thoughts and memories made his body shiver. They had speculated earlier that vampires had kidnapped wolves and taken them somewhere. Mahan had barely made it out, but he couldn't find where Camille and Ruslan had gone. But for what reason were the vampires doing this? Mahan had a hunch that they were going to use them as test subjects. Terror consumed their minds, for the gathering was in danger. They had to get back to Rilgan as soon as possible. They had to save them. Healy slept on the train, but even in his sleep he called for Soha, and when her sweet voice echoed back, tears started streaming down his face. He turned around and saw the altar, which was illuminated by a pillar of light. The vampire rushed to her call, but something kept him from getting through. Behind that transparent shield, her body lay humbly on the stone structure. The guy tried to pierce the biofield, but his attempts were futile. Hele wanted to make sure that the princess was all right and that she wasn't injured. In his dream, he got to the point of asking her mobile body where she was. After a brief silence, thin lips opened and whispered about the moon altar. The vampire couldn't hear well, so he asked for more to be said, but the girl spoke of some kind of sword from the temple. She asked him to bring the moon sword now tears began to flow down her snow-white skin. Soa begged Healy to come and save her, but suddenly the light went out, and the space was plunged into darkness. A dark cloud of energy began to engulf the boy, as if devouring his body, but he still reached for her. Suddenly his eyes opened. Lord was breathing heavily as his face became increasingly wet. He realized immediately that it was a dream. His musings were interrupted by Jaka, who had also just seen her Soa in a dream. The guy seemed frightened, as did Xion and Gino. All seven of them had seen the same dream. They saw the girl lying in some strange place that looked like a dark cave, and Solon summarized their thought by saying that it was an altar, and just then the train arrived at the Printanier stop. And after a while, the brothers were standing in front of that very bar. The first long silence was interrupted by Jan, who wanted to make sure that the book that had been stolen from Vanfield House had been brought here. But Jacob turned the attention to himself, asking everyone to be on their guard, because there were mobs of lower vampires everywhere. But Solon doubted that Dardan would have based himself in a place like this, which meant the bar could have been a base of sorts. Healy hoped Jaka could sense Soa's presence, but there was no signal. Moreover, Manjin the first vampire didn't seem to be here either, but he could feel the suggestive waves coming from this place. They were definitely different from the waves of the lower. To begin with, the guys decided to go inside. With a creak, the door opened, revealing an empty space in red-gray hues in front of the vampires. Jayan swiveled his head in different directions, examining the arrangement of things. The lights were off, leading them to believe that the food place hadn't opened. Except Gino noticed that the door was already open. Jacka's magic enveloped his body with warmth and pointed in the direction the waves were coming from. As it turned out, behind the wine were the stairs to the basement. Walking down, the young vampires winced with anticipation until they reached the iron door. When they pulled the handle, they discovered that there was a warehouse underneath the building. The darkness twisted them away, making it impossible to see anything. Jaka, on the other hand, believed it was not darkness. At least that's what it seemed to him. It was like a thick fog. After those words, something stirred. The sounds were coming from the stone wall, which turned out to be a secret passage. That was where the smoke was coming from. The door was locked from the back side. The handle wouldn't budge, so Jayan decided to use his strength. If it was locked from the other side, it could be broken down completely. But something strange was happening to the guy. It became hard to breathe, and his hand stopped listening as if all the power was gone. The same thing was happening to the others. Their faces were red and their skin was covered in sweat. The problem was the fog. Someone's voice in the darkness was suddenly convinced of the first vampire's words about these guys coming here. Healy's gaze fell heavily on the silhouette of the stranger, examining him from head to toe. He was quite definitely different from the inferior vampires 
and by all appearances, this black mist was spread by him too. The monster with sinister red eyes pulled on a wide smile and explained that the black smoke wasn't just putting the enemy to sleep, it was taking away their strength. Unfortunately, the boys noticed that there was not a single window around them, and there was nowhere to hide from this fog. They had lured them into the basement on purpose. But the stranger didn't expect the lords to hold out for so long. It only made him more wound up. Healy pulled himself together and shouted, addressing the others that they should have gotten out of this confined place first. Jan was holding on with all his might, but now not only his arms were not obeying him, the guy was having a hard time keeping his body weight down. He resisted himself until suddenly the door fell off its hinges under his pressure. When everything was ready, and the vampire seemed almost to get out into the clear air, a frightening picture appeared before him. A crowd of lower creatures stood before him, examining the lad with interest. Unfortunately, their stupor did not last long, and the vampires, having prepared their fangs, rushed towards their new victim. They were like wild animals, unable to restrain their desires and instincts. Suddenly, they began to be consumed by some dark energy. Noah's hand shook with exhaustion, but he continued to envelop the inferior vampires in a black haze until their bodies hovered over Jan. It was hard for Noah to hold on, so he asked his brother to leave quickly. The monsters were also resisting, but the lack of strength and energy hunger had taken its toll, and while the vampire closed only one eye, they had a chance. Dardan's servants broke out of the magical prison, only growing angrier. The crescent moon brightly illuminated the night space and the water surface, in the middle of which was some sort of circular structure. That was where the first vampire and the sleeping Soha were are. Ardarn was enjoying the events taking place as if he already had everything in hand, even though there was still not enough moonlight. But soon the full moon was to rise, and then the princess would regain everything she had once been deprived of, and eventually her powers would pass to him. He lounged beside her and admired her face. This altar was going to bring everything back to normal. The gaze of his light eyes gently caressed her reborn body. In that life, the princess had strength and Darden had love. At the moment, the situation was reversed, and love was on Suahe's side. The young lords continued to be attacked by the lower vampires. One of them attacked Jan, gripping his neck in its clawed paws. The pressure made it hard for him to even take a breath of air let alone resist. Gino turned pale with horror when he saw it. The guy activated his ability, but summoning fire took a lot of energy, so he was getting even worse. However, Dardan's servants did not retreat and almost reached him until Solon interrupted them. The boy wanted to reincarnate, but couldn't due to the lack of moonlight. The vampires watched their stalemate and played with it like a toy. The dark mist began to spread with more force and had already engulfed their bodies taking all their strength. Someone continued to resist, but it was only a few because the brothers were already lying on the floor. It could seem that the lower monsters were also afraid of something. Hele, on the other hand, noticed his sanity was gradually fading away and he could no longer hold on. But suddenly, a miracle happened. Her voice called out to her and it was as if it gave him strength. The creature was already ready to straighten him out, but Hele was the first to go. There was a seal on the guy's hand, and a bright glow emanated from it, as if it were the sun. The same thing happened to John, whose hand was also decorated with three rings. His gaze cleared and his mind cleared. The vampire lords finally came to their senses as they looked at the gift. Noah rose to his feet and launched a black energy into the basement that scattered the inferior creatures in different directions. But at this time, in a mysterious place, the moonlight illuminated Soha's body making her look like an angel. Healy looked at the pattern in surprise, trying to find an explanation as to why his power had increased when this thing appeared. He didn't understand what was happening, but apparently it had something to do with Suhao. She was the same one who had practically neutralized the inferior vampires, gathering them into a ball mixed with dark magic. Gino was burning the remnants, and Jaka was hitting them, slowing or knocking them out as was Heli. One managed to sneak behind Noah's back, which he noticed at the last moment. Except the vampire was eliminated by a huge creature of immense size. 
It was a blue wolf with multicolored eyes and a seal on its right paw. The vampire, who was able to control his mind, definitely didn't expect the lords to be able to awaken. But in that case, it meant... Suddenly, Darden's servant rushed away, leaving behind a flurry of mist. It was so thick that it was hard to see anything. Healy commanded that the brothers needed to get away from whoever was causing the smoke, so he turned to Jaka to find him, except there was a threat behind the vampire's back that immobilized him. The monster's bloody hand flung Healy away, which Soha felt die and the princess's face began to wrinkle, as if she felt his pain herself. But the guy's body fell to the ground, which the monster was obnoxiously happy about. He wanted to take care of each of them. But this upstart was so happy to have won that he didn't see his move being used on him. Strong hands grasped the stranger's neck and began to twist him around. Sean beckoned to Jayan, then he rushed toward them, grabbing the iron door they were imprisoned in the warehouse and throwing it at the vampire. But the vampire made an unexpected maneuver and managed to prevent the collision, except that the boy saw it coming and Jaka was right in front of him, making a swinging motion with his arm. He looked determined, as if he could see the future. They had succeeded. With the strength of three, the brothers had dealt with enemy number one. After that, the dark fog began to gradually dissipate. The other vampires began to behave strangely. Their gaze became desolate and their hair turned gray. With a final roar, they collapsed to the ground. The lords made the assumption that this happened because they had gotten rid of him. It seems that all the inferior vampires created by that strange man met their doom once their leader fell. It turns out he had bitten them all, turning them into vampires. And while the guys were imagining how many people this monster had turned, Gino noticed Healy lying breathless in a pool of blood. His face was already turning blue, and his chest wasn't rising. All the brothers rushed towards him in a flash. Afraid to touch him, Heli did not respond. The wound was nicely deep, so it would take plenty of time to recover. But someone's voice settled in the boy's mind, he belonged to Suoha. Even while on the altar, the girl kept calling his name. Without being conscious, she began to cry. Her face expressed fear and resentment. But suddenly his body exuded a bright light. Probably for this reason, the wound began to heal. The others noticed this and were also surprised. So it wasn't their handiwork. Hila struggled to open his eyes, gradually raising his body's torso, and the first thing he asked was how his brothers felt. Xion explained that they had all received those marks on the back of their palms, thanks to which they had regained consciousness. And not only that was an added and pleasant bonus, they began to feel stronger. And Solon was even able to turn into a wolf after the tag appeared. So what was going on? Hila had a feeling that Sua was helping them, and the others agreed. The guy suddenly remembered about that vampire who could create fog and wondered what happened to him. Luckily, the guys got rid of him. All the other lower creatures died after they killed him. She summarized the thought by adding that it seemed vampires died when the one that bit them died. Heli was dumbfounded by this information, to say the least, but now everything fell into place. A memory surfaced in his mind of mange trying to protect them from the original. Darden was a human who had turned himself into a vampire using forbidden methods. And if that was the case, the situation was different. Suddenly, the boys heard a thumping sound that came from somewhere above. There was definitely someone up there. In the pile of inferior creatures, the young lords noticed a couple who were still continuing to hunt. John grabbed one of them and ordered them to tell where the first vampire was as well as Soa. The monster's body was shaking and his voice was getting quieter due to lack of air. He replied that he didn't know anything because he was commanded to just do as told. Sean decided to use his ability and pressed his mind, asking about the book these creatures had stolen from Vamfield House and its location. The vampire continued to ramble on about his ignorance, because all he knew was everyone gathered here was going to Autumnal City. After a while, someone else had already discovered that all the servants of Daidar were dead and even the Vampire of Mist. The werewolves snuck inside and tried to figure out what had happened, because the first floor in the basement were all littered with bodies. Angie made the assumption that the Healy group had already gotten ahead of them. Mom, on the other hand, added that there was a storage room nearby where many of their comrades were locked up. He thought Camille and Ruslan might still be there. 
When it was night, the boys did sneak into the old building, where there were indeed cages of wolf. Their so your sharp stares and barking filled the space. Khan ordered to free them all first and open the cages, and when the plan was ready, they were to flee from there. Except the werewolf hadn't seen Camilla and Ruslan, which meant the boys couldn't have opened all the cages. Some man interrupted their dialogue and explained that the werewolves had to go to autumnal, because the warehouse was just a transitional place to hold the wolves kidnapped by the vampires. They were going to load them onto ships and send them to autumnal, the final destination. If the ones they were looking for weren't here, they had already been sent there. It became clear that the vampires were trying to conduct experiments. The man added that they wanted a special power that only werewolves had. Their goal was to draw in all powers, including those from the wolves, to create a world for themselves. And their next target would be Khan, who would now have to be extremely careful. Aramal City was unequivocally huge. The vampires moved through its streets in a group until they noticed something. Gino couldn't believe it because every person in front of them and passing by were vampires. There was a girl watching them from a huge mansion. She was enjoying the thought of the lords coming to this place. The first vampire would be very pleased if she brought their bodies to him. Khan asked the older man why he was to be the target of the vampires. Why him specifically, since the guy didn't have any special powers? As it turned out, the reason was the necklace around his neck. The man was sure it was a sign of the lycanthropes. Khan explained that he had had it for a long time, so he didn't want to believe that it was true. The lycanthropes were descendants of the wolf gods who were thought to have disappeared in ancient times. As he knew, werewolves inherited positions and traditions generation after generation, and the silver hair, leadership, and necklace known as the Silver Fang were the hallmarks of the great lycanthrope warrior called Khan. The werewolf was surprised that this stranger knew his name. The man assumed that he was the only one who knew about such things, except that the guy himself could see that he was different from his fellows. For example, during the Red Moon, he was the only one not reincarnated again. While his buddies barked and scratched their fur, Khan scrutinized his body, which was more like a human body. But then he had no idea what the reason might be, because his appearance must have changed to that of a wolf under the light of the full moon. Khan wondered why he was different. He thought he was inferior or something. But now the man explained that the boy was born to lead everyone else. Khan's mind seemed to brighten, but he still had a hard time believing it. At this time, the lords were marveling at the fact that in such a huge city, all the inhabitants were vampires. Jekka didn't even feel any human waves, which sounded great. With so many vampires around, no human could survive. It came out that Atomnal was a city of vampires? That explained why all the shipments went here. And no matter what was sent, it wouldn't look suspicious because everyone was on the same side. Their secrets were safe, which meant the vampires had taken over the entire city. Healy followed the others into the municipality with a menacing look. They needed to meet the one who controlled the entire city, and that was in that very building. While the sun shone brightly in the city, the altar was still engulfed in moonlight. Soha still continued to lie on the cold stone as she dreamed of her in a snow-white dress strolling through a field of flowers. Sir Healy called out to the princess, to which she was glad. In front of her stood all seven lords who had come to escort her to the queen. The woman wanted to discuss something with her, the girl made the assumption that it might have affected her marriage. Apparently some prince from a neighboring kingdom had proposed to her. As it turned out, Healy had heard about it, and there were only good rumors about the prince himself. Except that the princess wasn't interested in marriage yet, much less a marriage of convenience. She just couldn't imagine spending the rest of her life with a stranger. Sure, Soha realized she couldn't complain, but was she really not allowed to be with someone she truly loved? and only because of her status. It could have seemed like the guys were alone, and every word her highness said, the vampire carried it over to himself. Healy looked at her with a devastated look, as if it offended him. Her sad eyes were hidden by the shadow of her long hair, making her gaze dulled even more. The girl continued to explain that marriage should be the fruit of love, but for her it would prove to be a chore. These words only made him sadder. For a while he watched her in silence, sorting out his feelings. The boy put on a playful smile and said confidently, 
that the princess would end up with a wonderful man because she had a chance to marry an excellent prince. Except that she was shaking her head in different directions because she still wasn't ready, and so Hao was going to tell her mother about it. The last sentence snapped her out of reality. The princess's eyes began to blur and her body staggered. Suddenly she collapsed, falling right into Heli's arms. She covered her eyelids with the palm of her hand and explained that she had been feeling dizzy a lot lately. Guy, on the other hand, was concerned about how often it was happening to her, so he was going to arrange for a checkup with a doctor. Her Highness smiled embarrassedly because Healy had always taken care of her, for which Her Highness was grateful. The blueness of her eyes gently enveloped the Lord, causing a blush to appear on his snow-white skin. Some sort of bond had formed between them, but Healy explained that this was his job and duty. Of course, he didn't see it that way. However, how else could the boy answer? The vampire gently held her body by her shoulders without touching her skin, something the princess noticed. Someone else was watching. Someone who looked like Darden, and from the look on his face, he wasn't very happy about the situation. The guy hiding behind the tree was peeking at the couple, but the expression on his face hid resentment and jealousy, but there was nothing he could do. Couldn't show up right now. Finally, the protagonist managed to be alone with herself. She clicked the door shut, leaning against it as a heavy sigh escaped her lips. Suddenly someone interrupted her peaceful stay in this world. This character thought Selen, her highness, was beautiful. It was the same man who was peeping at her in Healy. He inquired about the marriage discussion, which the girl respectfully declined. Selen strode defiantly away without paying any attention to the Chancellor. It was good news for him because she had done just as he wanted except that the princess had made it clear to him that her decision was in no way about him. While she cast an exasperated glance at him, the guy stretched his smile wider and wider as they both wanted the same thing. The chancellor stated that he was also against class status marriage, but that only made her angrier. Slillin was furious that a man had overheard her conversation, to which the man replied that her voice had always been heard clearly by him. His heart followed her. Her highness did not want to hear those words. But it wasn't only the princess who was angry. The chancellor's eyes reflected disgust because she spoke to him in such a way because he was not a prince. In the end, it turned out that class mattered to her after all. The man brazenly grabbed her arm, pulling her toward him and mesmerizing her with the blue of his eyes. Salen didn't stand for it and slapped him in the face. He had no idea why she didn't like him. But that didn't stop him either. The chancellor wanted to know what he had to do to get her. Darden saw no bounds and continued to taunt. Fortunately, the princess was stood up for by Sir Healy, who would not tolerate disrespect towards her. If he did that to her again, he wouldn't get away with it. The vampire tossed it aside and quickly led her highness away, though she didn't mind it herself. Darden was alone with his demons. He was filled with an anger that wanted revenge. By this time, the pair had traveled far enough, wandering the corridors. The princess thought the chancellor was quite a competent man, but his deference was out of line. She understood that it was impossible to always control her feelings, but she had to realize that there were some things she could never have. Sir Healy watched her mesmerized. He admired not only her beauty, but also her wisdom, though those words struck at his heart. Suddenly the princess froze with whistling in her ears, and her facial expression reflected fear. Her highness began to fall unconscious before the vampire's eyes, but he managed to catch her. An eagle of dark energy hovered over the mansion, accompanied by downpour and lightning. At this time, Dardan was poring over many books in the library. He scattered them all around, making a house, looking at the pages. There was only one person stuck in his mind. He wished to get his hands on Princess Selen. The Chancellor had traveled a long way to obtain this high position despite coming from a broken family, but still can't get her. The boy wondered why he wasn't good enough for her. Would he get what he wanted if Darden took possession of the country? The thought made his body disobey and his anger burst out. He tore up his writing to calm himself, but his mind was consumed with the idea of possessing the princess. It was already too late, for Darden had set himself up dramatically. He was consumed by darkness, and the idea of taking over the entire country had grown into an addiction. He would need absolute power for such an outcome. His crazed eyes furiously absorbed the information. 
from the scriptures until suddenly Mang burst into the library. The woman rushed toward him, shouting that he wasn't allowed to come here whenever he wanted because this was where the king's secrets were kept. Once again, it was all about social classes. The man was cradling some book and watching Manj predatorily. As it turned out, the woman was aware that Dardane was conducting suspicious experiments. Could it be that he was trying to do something behind their backs? Surprisingly, the would-be villain did not hide his plans and shared that he wished to gain power. Manj tried to stop him, especially when he had that book in his hands. The thing was under a ban for a reason, and granted, Darden already knew the real reason. He forced the woman's mouth shut and explained that the royal family wanted to maintain their power. His look was getting crazier and crazier. Mange called for help and in a few seconds the guards rushed inside. But while they were running, Darden managed to escape. The woman saw for herself that this chancellor was up to something dangerous, so she had to hide important documents. But at this time, Selen was greedily gulping air to cool her frail body. The queen was afraid that this might happen. Members of the royal family had been born with shamanic power for generations, but the princess's power exceeded any ability the kingdom had ever seen. That was the reason her body couldn't take it. The older Salen got, the more the power inside her grew. At this rate, she wouldn't survive. And the only way to save the girl was to use the treasure of the kingdom, the blood of Argar, the ancient god of wolves. Several figures towered over the princess's body. The queen bent down to her and gave her a drink of some liquid, after which the Selen figure began to emit a bright light. It began to gradually rise up, illuminating the room like the sun. No one understood what was happening, and neither did the princess. But the feeling of warmth didn't leave her until someone called out to Selen. In the magical space, she was approached by a wolf who explained that the girl had shamanic blood flowing in her. It was Varger and he granted her power. Her curious hands reached for the animal's wet nose to make sure it was real, but its giant silhouette turned into blue energy that soaked into Selen. And then her body sank to the bed, taking all the magic. The queen rushed to her daughter, hugging her with all her strength. The princess mentioned the wolf king, but it was as if the woman hadn't heard. She thanked Varger for saving Selen. And while everyone thought everything would be fine now, Darden noticed through a crack in the door the last drop at the bottom of the vial. After that, the boy began to undergo a terrifying change. His body seemed to dry up. No matter how much blood he drank, he was still thirsty, and his skin burned at the slightest exposure to sunlight. Darden wondered what could have gone wrong because he and the princess drank the same blood. Could it have been due to not drinking enough of the liquid? According to another option, the man lacked shamanic power. He had failed to become the perfect vampire lord. And this thought did not leave his head, but on the contrary, only nurtured hatred. A year later, the queen was already ill. She asked her lovely daughter not to be sad as it was their only option. Selim mourned relentlessly over the condition of her mother, who tried to reason with her. All of her highness's power was sealed in a blood altar. And after the girl drank Fargur's blood, she became the first vampire lord, one with shamanic power and the power of the ancient god of wolves. So when the queen passes away, Selen will ascend to the throne and inherit the power she sealed. The princess will possess the highest powers of the kingdom. Tears continued to roll down, smearing images before her eyes. A mother begged her daughter to do this to protect her people from Dardan. Since now the queen would no longer be able to stop him on her own. His army had expanded and filled the dark corners of the state. Not long ago, they had donated Selen blood to create new vampire lords, and the werewolves also fought alongside them. The powerful creatures joined forces against a common enemy, but they still found themselves in a strong minority. So the protagonist had to go to the blood altar and perform a coronation ceremony to unlock the sealed power. At this moment, he burst into the queen's bedroom. Dardan had a sinister smirk on his face that said that he was going to inherit the power and rule this kingdom. The sturdy man turned into a zombie, followed by an army of equally savage creatures out of control. His blood-red eyes enjoyed the sight of the princess. He didn't want to do this. Dardan only wished for her love, but she wouldn't even look in his direction. On Selen's defense was Mange, who took the first blow from her opponent. 
Red liquid showered down the clawed hand of the man who wished to take everything for himself. He was going to destroy even her, if it would help get her highness. Um, if the vampire managed to inherit the powers of the queen, sealed in the bloody altar, then he would manage to capture her powers as well. Those crazy eyes belonged to the monster. His joy didn't last long, because a shadow belonging to Healy appeared behind his back. The Lord proudly fought the vampire spawn. He was later joined by his brothers, who immediately set about protecting the queen and princess. The monsters attacked in droves, but even so they were unable to get any deeper. While Healy examined Selene with his eyes, Darden managed to make a stealthy strike. The first vampire denied being the villain. They felt the same way. Because they were both in love with the princess. At least he believed Healy would understand him. Darden was about to imagine winning this battle before the Lord resisted, wounding his opponent's limb. His body was completely covered in blood, as was the figure of the present madman. At that moment, the rest of the boys had crept into the room and Darden had nowhere else to run. In his current state, he wouldn't be able to handle them, especially when his army began to dwindle. They surrounded the guy, causing him to activate his magic. A violet biofield appeared around the vampire, which threw the lords a short distance away, but it cost them a big price. And watching it was painful for the princess. Darden took down his opponents with a light sweep of his arm, leaving behind a trail of blood. A smug smirk stood out against the ominous red eyes, symbolizing victory. He glared at his main enemy, Sir Halley, her highness even froze in fear for her dear one, overflowing her gaze with emptiness. Tears mixed with the blood on her face, giving an even more distraught look. Celine was approached by Manj, who tried to reason with the princess. She shook the girl by her narrow shoulders and told her to hurry up and walk down the bloody aisle. Horror and fear froze on the woman's face. Her highness was to hold the coronation, except that the girl's attention was directed entirely at him. Darden was watching the situation between them expectantly, something Salen was discouraged by. His hand hovered over the woman's body and abruptly flew downward, making a stab. She realized from the wild expression on her mistress' facial expression that something was happening behind her back, but the princess managed to put up a protective field. Selene hugged her governess tightly and closed her eyes, letting the magic escape. But it was too late. The claws of the first vampire had severely wounded Manji's back. She asked the princess not to worry about her condition. Even though she said she was fine, but it was now Her Highness's duty to conduct the coronation at the altar. Tears washed the blood out off Selen's snow-white skin, who refused to leave Mange. The reason was that Darden would kill everyone before she got to that place, so the girl couldn't sacrifice everyone just to make herself queen. The governess still didn't give up hope and tried to change Her Highness's mind, but the latter wouldn't listen to her and interrupted her. Selen asked the woman to do her a favor, the first vampire, on the other hand, paced the bloody floor at a valiant pace. I mean, they had always stood in his way. However, now the kingdom, the princess, and everything in general would belong to him. The man looked around with a heavy gaze at his new possessions until suddenly the reason he had done all of this came at him from the side. The princess rushed furiously toward his tall figure, which was adorned with a fanged grin from ear to ear. Darden could do more only if she would accept him. As he rejoiced in his victory, someone stabbed him from behind. A fountain of red liquid showered his ceremonial suit and his gaze became sharper and more fierce. Healy raised the hull of his body and tried to stop the rebel, but Dardan activated his ability again, aiming it at his entire arm. Selene wished to prevent this, so she covered the Lord with her body. The first vampire's blow came at her, but it happened so fast that Darden didn't even have time to stop. His glassy eyes concealed panic and pity for what he had done. The man's hand spontaneously moved back as if that would make a difference. His pale skin was covered in cold sweat because Her Highness was badly wounded. Tears and screams began to burst out from Heli, who was afraid to touch her frail body. The protagonist was breathing heavily, gradually closing her eyes. Lord looked at her pleadingly the moment the words escaped her lips. Selene said the man had saved her life enough times without fear or hesitation. Her body hovered over him and savored the last sight of him. She knew what he had been hiding from her all this time because the princess had been hiding the same thing. 
Her Highness hoped they would be honest with each other next time. Healy's mind cleared. He had just realized what an opportunity he had lost. The girl lifted his chin with both hands and gazed intently into his eyes, as if she was looking into his soul. Suddenly a bright light began to emanate from her body, causing her hair to turn from dark to blonde. Magic oozed out in different directions and spread throughout the bloody room, flowing into the other lords who were unconscious. The very seals that filled the vampires with power began to appear on their hands. But only Healy saw it actually happening. The image of Her Highness, who had sacrificed herself to save her kingdom, appeared before his eyes. But suddenly the light went out, and the mansion was plunged into darkness. Darden froze with horror, for they were all gone. The first vampire was left alone in this empty hall. As it turned out, the princess' favor was that she wanted to share her power with the knights and send them into the distant future. And then, when it came, Mange was to find them and watch over them. And even now, lying on the bloody altar surrounded by the enemy, Suha was crying because she remembered her past reincarnation. Selin had to return to this world again. Moonlight illuminated the watery surface, in the middle of which was a secret passage. There Darden scrutinized the howling hostage lying humbly on the stone altar. Tears were streaming from her eyes, and her mouth opened involuntarily, trying to make a sound. The first vampire wondered if the past memories might have returned with the hidden powers, but he was still tense about his former lover's current state, so he wished Selene would stop crying. Dardan sat down next to her current body and watched. Tears came to his eyes at the thought that the princess would hate him again once her memories came back. After all, the guy brought me back in the form of her favorite person. But why had she chosen him again? Except it was completely built into him. Because Darden could still love Selen even if he wouldn't be loved in return. The first vampire could kill everyone and take every lord's powers, and that thought gave him strength. Meanwhile, the lords were already standing in front of the town's administration house, which was filled with other vampires. Sean confirmed that it was the municipality but he wasn't sure if they would be able to meet the mayor. Healy insisted that they should try their luck anyway. His serious gaze read confidence mixed with tension. The boys didn't even have to try. The front door opened by itself. A girl in red glasses appeared behind it, waiting for the lords. She invited the vampires inside, making them petrified with surprise. Her name was Trisha. The girl held the position of the mayor's secretary, so she assumed that the guests had come to meet him. While Trisha led them to a certain office, the lords communicated with each other using a mental link. Jaka asked his brothers to be on guard because this secretary was an unusual vampire. All seven felt a strange energy from this figure, but it was this figure that led the protagonist to the mayor's office. Inside the room, a middle-aged man was sitting behind a desk, feeling slightly uncomfortable. It was noticeable by his facial expressions. The strange situation surprised the guys a lot, because the mayor appeared to be an ordinary man, which amused Trisha a lot. She gleamed her predatory eyes, letting out her teeth, and watched the reaction of the uninvited guests. The mayor was a public figure, so she had chosen the right person. Or, more accurately, Trisha had made him loyal. The smirk never left her smug face. Simply put, she was the true ruler of Autonomal. Instantly realizing the desolation of the situation, Jayan and Jaka attacked her with questions. They wanted to know where Soa and the first vampire were. Healy joined in with him, his gaze penetrating to the point of shivering. He wished to make sure that the princess was at the bloody altar at the moment. Trisha was satisfied with their reaction, but still asked them to slow down and behave with more restraint toward her. She had only invited them to give them a gift. Pressing a button, the girl opened a secret door that led downstairs. To retrieve the unknown item, the boys had to follow her. Her gaze was definitely hiding something, and so Solon mentally asked Healy what they should have done. They didn't have a choice. That meant the guys had to follow her, even if it was a trap. It was surprising that the town hall was such a place and reminded the vampires of a temple. And then Haley remembered the words of Soha, who had asked him to bring a sword from some temple. Was that really what she meant? Trisha's hand gently pulled back the curtain and revealed something that made the Lord's mouth drop open. It was an ancient sword, 
the glow of which could blind. The secretary turned to Healy, asking if he remembered the item, for the cold weapon had once belonged to him. Trisha wanted to return it to its rightful owner, so she invited the guy to come over and take the sword himself. The girl explained that she could do it herself, but no one had the right to touch it, because even the slightest contact could burn the skin. Solon jumped into the conversation and mentally addressed his brother, talking about not taking the sword because it was like a trap. Except that the picture of Saul lying on the bloody altar kept running through Heli's mind. The girl was begging him to save her. Now Jaka had explained to his brother that if Trisha hadn't lied and the sword was deadly to them, then the vampires would never let them just take it away. Those were the exact words the girl had voiced out loud. They were right, however there was one, but Trisha glittered her eyes which made a bright red light appear in space. A ripple emanated from her magic which was reflected back to Healy. Solan abruptly lunged towards his brother, who a second later moved towards the sword, extending his arm towards it. Healy didn't realize what was happening, because his body wasn't listening. And then his skin made contact with the sword. A bright light illuminated the room, followed by memories coming back. Images of Selen, of the last battle with Dardan, and of the declaration of love to the princess who had sacrificed herself came to mind. All this time Sir Heli had been hiding the same thing as her. So in the new real incarnation, they had to be honest to each other. Sadness and resentment tore the lad, so he hid himself to a wild cry, making the brothers worry for him. Except that the throbbing reached their bodies too. Heli's pale skin was wet with tears. The realization that his visions had once happened to him in reality was terrifying. They were memories too vivid to be false. What made the sword deadly was where he would point it. Heli held an object from his past life with both hands. And now Trisha's malicious intent became apparent. Now she had to decide where the vampire would point his sword. The girl explained that it was time to kill her friends with the same object that had killed her people. The six vampires waited motionlessly for their doomsday. Healy was nervous, as he was unable to control his body. At this rate, he could really attack everyone. His body shook with resistance while his brothers were unable to move. Apparently, this one was the ability of the vampires who controlled the entire city. No one could believe that she single-handedly controlled out of everyone. Her gaze read confidence and relaxation. Of course, because everything was in her hands now, Jaka reacted quickly and mentally told Shion to do something. The guy knew how to hypnotize too. He directed his gaze at his opponent, until suddenly he was punched in the stomach. Healy and Shun's terrified faces met before the vampire collapsed into a cold sweat. He began to greedily gulp air, but his eyes slowly began to close and his body began to bleed. Noah could do nothing, but Trisha controlled her toy, forcing Heli to raise her sword over the breathless body. Suddenly, the strike was interrupted by a dark force that stuck to the cold weapon like slime. Noah activated his ability, causing it to become the next target. Healy realized what would happen next, but still couldn't resist its power. Suddenly, someone's hand grabbed Noah by the neck, lifting him into the air. It was John, whose body was moving on its own. The guy was actually hurting his brother, who was already gasping for air. While Noah was wriggling in the air, Solon was wounded by the sword, a pitiful scream was coming off Healy's lips. Tears were flowing down his hand because there was nothing he could do. For the werewolves, however, it was incredible to see a tonal just like that. The five wolves marveled at the fact that every passerby here was a vampire. The first item on their plan was to find Camille and Ruslan, and everyone agreed, even if they didn't know where to start. Suddenly, Tahel smelled something familiar. Khan noticed it and asked what it was about. They were here. The smell of the heli group was still in the air. The werewolf said that they would be able to find out where the guys had gone, which actually happened the next moment. John was almost done with Noah. The guy's face was decorated with scarlet blood and his hands let go of his brother dead. Healy shouted out the name of Solon, who was also lying motionless in the red puddle. Trisha was enjoying this beautiful sight, something she wanted to do alone. However, the girl asked them not to worry because the guys would be together for a long time yet, as she had no desire to end things quickly. Suddenly, she was illuminated by a bright flame 
that carried straight towards her. Gino activated his ability and was already ready to resist. It made Trisha nervous, especially when the fire caught up with her. She rushed towards Gino to stop him, but a stranger's hand was attached to his head. The hand belonged to Jan, who slammed his brother to the ground. But he wasn't the one doing it. He was once again being controlled by the villainess who was enjoying watching them kill their own friends. Abruptly her attention shifted to Jaka, who appeared from behind. The vampire activated his ability gathered in his clawed hand, but his body stiffened under the pressure of Trisha's magic. He practically managed to grab her neck. There was a visible look of shock on her face, and Jaka was mentally cursing because he only had a second to spare. His body heaved heavily because of his strong lungs. Even Trisha noticed what a perfect opportunity he had. Sweat was dripping off her face. She would not let this happen again. Eli dealt a mortal wound to his brother, catching his gaze. Jacob's eyelids began to slowly close and his body fell to the ground. The vampire watched in horror at what he was doing with his own hands. His tears were the size of pupils, and all of his clothes were stained with his brother's blood. Only John remained, who was getting even more terrified when Trisha said this. Heli raised his weapon, stood in front of him, ready for another attack. The girl was triumphant because there was only one opponent left. Adrenaline kicked into her head and Trisha wanted Jayan's head. Healy's body clenched, but her legs took leisurely steps on their own. The guy was shaking because of the resistance, but even so the female vampire continued to increase her strength. She was angry as her toy refused to obey. However, the villainess had seen her through one moment. Next to her lay the body of Jaka, who continued to feel pain. The boy opened his eyes and slid his hand around. There wasn't a living spot on him, but he continued to remain conscious. At this time, the werewolves were already standing in front of the town hall from where they could smell a group of vampires. The only question was what the guys were doing here. Angie made the assumption that Healy and the others had come to this place to meet with the mayor, who controlled the vampire city. Suddenly someone approached the wolves. It was Trenna who invited the guys to come inside. Moreover, she volunteered to show them the way, smiling a wide smile. Healy's body was trembling and there was noise in his ears. His muscles resisted the will of the villainous and tears flowed in hail. But he failed. The vampire snapped out of his seat to Jan, who was timid at what was coming. And that was felt by Soha, who didn't stop sobbing. The vampire braked sharply. The blade of his sword remained a couple of centimeters away from his brother's head, which was frightening. Trisha released magic into space with renewed vigor, forcing Healy to finally make it. But now it was she who met the end, at the hands of Jaka. Her red eyes glazed over with surprise and the realization of what had just happened. She spun around, grabbing the back of her neck and directed murderous energy at the boy's wound. Jaka was mentally cursing because he should have taken her head off immediately, but the wounds only slowed him down until suddenly it began to glisten and gradually heal. It was Soha. The princess mourned for her friend and even though she was in such dire straits, she tried to help him. Except that the others were still seriously injured, their bodies lying motionless surrounded by bloody puddles. Trisha recognized the princess's strength, so she hurried to finish what she had started. In her mind, she called out to Trenna, the one who was now leading the werewolves inside the mansion. The girl flinched and stopped abruptly, turning back to the wolves. Trenna apologized to them because her sister had called her. The vampire had hoped to take them to a more interesting place, but unfortunately now she would have to indulge them right here. Suddenly the room was filled with inferior vampires that she was the one in control. So much for showing her true colors. Trisha, on the other hand, was slowing down due to the heavy loss of blood. But Jocko was waiting for this because of the wound his rival had used up a lot of strength and to control all seven at once was difficult even for her. It was for this reason that the girl stopped the six of them and forced Healy to attack them on her own. And the vampire froze when Jayan moved. That meant Trisha could only give complex commands to one of them. And now she was having a hard time controlling even one. And if Jaka's speculation was correct, she had no control over the wounded. Hearing this, the vampires began to react differently, something Trisha was definitely dreading. The first was Shion, who blocked her magic. 
It was working. While the woman directed her attention to him, Heli was able to act. The boy quickly rushed towards the villainess, swinging his sword. Except his attack was repelled by Trenna, who had come to her sister's aid just in time. She was brewing in anger as these guys had dared to hurt her sister, and she couldn't let it go. The werewolves, on the other hand, managed to hold their ground, sending the inferior vampires away. When it looked like it was all over, they noticed that Trenna had left them and just disappeared. The team couldn't let her get away, so they proceeded to follow her. Tahale stopped them, however, because he could smell their brethren, albeit not as clearly. The vampires, on the other hand, were having a hard time resisting, especially when there were more opponents. The girl kept them from moving and Trisha gave the sword to her sister, who was full of strength. This way, they would end up dead. They could sense each other, so they knew how to work as a team. A perfect job where Trisha manipulated magic and Trenna used physical strength. The latter darted off towards Healy, already rejoicing in her victory. But a wolf of enormous size got in her way. The animal suddenly piled all its weight on the girl's figure and pressed her into the ground so hard that splinters flew into the air. Trisha gripped her wound harder as Khan opened his jaws, so she aimed her ability at him. This gave Trenna some breathing room, who a second later delivered a crushing blow to her opponent. There was no more hope left. A fountain of blood rushed from the wolf's wobbly figure. Khan growled menacingly, causing Haley to revive even more. But Trina continued to press on. She jumped and struck the wolf directly in the wound, causing the other werewolves to rush over. Jakar recognized the guys, one of whom instantly took his second form and joined the fight, even though he was screaming at the top of his lungs to stay away from her. Except the wolf wished to exact vengeance for his leader. Trisha had time to react and direct her magic at him, causing him to petrify and hover in space. Her sister seized the moment and struck him with her sword. Thus Najak became another victim of these girls. Healy explained to them that the older sister could control the actions, but she couldn't control everyone because of her neck wound. Even though she had the power to target everyone if they got within range of the ability. Trisha ordered her sister to start dealing with those who were injured, and she didn't even want to disobey. The first one in her path was Salone, and when Trenna was about to catch his lifeless body, Angie managed to take the guy in her arms and get him away from the sword in time. She was seized by a great anger. The werewolf, on the other hand, asked the others to get the wounded out of there as soon as possible. The guys never thought they would be rescuing vampires, but still, they couldn't leave them to die. Trenna, on the other hand, couldn't let them leave. So she decided to go on the attack again, except that there was a voice in her head. It was asking her to leave them behind. As the werewolves took out a few survivors, the door suddenly closed behind them. Trisha pressed the button, glad that victory was still hers. Now then, she would let the remaining ones rest in peace. Healy, still holding the sword, could feel her gaining more control and theirs becoming less. The woman gave the order for her younger sibling to attack. Trina gripped her cold weapon harder, winding it to the side for balance and a strong strike and increasing her speed. The boys one by one were getting wounded by her sword, which the princess felt. And when Healy was left alone, the girl was glad that she would be able to end it all quickly. She rushed towards him, practically catching up to his neck, if it wasn't for one but. Right on her back jumped the main character. A huge stream of air formed in the space that could sweep even vampires and werewolves off their feet. Somehow, Sua had magically transported herself and Trenna straight towards her sister, who had fallen at the hands of her own sister. The girl's eyes went blank at the realization of what had happened, as the head of her family member was flying downwards right before her eyes. The problem for both was that the older sister had bitten the younger, which meant that if the former died, the latter would meet its end as well. Tears began to stream down Healy's face. Just now he had seen Soha, but the girl had suddenly disappeared somewhere. The vampire called her name pitifully, spinning from side to side, but there was no answer. Was he imagining things? It couldn't be, because there was no other explanation. The Lord was sure that she was the one who had helped them. Suddenly, a bright glow appeared to his right, coming from the werewolf's body. At the same time, the same thing was happening to the princess's body.
Dardan watched her mesmerized, as if he was afraid of what would happen next. His gaze was fearful and wary as the girl disappeared and reappeared. The first vampire was sure it was the princess's ability to turn into mist. Sohat had learned of her power when she brought back memories from the past. Back then in the square, she hadn't even been aware of them. But now, the man doubted that she was able to use her powers properly because they had gone to the lords who had come to rescue her. Soho's face was still wet from the tears that kept pouring non-stop. As long as Darden thought like this, he had no reason to worry because all her powers would eventually become hers. At this time, Khan returned to his human form, coming to a realized state. This caused the others to exhale in relief for the guy who didn't realize what had happened. The last thing he remembered was being shot. The werewolf lifted a shirt, seeing that the wound was no longer there, which meant he was fine. Luckily, no one was hurt, because suddenly their bodies glowed and the guys were healed. The vampires, according to the wolves, believed that Suha was the cause of this. Khan asked the brothers what had happened to the sisters. Healy intervened and said with certainty that they had died. Soha had done it, not him. The phrase made Khan jump to his feet, looking around for the girl. She wasn't with them now. The werewolf was angry because if the vampire was to be believed, the princess had handled her rivals without being here. Heli didn't fully understand the whole situation either, but he himself had seen Suha appear out of nowhere and disappear again. Everyone tried to analyze the situation in their own way, watching the vampire in amazement. How could this even be true? Heli lowered her eyes and uncertainly made the assumption that it was her ability. Something akin to teleportation, but not quite it. In her opinion, the protagonist wasn't capable of traveling to other places while retaining her physical shell, but she was able to instantly appear somewhere by turning into mist. Suddenly, Solon's words came to Solon's attention. I remembered Suhaha talking about how she had incredibly realistic dreams at times. So much so that she remembered all the sensations and even the smells. But was Su sure they were just dreams? Heli kept saying that the princess was back where she was. But how could she be so sure? It was hard to believe, but when the vampire picked up that sword, all his memories came flooding back. He remembered who he was himself, who Suaha was, what had happened in the past, and how they had ended up here. These were memories from a past life in which the protagonist was present. She was the princess of an ancient kingdom, and they were her knights. However, Dardan had plunged the kingdom into danger. The lords were sent to the future, and Saul had only recently been reborn. Khan realized it was about that guy they fought in the forest. He was still chasing Soha, which is why he stole her. Anyway, in the guy's memories, the girl had a special power that hadn't been seen in the entire history of the kingdom. The way she appeared and disappeared was like her ability from a past reincarnation. Was Healy really suggesting to just believe it? But he knew that they would save Soha no matter what and so would the werewolves. The vampire believed she was chained to the blood altar, and to find out where it was, the boys decided to check with the fake mayor. The man claimed he had no choice, but when the guys asked him the question, he replied that the place was in the center of town, in the Havernal. That's where they were going to go, except Angie decided to ask one more question. The werewolf wanted to know if they kept the stolen wolves here, and if so, he demanded the keys. After a while, the boys found Camille and Rustlin. They were safe and sound, which the werewolves were even more pleased about. As it turned out, the boys had had a chance to escape, but they'd stayed to see who was behind it all, so they apologized for the extra trouble. But it was all right, as Camille and Rustlin were now safe. Healy broke their idol by informing them that he and his brothers were going to the blood altar, so he suggested that the wolves join them. Khan immediately responded in the affirmative. The reason was to save Soha and Heat for their brethren. And since they were all going to the same place, Healy wanted to join forces. Of course, those who were familiar with the Lords agreed, but Ruslan and Camille were showing a fierce reaction because they didn't agree with their conclusions. They were going there to save their friends exactly from them. The vampires. The guys' reactions were mixed. Some took it as an insult and some, on the contrary, considered the werewolf a fool. His words were understandable because those who had kidnapped his kin were standing in front of him. Solon was the first to burst his patience, angrily shouting that they were different from the representatives of their species. What's more, 
The boys were heading down the aisle to end the vampires. But Camille refused to believe. Now the guy didn't even want to talk to them. Seven listened to what the werewolf would say next. Once again, Solon resentfully replied that they were the ones who didn't want to go with him. His mood was echoed by John, who added that the wolves would only get in their way. The vampires turned their backs sharply, leading the rest of the brothers and claiming that they would be the first to prevail. Even Sean was childishly pissing off his blood enemies. He made a funny face, saying he would outplay the werewolf. Tahel was furious about this and rushed after Sean, who mockingly demanded that the boy not chase him. The werewolf was already breathing down his back, but the two of them couldn't stop hurling dirty words at each other. The vampire exclaimed that it was so frivolous to accentuate his behavior. But when the boys opened the door, both of them froze at the sight they saw. All the vampires in the city lay motionless in a chaotic pattern, as if a massacre had just taken place here. Jacob explained that when the vampire sisters died, so did all the ones below and bitten by them. The boy ran all the way down to keep up with them. But unlike the bully twosome, the chase was a bit hard for him. The werewolf couldn't believe that all these people were their victims. Haley's verdict was that all vampires would disappear when Darden died, because he had started it all. Jaka wondered if it was possible that vampires with special abilities, like the sisters or the one who used the mist, had been created by the original himself. That was most likely the case. At least judging by their behavior and the number of vampires that died after them. Then why were they kidnapping werewolves? What were they up to? Healy wondered, his eyes downcast with doubt. The original he had recently remembered. Akai Dardan drank the blood of Vargar, the ancient god of wolves. That was how the vampire had gained his power. Those words made Khan think of something. Healy continued his story in which, because of the lack of shamanic power and the small amount of blood he drank, the first vampire became incomplete. Khan suggested that he had kidnapped the werewolves to drink their blood. But Rosalind clarified that Darden needed not ordinary blood, but special blood. He overheard them talking. All well, he was trapped here. The vampires had said they were looking for a special werewolf, and then Khan remembered the old man's words that he would be their target. It all made sense now. This was the reason why the vampires were not so selective. Understanding was reflected in his eyes, and behind it, solutions would probably appear with ease. Elsewhere, well-groomed hands clutched the book roughly, crumpling the binding dart and gritted his teeth in anger, for something had not gone according to plan. He realized how they were gaining powers. That knowledge made the vampire go into a frenzy, creating chaos all around him. It was all about the bloodline, but Mange, sitting behind bars, tried to change the guy's mind that it was far from the truth. In her opinion, it was about preparedness. The royal family inherited power not because of their royal bloodline, but because of their willingness to take power into their own hands. The powers acquired by the royal family were the result of their propriety. That was something Darden would never gain by hurting others or taking advantage of those who worked for him. The vampire's blank stare changed to a crazed look. It had come to him. Mange was leaking the princess blood. A lot of vampires died, but not all of them. And the city was too big, so the guys had to be careful and keep their guard up until they left this place. Sean, however, exhaled as he noticed that they were currently lagging behind. So he wondered if they couldn't at least overtake the werewolves. The boys answered that it was pointless, even if the vampire didn't want them to beat them. But that wasn't what they had to worry about. The lower vampires of the city were watching their every move. At the same time, the wolves were also cursing the avowed wolves in whose crowd they were right now. Camille wished to rid them all of them. But that would be a mistake, because right now the guys were outnumbered, which meant that it was impossible to waste their energy on them. And just as Khan was about to finish his thought, sharp fangs gleamed behind his back. Fortunately, Camille had time to react and fend off the vampire's attack. But he wasn't alone. Suddenly the crowd of bloodsuckers was engulfed by the fire that Gino released. The rest of the guys also joined the fight with the vampires using their powers. Noah surrounded the group of monsters into a black prison, which would make it easy to deal with them. And Camille was frozen by their magic. The same werewolf that was fighting on the Healy team's side came into his field of vision. 
This caused Camille to sink into thought, causing the guy to fall out of reality. He wouldn't have even noticed the inferior creature attacking him if it wasn't for Ruslan. Jan struck the vampire sharply, destroying it with a single blow, and asked the werewolf not to be distracted, but to run away. Camille didn't ask for help, but he clearly needed it, as he couldn't even catch the vibe of the enemy that tried to attack him again. This time, the blow was taken by Shine, who prevented the three vampires from biting the wolf. The Lord explained that they would do their best to keep the inferior creatures from doing so, as long as they were okay. But Camille still didn't believe it, and believed that the boys were on the same side as them. He left Sean like it was his business and took Rushland with him. The fight continued, but now Angie and Khan joined in, breathing heavily from the relentless attack. There was no end to the vampires, and it was pointless to keep fighting them. Everyone realized that they needed to get out of this town as soon as possible, but it was easier said than done. Healy volunteered to pave the way, so he asked everyone to follow him. Khan called out to his fellows, who instantly rushed in his direction. The vampire definitely used his sword, causing the monsters to fall one by one. But unfortunately, not everyone was able to keep up. Noah glanced back and noticed that the vampires had surrounded Camille, so he abruptly threw out a huge stream of magic, breaking through the path. There wasn't much time left because Noah didn't notice the attack that Ruslan managed to prevent. The guy hit the monster in the stomach, throwing in a sigh. Jacob grabbed Camille's arm and pulled him behind him, using acceleration magic. Now it was time for these two to go too. The inferior creatures continued to chase them, and at that moment, a truck appeared. The truck rammed into the monsters like a bug. Sean was behind the wheel, who was treating it like a sandbox game. Gino, on the other hand, was suddenly angry because he asked if his brother had a license. The vampire with joy in his eyes gave a negative answer. Xion kicked the door open with his foot and called out to Jan and Gino to start a fire and back the truck out. The boys instantly understood his plan and set about implementing it. Just as the inferior vampires attacked the vehicles, Jan threw back a huge blob of energy that triggered an explosion. Now they wouldn't have to worry about being chased. When asked if everyone was healthy and alive, Solon answered positively, but he didn't see a large stone shard flying towards him. Camille took the impact, and his blood showered the ground. The boys rushed in their direction to help in any way they could. The werewolf was badly wounded, and Solon was in shock. He didn't understand the reason Camille had done this. Najak tossed aside part of the building with ease, helping his brother to his feet. No one else was hurt, but the vampire was still worried about the guy. As it turned out, he realized that Solon was one of them. But the vampire showed a completely nasty reaction, as if he didn't understand what the conversation was about. Camille made a disgruntled grimace, because the guy had just turned into a wolf. But that was none of his business. The half-breed defiantly stood up and walked past the savior of his life as if they hadn't saved them. And by the way, Solon didn't even ask for it. Those words built a wall between the boys. But the Lord still felt guilty about what had happened. Camille's leg continued to bleed, and it gave him no peace of mind until the wound suddenly began to emit a bright light and healed. At this time, on the bloody altar, Manj lay in a lifeless state. The color of her skin had turned corpse pale, and her pupils had turned into white abysses. Darden had drunk all of her blood, but he wasn't going to kill her, for the woman would still be useful to him alive. Right now, he needed to make sure Manj didn't say too much, so she had to hold out even longer. His eyes burned ominously red like a madman's. As soon as that very moment came, the first vampire would let her go, because they were almost there. Darden noticed that the princess was getting stronger, though she was giving most of her strength to those guys. At this rate, it would be harder to get rid of them. That thought made him think that he needed to deal with those guys soon, since it wouldn't be long before Selen's powers would return. Now that Madge's blood was flowing in his veins, there was only one thing left for him to do. Khan ran up to his fellow man to make sure his condition was safe, but the wound was already there. Camille decided that this power belonged to a girl named Suha, and it was true. The werewolf wanted to know why she, being not even acquainted, was helping them. Hele explained that the protagonist was a princess of an ancient kingdom, and all the tribes lived in it. 
For that reason, for her, werewolves and vampires were her own people. All of them were valuable in her eyes. And so the guys received her help. Camille couldn't accept those words, so he refused to believe that nonsense. He marveled that vampires and werewolves had once lived in the same country. It seemed like nonsense, but Healy was telling the truth, and it was up to each person to believe it or not. However, they too must have felt that Sua could control the werewolves. Those words made them freeze. Moreover, her instincts were protecting them. Camille was still not relenting. He didn't care because he hadn't even met that girl. It made sense for Healy to fix that, and then they would know what he meant. Either way, the vampire wouldn't be asked to join, since werewolves didn't seem to be comfortable. Therefore, they could meet it at the blood altar. The boy thanked Solon for saving his life and the vampires left. The guys couldn't believe they had to travel, all the way on their feet. John mumbled that there was nothing more that could be done. They were not allowed to use any means of transportation in O'Tonnell. Even so, Gino offered to take a break if anyone was tired. Jane sharply refused because they were almost there. Sean decided to take advantage of this and asked his brother to carry him on his back. Jika was worried about the group of werewolves because their common enemy was targeting Khan. Sean, on the other hand, whom Jan had just put on the ground, explained that he should have been worried about himself. The guys could have been their number one target. Someone confirmed his words. Someone upside down whispered this in the vampire's ear and abruptly reached for his neck, pulling him with them. The rest of the guys noticed this and rushed in pursuit, but their next target was Jan, who was plunged headfirst into the ground. Gino used fire magic, which also found some competition. Some girl imprisoned the guy in a water prison, and even Noah had no strength against a vampire who had a bright light coming from him. The Terry couldn't get him. When Jaka tried to help his friends, another opponent got in his way, able to build up his speed even more. He overtook the guy and struck him. Sol, on the other hand, met up with a vampire. Only this monster drank quite a lot of wolf's blood, because of which his appearance, to put it mildly, transformed. Could they imagine the feelings when this child took this man's place as a knight? One of each? Hands covered in bruises and band-aids piled with renewed vigor on Sean, who was already finding it difficult to breathe. The enemy cheered as the vampire made such adorable noises as the boy gasped for breath. Dirdar's words were too bad he wouldn't hear them again. His body balanced deftly on the tree, lifting ever higher the blonde whose figure was floundering for weight. At the same time, the other vampire was furiously pounding Jan into the ground. The impact was so hard that the ground shattered into several tiny pieces, and the dust hid his head. The villain made a smug grimace because his opponent was a weakling, especially since Jayan had dared to challenge the original. But while he was rejoicing, the vampire abruptly used his free hand to punch the arrogant man in the jaw. Lord was still lying on the ground, but even that didn't stop him from dealing with the attack. He took a hard gulp of air mixed with dust and stared at his opponent expectantly. Except this only amused him even more. A smirk appeared on his face, which puzzled Jayan to some extent. Suddenly, Dardan's servant turned his hand into a fist, convinced that his opponent was indeed a weakling, and struck again. He drove the vampire into the ground, who had no time to offer any resistance. Meanwhile, Gino's body was becoming increasingly wet. The Lord tensed his eyebrows, making his expression look concentrated. Mentally, he was cursing because they weren't capable of anything. The guy was soaked to the skin and now he couldn't summon fire. Small sparks reflected in his hands which instantly faded out. The villainess continued to play a wave of magic, urging her opponent to come closer. His abilities were useless against her, which was clear to both of them. Gino pondered the fact that he would have an advantage if he fought with his bare hands. The vampire clenched his fist, thinking of a plan of action. She noticed that the guy would fight against her physically, so she increased the pressure, summoning more water. That being the case, the girl decided to try some trick. She made a funnel that Gino was sucked into. The guy ended up in jail. On the other side, one vampire was drinking his tea and exuding a bright light, which was so much that Noah couldn't even do anything. His shadows only fell in the opposite direction and he couldn't reach his opponent. Dardar's servant was almost pitiful to look at. 
A smug smile played on his face because he had thought of something more interesting. A different light began to emanate from his hand. The man himself, holding a drink in his left limb and holding magic in the other, rushed toward Noah. He was making to help the guy surrender. As quickly as possible, the sparks blinded the vampire, causing him to close his eyes. It gave his opponent a chance to strike a blow to the stomach that Noah wasn't ready for. Jakal also received an attack, only to the face. The vampire was so fast that the Lord didn't have time to deflect the blow and fell, landing on his feet. His body was thrown back several meters, and while Jaka tried to keep his balance, the servant of the primordial approached and tried to strike again. The Lord managed to avoid it by lunging upwards sharply. Only two magics could be seen in the space. Green and orange colored. The guys moved quickly, so it was hard to track them. They were sweeping away everything in their path. Suddenly Jaka lost sight of his opponent, who appeared from behind. But he could see it. Solon also failed to resist the blows of the so-called vampire. The guy was wounded in the stomach, which took away his strength. The enemy noticed that if he were a half-breed, he would have turned into a werewolf, otherwise Solon wouldn't stand a chance against him. This monster was huge in size. Its body was insulated by wool that was unevenly distributed over its skin. The monster hummed as it saw the Lord's confusion. The vampire reincarnated, after all and rushed sharply towards Dardan's servant. When the guy was ready to bite him already, the monster's hand stopped the guy laying his body on the ground, thrusting in with increasing force. At this time, Hile brought his sword down against the red sword of his opponent. He felt sorry for it since as a kid, the guy respected this man and wanted to become a knight like him. The man was angry and didn't understand why the Lord took his place. But Haley explained that it was the Queen's decision. Even though the old man thought she was stupid for hiring a kid like him, the lad knew it was a wise decision. The Queen didn't choose someone who was stronger, but someone who was more trustworthy. Haley threw himself into the attack. Speaking of strength, the old man exclaimed that this guy would never defeat him. The two magics clashed together. The swords rang, making a horrible clashing sound. The vampire lord trembled before the former knight's intimidating gaze until suddenly the space was colored with red shards. Healy explained that this was how it had been in the past. But when the man sided with Dardan, he promised himself never to lose to him again, and his sword would not let that be doubted. The knight's camisole dyed scarlet. The man's face contorted, trying to adjust to the pain. His gaze, filled with anger and resentment, fell on Healy. He agreed that the queen had not misjudged this guy, because the vampire did have unique potential. His instincts told him that the lord was superior. But these guys would never realize how miserable this knight was when Healy took his place. He realized that he would only fall. While the guy would continue to grow, his figure shrank, shoulders slumped, under the weight of the sword and the heavy loss of blood. But the memories of that humiliation gave him strength, fueling his rage. Did they really want the man to admit his shortcomings? He had sworn allegiance to Dardan because the first vampire had promised to make him stronger. Unexpectedly, his opponent's face grew younger as if a completely different man stood before the protagonist. Both opponents clenched their swords harder and rushed towards each other. The knight increased his speed, deflecting Healy's strike. The bright sparks from the contact of the blades illuminated the space with vivid colors. There was a slashing sound in the space. The Lord mentally noted that the man was quite strong even with a broken sword, and that only made it worse. However, the knight cheered knowing he had a backup plan in store. His hand abruptly reached for his belt, pulling out a dagger from there, which instantly slid near Healy's face. The gaze of his yellow eyes stared at the blood that showered his neck. The moon illuminated the night space brightly. Standing out against the starry sky, Darden was jubilant for the reason that finally tomorrow the full moon would have to rise. He had waited a thousand years for this moment. Sparks and lightning played in his gaze until suddenly the vampire looked up at Suha. It was as if the princess's powers had almost fully unfolded. Her abilities were far more incredible than the villain could have imagined. If only she could use them properly, Darden probably wouldn't have won then. But the fact that the girl could share her power with those guys, even while on that altar, was only to the advantage of the first vampire. No matter how much they got, 
they were only inexperienced youths compared to his fighters. And this time, Darden sent those who were able to overwhelm each of their forces. The boys, even though they were losing, still continued to resist, gathering all their power together. But with each blow, the enemy grew stronger. They don't stand a chance of winning, because Darden's fighters would kill everyone, which only made him feel confident. Suddenly, Soha's body began to emit a bright light. It sparkled as if it was a ray of sunshine. It was clear from the first vampire's thoughts that she still had strength left that she would share with her friends. Sean transformed in face and threw his opponent down sharply, pinning him to the ground. The blow was so hard that the vampire coughed up blood. Gina, who was almost unconscious due to the lack of air, released fire magic that was several times more powerful than the pompous girl. A huge explosion followed from the flames of which the guy was completely high. Jan's strength appeared as well. He managed to prevent another blow from Dardan's servant. That wasn't all. The guy clenched his fist, causing his opponent to lose control of himself, and Jayan managed to take advantage of that. One blow, and he was ready. Jaka built up his speed, making the vampire look around for him. There was a whistling in his ears. All he had to do was scream for help because the enemy came out of nowhere. Jaka was throwing punches even as the enemy said he could see his every move. But he probably overestimated himself because the Lord was much faster. The same thing happened to Noah. There was an eerie rumble in the space as shadows appeared and swallowed up the light. Darden's servant was encased in a circle of dark energy that only suppressed his abilities. He was going mad at how powerful the Lord was, but still his matchmaker held back the shadows. Except Noah had never said he would use them on him. The vampire remained calm, closing his eyes and concentrating the magic around him. And it became clear after a short interval when Log suddenly appeared above the blonde's head, trapping him. Meanwhile, Soa's appearance had already changed considerably. Her hair had turned a faded white, as if she had dried up. The werewolf-like monster pressed Solon, who was in his second form, into the ground. Darden's servant wanted his opponent to know what it was like to be killed with his own powers. His crazed gaze was backed up by a sinister grin and his outgrown hair which added shade to his terrifying facial expression. Except he hadn't expected Solon to have powers. After a bright glow, the werewolf struck a sharp blow slashing at his opponent, and then bewilderment was reflected in his eyes because just a second ago the victory was in his hands. The Lord was so fast that the servant of the Primordial did not even have a chance to counterattack. For this reason, Solon easily sank his fangs into his neck. Sean also seemed to have succeeded in disarming the enemy, except that he had missed something. His doppelganger increased his magic, telling him that the guy should have done what he told him to do from the beginning. As it turned out, it was the enemy who knew how to put people in a trance. His legs lifted him up on their own, now that Sean would want to do anything for him. And above all, this madman wanted the Lord to punch himself in the face. An unfamiliar vibration sent shivers through the vampire, as if taking him into some kind of vortex. A vortex of magic swirled around his small figure, and Dardan's servant stared at it mesmerized, as if it were his best work. The game had turned the other way. Sean had taken the lead, and now he was already commanding his opponent to transfer his heart to him. His semblance couldn't even resist. He, in love with him, began to wound himself without feeling the pain. That was what ruined him. He was no match for the Lord, so he should have behaved more modestly, just like Shion. The blade of the dagger was close next to the yellow eyes that belonged to Heli. The guy continued to fight with the man who was fighting with both hands. The Lord grabbed the cold weapon, causing him to injure himself, but that was what distracted the knight, slowing him down. The protagonist increased his strength and broke the dagger with a crack. The man was perplexed as to how he had managed to do that. It simply couldn't be real. His red eyes filled with fear and terror as his opponent continued to press on. Healy easily kicked him in the jaw, making his enemy's blood spurt. While with his next move, the guy inflicted a slashing wound staining the space with red liquid. The blonde hair slowly fell to the ground behind the breathless body. The Lord greedily gulped air to regain his confused breath after the long and hard battle. He watched as the vampire slowly began to dry out, taking on real facial features. But was everyone okay? Gradually, 
all the enemies were defeated. The guys were kneading their battered muscles and pulling up their clothes because they had been badly beaten. Fortunately, everyone was alive and unharmed. Moreover, as Sean stated, they had become stronger once again. So help them in this. Hilly noticed that his brother's neck was a dark blue color, but the vampire didn't pay much attention to it because the girl was going to heal him soon. Indeed, they had gotten an incredible boost of strength. But at the same time, for some reason, the wounds were no longer healing as fast as they used to. Healy thought about it and looked at his wounds, but did not share this information with the others. He asked Chaka to check to see if there were any enemies left around. Even though the guy agreed, the wound from the last battle was making itself known. And Healy had noticed it. Even Gino kept coughing, thinking it was because he had swallowed water. Janda, all the bones in his arm were shattered, hence the limb was trembling. Noah also had one problem. He couldn't see well and attributed it to exposure to light. Silanan, on the other hand, had a wound that was too deep to heal. Suddenly Jaka shouted that there were strong waves coming from not far away from them. The guys thought that they had decided to ambush them, except it was the opposite. They were moving away from them. Then the question arose, who, other than the Lord, could they be heading after? A thought ran through the werewolf's mind. The boys traveled a short distance, approaching the wolves whose bodies lay motionless on the ground. They had attacked them. Hile lifted Angie, who slowly and quietly uttered, at one of the enemies used electric waves, but the guy suddenly closed his eyes. On the other side, Camille tried to lean on his arms. He said that the enemies had taken Khan. At this time, another vampire with a bright green hue to his hair was carrying a werewolf who was passed out. The bloody altar was illuminated by the bright sunlight, but the same positive atmosphere down below could not be said. Darden was writhing in anger because all of his servants were useless because they couldn't kill any of the lords. Moreover, the vampire didn't think the princess still had any strength left. He looked with a slice of anger at her graying hair that said Sua had shared all in remaining strength, though that was just a guess. Except if the boys made it to this place before the ritual was complete. Then, no, Dardon definitely couldn't let that happen. He had to stop them. However, Khan was already slowly beginning to come to his senses, and his first thought was about her. The boy was afraid that he wouldn't be able to save Sooha. The fear that he might lose her forever was engulfing his mental clarity. His brothers trusted him and followed him. What if he wasn't able to protect them too? What if Khan wasn't capable of anything? How should he have acted then? The werewolf felt fear because he had the responsibility of keeping his loved ones safe on his shoulders. Tears washed away the picture of their images, which even in his mind kept smiling. If he had more strength, things would be different. Someone's voice called out to the lycanthrope. Khan closed his eyelids and began to listen to it. It was the voice of a great wolf. According to whom the boy had inherited his blood, the blood of Varger, the god of wolves. His huge figure watched him carefully as he continued his story. Khan was born to lead their tribe forward. For that reason, he was not to be feared. He had more strength than anyone else. Of course, the hero didn't believe it. Everything was like a dream since he was only half werewolf. He couldn't transform under the full moon, and because of that he thought he was imperfect. Except, as Varga told him, that was far from the case. He was more than perfect because he could be called the moon of the tribe. He was the one who would reveal their true potential. Khan demanded an explanation for these words, for he had no idea what this creature was talking about. And according to the hint, the werewolf should have been prompted by his instincts at the right moment. So now he should have contacted everyone and become the moon of their tribe. Verga had instructed him to use his power to serve his master, but who it was Khan never knew because the figure of the wolf turned into magic dust, gradually disappearing and taking the light with it. In reality, the werewolf kept asking him to stop and help him find answers. Tears rolled down his dirty skin, coming in contact with the leaves that the wind was whipping away. The guys had to find him. Camille tried to get up, but his body would not obey him. He told the vampires to ask Soa to heal them like last time. Except Healy boldly made it clear that it was beyond their power. His angry look met with the demanding gaze of Camille, who continued to press on. The boy pointed out that the vampire himself had said that the girl would help them anyway. 
However, he didn't realize that Suha had already done everything she could. They couldn't wait for her to continue bailing them out, so they needed to handle this on their own. The other vampires nodded in agreement. Gino explained that the inferior creatures wouldn't be as active in the daylight, so they should have gradually moved forward while recovering at the same time. And everyone was in agreement. So Noah approached Kamel, wanting to help him up, but the werewolf refused, rejecting his hand. Solon asked his brother to just leave the rude wolf alone. The boy screamed in anger that he hadn't asked for that and noticed someone else's presence. The two groups were surrounded by a bunch of vampires hiding in the shadows of the trees. Fate seemed to favor these creatures because they were active at this hour for some unknown reason. Suddenly the servants of Darden began to attack without thinking of the consequences. They rushed swiftly to catch their victims, gradually burning from the sunlight. Perhaps that meant that the boys were almost there. The lords resisted, throwing back and destroying these creatures with ease. Noah let out shadows, causing him to feel worse. Mentally, he tried to understand why, even with so much combat power, he would act so recklessly. Abruptly, his eyes began to turn white, making the images blurry. This would have allowed the vampires to attack him, but just in time, Jayan mirrored his opponent's strike. Noah remained standing in a daze, and when his brother asked if everything was all right, he said yes. Except there was a look of fear on his face and his gaze was frozen, casting his attention to only one point. It was getting uncomfortable as his vision blurred for a moment. Something strange was happening to Jan as well. All the bones in his hands were shattered, hence the unbearable pain, making it difficult for him to use them. Healy stopped their musings, ordering them to protect the werewolves while he cleared a path with Gino guarding behind. Solon took a resisting Camille on his back, silencing him. They didn't have time for drama, but the werewolf kept demanding to let him go. But he wouldn't help his fellow man with that, because the Lord was bleeding. Camille noticed that his body was not healing. Moreover, Solon was bitten. The screaming stopped, and the guy holding on with his last strength asked not to tell anyone about it. Healy was also struggling to hold on. He gripped my sword tighter with both hands, covered in someone else's blood, and glared at the looming threat. At this time, Mon was nervously watching Darden, who was amused by her reaction, hummed, because the woman herself had clued him in that he had managed to catch the one, his hand held Khan by the hair. This caused the princess governess to act more animated, trying to get through to the first vampire. Now he had everything he needed. He raised his head triumphantly and exclaimed that when the full moon rose, he would have everything he desired in his hands except that Darden didn't notice Khan regaining consciousness. The werewolf had grabbed the villain by the neck, taking him by surprise. Now he was already squeezing him, causing strange sounds to fly out of the vampire's mouth. Khan's appearance began to change before his eyes. His gaze reflected menace and anger, as if he were ready to turn into a monster. His naturally dark hair was turning silver. The vampire's skin was damp with sweat, dripping down onto his opponent's hand, which was clutching his neck even tighter. Darden tensed his right hand, preparing to thrust it into the werewolf, but it lightly touched his hair. This caused Khan to hurl the fiend aside, causing it to hit the wall, shattering it into small pieces. Dust covered his opponent's body as the werewolf stood on the altar, where Soa was. He caught his breath and rushed over to her immobilized body. Her hair was completely white, which alarmed him even more. At this time, the lords were trying to push back the low creature's attack. Heli cut them down with his sword, clearing the way for the others. There were too many of them, and their strength was becoming less and less. Would the protagonist be able to tear through? His hands trembled, but continued to hold the sword with vampire blood running down the hilt. He skinned his hands, but despite the pain, he didn't drop the cold weapon. Sean exclaimed that they needed another way because it was pointless to waste their strength on monsters. Jakka took the initiative to lead everyone else to a place where there were fewer of them. He tried to dash in the other direction, but the pain made itself felt. It caused the vampire to slow down and shrink because that horrible feeling was spreading throughout his body. He wasn't able to speed up, which Angie felt sorry for. He didn't want the wolves to be a burden to them but he'd made a promise that as soon as the full moon rose, they'd deal with the enemy immediately. The last thought made Jaka think of something. 
He realized that the vampires were trying to hide something, and it was true. His magic told him that the inferior creatures were trying to draw them away from the altar. The boy turned around sharply and explained that they had to go back to where they came from. The enemy had pushed them back in the opposite direction. The vampires weren't just mindlessly running at them. The lords were already close to the blood altar. Dardane's servants wouldn't be able to kill them, but in numbers they could force them to go around. To buy time, which meant the longer the boys stretched, the better it was for them. Jaka thought it must have had something to do with the upcoming full moon. It followed that they had to get to the altar before moonrise. Khan, on the other hand, tried his best to wake up the princess, who was humbly sleeping surrounded by the enemy. He begged to be allowed to get her out of the place, and so he seized her, pulling her against him. Except that Darden, already standing across from him, was angry because he wasn't allowed to touch her. The vampire had been trying to keep the werewolf alive, he said, but there was no point in holding back now. Khan did not listen to this madman, but wished to know what he had done to her. Again his body began to glisten, though the first vampire had warned him not to come any closer. It would be best if he didn't want his friends dead. It made him petrified on the spot. The werewolves were tortured and restrained by magic. Khan pinned Sua down harder, the moment Dardan began to approach him, speaking to the lycanthrope at the same time. This meant that the werewolf could not let his fellow werewolves die. The vampire abruptly delivered a crushing blow to him. Khan offered no resistance, which led him to believe that he also loved the princess. Then in the villain's opinion, he should have abandoned his friends and gone to save her. Now all that was left was to see what his addiction had cost him. Both sides suffered. The boy's body was imprisoned behind bars. The guys on the other hand were trying to keep themselves strong which was hyper difficult. Xion was barely on his feet, but he couldn't afford to stop because everyone was fighting. He didn't want to become a burden. The same was happening to Noah, who could barely see anything. He couldn't even tell if the enemy or friend was in front of him, but his brothers would be in danger if he stopped the opponents. Yes, and Gino didn't have enough strength to keep the fire going, which was now in the form of sparks, glowing not so bright and hot anymore, Jaka mentally realized that they needed to reach the final point before moonrise, and so he didn't give up either. Their brother, Jayan, couldn't even lift his arms. But all seven of them continued on their way, absorbed in their own thoughts and carrying the werewolves on their backs. Healy wasn't sure he hadn't doomed them all. Suddenly, someone's voice was heard. The man hadn't expected the boys to get here alive. But what a shame that Hivernal was only for higher vampires like them. At that, they could barely stand on their feet. But the vampire was expressing fake pity as they wouldn't give in, so he asked to be allowed to massacre them on the spot. His sharp fangs stood out strongly against his blood-red pupils. The man lunged towards the victims, who were almost ready to surrender, but he was resisted. The villain's blood gushed like a fountain, and in front of him stood Angie. The vampire was thrown back because the enemy showed his claws. The shapeshifter froze, trying to concentrate. Words of gratitude came from his lips because now with the rising moon, it was their turn. The red glasses slid down the bridge of his nose, revealing a view of the predator's gaze. Now they would drag the boys along on their own. At this time, Darden was bathed in the moonlight that illuminated the altar. The preparations were complete. The first vampire had the Soha, the shaman's blood, and the lycanthrope. All that remained was to wait for the full moon to rise. But the boys weren't about to give up. They fought the enemy with a coordinated team, thus increasing their speed in the offensive. Even if the vampires were unable to run, the backs of their friends could help them. Ruslan would point the blind Noah in the direction where the enemy was, and then he would whip them with his shadows, while the others would finish them off. But Darden was already in anticipation, for the moment had come. From the corner of the crater a bright light comparable to that of the sun could be seen. And as the magic began to mix, turning a bright purple color, the first vampire became like a madman. The space rumbled with an overflow of power that he enjoyed watching. And while the werewolves were slaughtering the inferior creatures, making sure the lords were still alive, a moon had already risen. That meant they were about to turn into wolves. Angie examined his body, which was slowly beginning to build up hair. Especially, the full moon was going to rise soon 
so they had to get the boys down the aisle as soon as possible, before it was too late. But Darden cheered as the forces came together. This magic had been passed down from generation to generation and he could feel it just by standing next to it. It was absolute power. It was exactly what belonged to the queen and the princess. Suddenly, the man turned his attention to the light from below. It was coming from Suo's body, which was becoming like a golden statue. As it turned out, the girl still had the power of a queen in her. The vampire was amazed as he hadn't even started to extract the princess power yet. In a counterattack, the guys were plunged into the darkness, where Tahal was seriously injured in the leg. This made the others nervous as he fell to the ground. This was decided to be taken advantage of by one of the monsters. Fortunately, his brother came to the rescue and crushed the enemy. On his back was Shoan. The Lord asked to put him on his feet because he was still able to fight. The boy was wobbling. They didn't have time for that because they had to reach the place before the full moon rose. And they, meaning the werewolves, would stay here and hold the defenses while the guys would rescue Soha. Along with Sean, the answer was given by Hilly. The guy thanked them and hoped they would catch up with them soon. The vampire's gaze was blank, but they all knew it was the right thing to do. Moon was almost completely out of the shadows as the lords rushed to the princess's aid. Solon, on the other hand, was bleeding, which made Healy very tense. Jacko was also asking Jaon to let him go because he didn't want to burden him. But everything was fine. Brothers would never be a burden to each other. Something strange was going on with Noah. Even though he said he felt fine, he wasn't healing, on the contrary. It was only getting worse, just like the rest of them. All vampires felt so powerless, though they wouldn't admit it. But Darden, the first vampire bathed in powerful magic, filling up like an empty vessel. They were too late. The villain gleamed smugly with his eyes, eyeing the lords who had entered the hall. A muffled scream came from Heli's lips, which was interrupted by a violent rumble. He saw Sohoi's hair turn completely white and assumed it was their fault because the girl had given them all her strength. Suddenly the sword in his hand began to emit a bright light. The same phenomenon began to surround the other guys who began to look around their glowing bodies in horror. A huge stream of magic whipped towards the altar on which Soa was lying. She opened her eyes in which only the whites of her eyes were visible. Her skin was glowing. It became clear that the power shared by the princess were returning to her. Healy guessed that this was some kind of ritual, so instantly made the decision to stop it now. Using the mental link, the boy turned to his brothers, telling them to hurry up. No one understood what was happening. It was like they couldn't hear each other. And it turned out to be true, their telepathic connection wasn't working. The vampire felt his strength leaving him, so he couldn't delay. He dashed towards Dardan, ordering Jaka to get Suhoa. But suddenly there was a rumbling in his head, knocking him off his feet. Green magic was emanating from the villain who was getting cheerful. And this was just the beginning. The stranger made it clear that it would be best if the lords did not meddle in other people's affairs. His ability, like an electric charge, immobilized the already exhausted guys. The magic continued to build up, and the servant asked his master not to worry about those little bugs. A smirk blossomed on Darden's face. For now, he could begin his plan. He grabbed Mange by the hair, indicating what she was to do from now on, then whispered in her ear, threatening. She wasn't allowed to do anything stupid, especially if the woman wanted to keep the princess alive. Darden pressed down on the girl's neck, giving a kick to action, and it worked because the governess instantly began to sob. The first vampire felt a sense of triumph as everything was in his hands, and now Manj only had to give him what he wanted. Except that she turned out to be much more stubborn. There was a cracking sound. Blood dripped from the woman's mouth, mixed with tears and sweat. Darden was furious because his victims had dared to bite their tongues. He kicked her aside, rushing to his servant, ordering him not to kill the lords. The vampire dared not disobey, and as that phrase flew out of his mouth, a werewolf stabbed him in the back. It was Solon. He knocked his opponent down, allowing the others to escape from the magical confinement. Heli jerked up and called out to the surprised Darden, rushing toward him. But something seemed to be wrong. The villain was not afraid, but rather waited with anticipation. Surely the Lord didn't stand a chance. Darden managed to immobilize Heli with a single blow. 
It was fun for him after all, the guy was the best knight in the kingdom. But now he was on his knees in front of him. They were all going to lose their abilities soon. When the power shared with the princess would leave them, the boys would realize they were nothing. And it was time for to face the truth. They all lay breathless after the long battle, even Solong could no longer resist. But as the enemy tried to strike one last blow, he was suddenly surrounded by wolves. One wrong move, and scarlet blood lit up the space. Strange sounds and activity caused Dardan to turn around quickly, causing Healy to kick him in the stomach. Red liquid squirted onto the altar. The vampire was transformed. His hair had turned as white as his brother's and Suha's, but despite his interrupted breathing, he gripped his sword tightly and tried again to thrust it into the fiend. But the werewolf was ahead of him, grabbing Darden like a toy. The sinister eyes cursed the wolf who had taken the man's body into the abyss. Healy lunged toward the princess, trying to reach her, but she was weakening before his eyes. The Lord lifted her lifeless body in his arms to carry her out of this cursed place but some mystical force held her on the altar. It was a ritual. The ritual was keeping her from leaving. Healy didn't understand what he had to do or how to stop it all, but Soha was breathing heavily, as if it were her last breaths. Her skin was getting red and wet with sweat. The vampire pressed her harder, reminding her of what she'd said to him in her past life. The princess wished they had no secrets from each other in their next reincarnation, but he kept something secret that night when he bit her neck, fear had overtaken him to the point of death. But at the same time, Healy felt so happy, as if he had been reborn. Not only did it prove his harmless nature, but it meant so much more. A man felt how much she trusted him, and how much he was capable of showing concern. However, that wasn't all. The girl had mentioned biting Chris on the neck, but she couldn't bite Healy because they were no longer children. At that moment, the Lord pretended to be calm, but in reality, it was far from that. His heart was tearing furiously out of his chest. That night, the moment of the bite, the sound of her breath in his ears, the pulse in her veins that made him shudder, her skin where his lips touched hers that burned his gut all of it made him furious. Healy held all of these feelings inside of him, not asking to bite the back of his neck. Even though they were only friends, he wanted something more. They weren't children anymore, and that was the reason the vampire wanted Suaha to bite him. So when she woke up again, Hile begged to do it again. He promised to get her out of here. Her hair slowly began to return to its true color, something that didn't get his attention. The protagonist's lips involuntarily reached for his cheek, and her eyelids gradually opened. From her lips came his name. He had come to save her again. What then, what now and always? Tears filled her eye sockets, but they both wanted to look at each other. That's what he felt for her. But someone wanted to end it all. Once and for all, Dardin grabbed Haley by the neck and gritted his teeth in growing anger because the Lord was in his way again. The vampire blamed him for the princess making that choice. And if he hadn't been, he was lucky at least in this life. He increased the force, squeezing his neck even harder, making Haley short of breath. The protagonist hugged him and used her ability to carry him off, leaving only Miss behind. The vampire found himself passed out, and Suaha was trying to figure out why she couldn't leave the altar. Darden caught up with her, hurling Haley's body into the abyss. They were left alone. The two were surrounded by a transparent dome that held the protagonist in unusual confinement, while the Lord flew continuously downward. The first vampire called out to her, farting tears of loss to tell her that the end had come. Those who had come to save her were dead, but he still had many fighters. The strength the princess had shared with the boys had returned to him, as did the power she had inherited from this altar, whose biofield had been pierced by an unprecedented power. All of it filled Dardarn. His crazed gaze glared predatorily at his latest victim. He gloated because Suha could not even leave the altar. The reason was suggested by the first vampire, who explained that she would not be able to do so because of the beginning of the ritual. A satisfied smirk said that the protagonist wouldn't be able to leave this place until he took everything from her and made her his forever. Darden jerked the girl sharply to his side as her anger built up. Tearful eyes saw the sword Healy was fighting with. She instantly lunged in his direction, reaching out with her free hand. The villain noticed the unnecessary movement, but did not have time to prevent it, 
and therefore quickly squeezed her hand. Thus the sword was behind her back. At this time, Healy obediently swam to the bottom, at the same time thinking about the fact that there was not a living place on him. He couldn't even move a finger. But his head was still filled with thoughts of Soaha. Healy had to save her and had to protect her. It was his duty. That's how he felt about her. But right now, the guy was unable to make any movement. When wounds appeared on them, she always healed them, but all their strength was hers. Sua had always helped them, so why couldn't Healy return the favor now? Was he really nothing without her powers? And if that was the case, was it really out of his power to save the princess? Tears came even beneath the watery surface, but Dardana seemed to hypnotize her with his gaze uninterruptedly repeating about the end. He convinced himself that Suha could not stop him. The first vampire squeezed her hand even tighter, causing the sword to fly out of its prison and toward its true master. Its clang woke Healy up, and then her right hand began to emit light. The boy didn't understand why this was happening, for all of Suo's powers were gone. The mark on the back of his palm was still there. The magic of the altar began to mix with Dardan's magic, taking on a bright purple hue. The protagonist, through fear and tears, continued to resist. She would never give her abilities to someone like him. The villain, on the other hand, decided it would be best if the girl was reborn again and escaped. As she wished, because he could wait as long as he wanted. No matter how much time passed, and no matter where she hid, the first vampire would still find her. Suddenly his angry look changed to a neutral one. Darden had something he wanted to ask. While Suaha was growing up, remembering nothing about herself, how many people had she sacrificed? Had the girl ever wondered why there were always rumors about her, as if she was a vampire? Darden looked like a madman now, but he continued to press her psychologically. Why had so many people around her died? At the hands of vampires? Or why had the house of her friend Chris caught fire? And for what unknown reason had he died so young? The villain blamed it all on Soha, who froze like a stone. Darting tried to explain that it was all happening because she didn't remember her past life and had befriended him. Because Suo cared for him, put him above everyone else. So the villain had to take his place. His brazen hand reached for her tender cheek. The protagonist could not foresee what would happen in this life, but the events of the next life would be her conscious choice. She now knew who the man standing in front of her was. Soha could run away again, if she so desired to let the people around her die again. A last decision was left to her. He watched her reaction and expression carefully, until a slap hit his face. The blow took more strength from the princess than she could have expected. Her heavy breathing was accompanied by an ear to ear smile that belonged to Darden. Now it was too late. She should have fought sooner while she was devising her plan to escape through reincarnation. The girl had lost her remaining strength, so in her current state she would not kill him. As in the past, she had no control over her own powers, which was why the first vampire was trying to take them for himself. In his opinion, Sua didn't deserve such great power, but he could use it much better. His hand lifted the girl off the ground, causing her to fall asleep as the man was now going to deal with everything on his own. As Soha closed her eyes, something behind the villain's back began to make sounds. Helia appeared out of the water. The guy was holding a sword, which he used to cut through the cages, freeing the werewolves. The guy himself rushed towards the remaining ones, continuing to increase his army. Inside, there was a terrible clang from falling metal and fleeing wolves who instantly surrounded the altar. Darden's heart began to pound from the exertion. Their wild screams and baleful eyes relaxed the first vampire's vigilance. Then his own hostages began to throw themselves one by one against the transparent dome, while Healy gave his last strength to stop every last one of them. And all that continued to drive him to action was Soa. Thoughts of her never left his head. The man didn't even care if he lost all his strength. Didn't care about anything. Healy had to save her even if the payoff would be terrifying. His gaze was filled with will, but his body was no longer obeying. It was as if the guy was being electrocuted, causing him to freeze periodically. But the seal on the back of his palm began to emit light even brighter than before. It definitely meant something. Except Heli was sure that Soha could no longer share her power with them. So that was different. Dardan, on the other hand, was resisting the wolves. His feral gaze examined each opponent, 
but mentally the fiend was focusing on the wound on his chest that made it impossible for him to fight at full strength. There were more and more werewolves. They were attacking him from all sides, grabbing at different points on his body. But the ritual was still not finished. Healy broke through another prison cell, adding more opponents to the first vampire, who incidentally gave the order to stop the Lord. All the while, the inferior creatures who had been waiting for something rushed towards the last of the princess's defenders. Luckily, the wolves came to his aid, as if they were his personal guards to keep him out of danger. Hilly wasted no time and used his sword again while the boys cleared his path. Next in his path was Khan. The vampire lifted him up, trying to make sure he was safe. The lycanthrope gave almost inaudible responses, but there was no time for explanations because Suha was in danger. They should have entered the fray now, especially when they had such help available to them. The werewolves did not give up and one by one attacked the main enemy. Darden mentally pondered that if this went on much longer there might be trouble, and just at that moment, an enemy appeared right next to his face. The wolf threw the vampire to the floor with a swift movement, making the most horrible screams of agonizing death. Then the claws came into action, tearing the villain's skin. Darlin was close to what he wanted, so he was willing to sacrifice anything to avoid ruining the ritual. A bright purple glow began to emanate from his right hand, which, like an electrical charge, surrounded the yellow magical ball hovering above them. Heli felt vibrations and a strange shaking sensation. The moon was illuminating the lunar altar that was hidden by Darden's magic. Because of this, no moonlight was coming inside. Because of this, all the werewolves took their human form. The Lord guessed that Khan was now in even greater danger, but the werewolf that continued to hold the first vampire remained in the second hypostasis, which sent shivers down his spine. His frightened eyes strained to observe his near enemy. Thus only two figures were visible on the altar, the mighty wolf and the immobilized Dardanus. In contrast, the inferior creatures began to attack the other werewolves uninterruptedly, causing the leader to glance around nervously. The villain decided to seize the moment and delivered a crushing blow to the enemy, freeing himself from its clutches. Healy rushed to his aid, but the first vampire threatened him with Sui, who was asleep in his arms. Claws colored with red liquid approached her neck, and a phrase came out of the villain's mouth. According to it, Healy had to stop everything, otherwise the princess would meet her end. He spoke as if the Lord had not yet realized who he was, making his gaze even crazier. Now they would have to do what Darden said, and the first thing he wanted Heli to do was to lower his sword. That only took a couple seconds. The second order was to con the villain wished his opponent to return to human form. And it didn't take long. The disarmed guys waited silently for what would happen next. The first vampire, on the other hand, was pleased with them, as if he were raising pets. The man leaned towards Sua, expressing the following wish. According to it, the boys were to kneel before him. Both of them became furious, but Darden repeated his words. They could not oppose him, for he had the princess in his hands. He was ready to kill her, but he would never let her be taken from him again. Therefore, no one else would dare except him to even touch her. The villain clawed at her neck, leaving bruises and abrasions, and that made both of them obey his will. They were doing the right thing. Pride was not as important to them as so is life. Therefore, each of them would obey Darden. The thought crept into his mind that the boys would have to swear to serve the first vampire as their master for the rest of their lives. And he, in turn, would share his life with them forever. Khan could take no more. He declared that he would never obey evil. But the boy didn't seem to understand what was being discussed. Darden wasn't just talking about his safety in life. The lives of their brothers and the werewolves who fought for them depended on Healy and Khan's choices. The inferior creatures had captured all of them. What the villain was doing was horrible. Except, in Darden's own opinion, he was making them a rather generous offer because all they had to do was bow down. If the boys wanted to save the princess, the brothers and the tribe, was the lycanthrope really going to disown his people? Or did Healy not care if his brothers died? Did they really think that Dardan would keep Suha alive? He repeated his words and ordered the oaths to be sworn in his service. The vampire thought too long, causing the villain to beat him continuously, thus forcing him to obey. 
Darden continued to hold the protagonist while simultaneously demanding what he wanted so badly. The rest of the guys couldn't even get out of the inferior monster's grasp. That's if they had any strength left. Eventually, Heli lost consciousness. The first vampire cast a gloating glance at the other suggesting that one of them swear their service to him. If anyone actually did, then Darden would keep Healy alive. But only silence was heard. The man threw the boy's body down a second time because no one gave an answer. Suddenly Noah broke out of the clammy hands and started running towards his brother's falling body. Except there was only darkness around him. Tears were rolling down his dirty skin because of excitement and fear. Noah didn't understand why he was crying, but assumed it was because he hadn't seen anything. No, it wasn't. Once upon a time, while locked up in an orphanage, the boy had stopped being afraid of the dark. When he remained immersed in complete darkness, he was able to sense everything more clearly than when it was light. And it was true. The darkness was his territory, and the shadows were part of him even when nothing could be seen. He could feel it in his body. This revelation was probably the reason why the seal on his palm was activated. In the darkness, the vampire could sense his brother's location, and therefore could prevent him from falling. Shadow surrounded Healy's figure, causing a look of surprise to appear on the faces of the others. Incredible power burst from Noah and carried toward his brother. With his eyes closed, he sensed his approach and gently picked him up in his arms. Landing on the ground, Healy opened his eyes and forcefully asked how Noah had managed to regain his powers. He didn't know the reason though. The guy thought that he would be able to use his powers more, but then something strange happened. He felt as if he had always had this power. Perhaps he had just managed to convince himself of that. By the way, his hair was slowly beginning to take on real color. Heli felt the same way. He glanced at his hand, which was stamped with a seal, and then the memory of Mange, who had confirmed the boy's guess that they were different from the other vampires, popped into his head. That's because they were the only Lord's vampires. They had been granted an ancient power. The pattern on his hand was still present even when he lost the power of Soha. Everything had fallen into place. Before the princess shared her power with them, they were vampire lords who had already received her blood. The brothers had only forgotten how to use their abilities, and Sue had amplified what they already had. The unique power that belonged to lords already flowed in their veins. Suddenly, the seal began to increase in size, merging with the main character's veins. His body began to glow with a bright golden light, and his hair took on a true hue. The guy called out to his brothers using telepathic communication. And everyone felt it. The guys did not understand how Noah and Healy managed to return their abilities. But the brother himself explained everything. According to him, even though they had lost Soa's power, they were still in control of their own. The guys thought they had all these abilities thanks to the princess. But that wasn't true. They all forgot about their real power while they were using what the protagonist was powering them with. All that was left was to test it out for themselves. Suddenly, unfamiliar images appeared in their heads, similar to a video message. They were memories from a past life. Noah recognized himself as if it was his old projection. The boys had fought together against the vampires that had attacked the castle. Jaka was paving the way for them, just like the others. The vampires saw themselves using incredible abilities. A fire of hope appeared in Heli's eyes. He wished the guys would remember everything that had happened. And it worked. The seals on their palms began to appear. Darden noticed it and threatened the princess's life again, but suddenly something pushed him in the back. Beach took Soha and disappeared. Khan didn't hesitate and reincarnated while Jaka caught both women. It was time for a rematch. Hot green colored magic flowed through his body and with it his speed returned. Guy began to look around first Suha, trying to make sure she was alive, and then Mange, who was breathing heavily. Suddenly, Dardan's servants rushed towards them, prompting someone to activate their ability and get in front of Jaka. Sean appeared out of nowhere. The whites of his eyes turned a neon pink color, which was subsequently reflected in the gaze of the inferior creatures. The guy hypnotized the opponents and began to command them. He ordered them to bring the heads of their fellow creatures. Right now, vibrations began to emanate from Sheen, which absorbed more and more vampires. 
A massacre began between Darden's servants, who didn't even realize who they were fighting. Khan was holding the neck of the main villain in his teeth. Another vampire tried to come to his aid, but flames blocked his path. Fire magic and current magic met. Of course, the villain's henchman was strong, but Gino was no match for him. Fortunately, the werewolves were fine, but they couldn't fight because the moonlight wasn't coming in. Solon came to their side. He destroyed his enemies one by one with ease until he heard a gash appear on his left side. The Lord rushed to that side, but he was swallowed up by a pile of monsters. Dardan, however, pulled himself together and pushed away the lycanthrope's fanged maw. At the same time, his vampires began to gain strength, attacking his fellow vampires. Khan was the only one who could hold his own in the second form, even with the absence of moonlight. Suddenly, a familiar voice sounded in his head. It belonged to the god of wolves, according to whom Lakenthrope was the moon for his tribe. The time would come, and the man would unlock the werewolves' potential. All he had to do was connect with everyone, and trust his instincts. An unprecedented power began to seep through his body, and a bright light illuminated the space, making all the wolves take on a second form. They froze and watched their leader who fearlessly gave his strength to unleash the magic. The fight continued, and the space was once again illuminated with scarlet blood. It belonged to the vampires. Solon also managed to transform into a wolf and escaped from the clutches of his opponent. His blue fur stood out against the gray mass. Vampires against werewolves. The advantage was with the latter. The wolves were much faster and stronger, which made all the monsters stiffen and freeze in place. While Khan was helping his tribe and realizing his new abilities, Darden took a deep breath and tried to stop it by unleashing his right arm. He brought his sharp claws to bear, almost sinking them into his opponent's neck, except Jan was faster. His strong arm stopped the wretched villain. The other, concentrating all his magic, drove the first vampire into the altar. The guy's teeth crumbled from the hard blow, but Jayan continued to finish him off. He didn't stop for a second, as if he didn't feel tired, but rather, it energized him. Except that Darden was now like his servants. The Lord saw fit not to stop and finally finish everything, but the villain began to whisper something. From his interrupted speech, it could be made out that it was over. The vampire was giving up, however, a satisfied smile adorned his face, swollen in his own blood. Suddenly the space lit up with purple magic that threw John and Khan off the altar. Dardan rose solemnly to his feet and surveyed his opponents, saying that nothing else mattered. He no longer needed the princess's power herself. If he could not live with her, the first vampire would rather die with her. The stone walls began to crack from the intense pressure. Dardan's abilities triggered the formation of an earthquake, followed by a rush of air that picked up wind. The altar was crumbling, and parts of it were falling right onto the lords and werewolves. Noah, who had relearned to sense space, released shadows which, like spider webs, covered the boulders. But he didn't have much strength, so the guys had to hurry up and take Suahau out as fast as possible. Healy rushed to find the princess. Scrambling around the rocks, Jacka held her, and mange in his arms as they gradually began to be swept into the stone prison. But Noah was growing weaker and weaker and so attentiveness deteriorated. A huge boulder fell on Healy, who was mentally wishing for a change of life. He didn't have time to run to it, and the shadows that held the stone structure above Jaka began to disappear, abruptly covering them and hiding them behind a column of dust. Gino also didn't have time to dodge the looming threat, and behind him were werewolves and inferior vampires. Darden closed his eyes. Surrendering to the magic, and began to increase his power, causing the space to crumble even more. There was an eerie rumble of water splashing inside, mixing with the shattered walls. He exhaled one last breath and fell into the abyss. The resulting crater began to fill with water, gradually hiding the bodies of the werewolves and wolves who had given their all to defeat the enemy. The dust gradually began to fall, making it possible to make out shadows in the space that were hard to make out. One of them belonged to Dardane. The man wandered through the wreckage and called out for Celine. He wanted to find her, to be near her in her last moments, but picking up the debris, he found only Healy. The first vampire scrutinized his unmoving body, 
which was bathed in red water. And then a terrible thought settled in his mind. It was a desire for revenge. Dardan swung to strike the final blow, but fate played a cruel trick on him. History repeated itself. Soya covered his attack with her body, wanting to protect her lover. Seeing her lightened hair, the first vampire froze in horror, but returned his hand sharply out of fear. His gaze glanced at her frail body that had suffered him again. Tears began to well up in Healy's eyes as he saw the picture again, similar to the one in his past life. The Lord pulled her tighter against him, and with his interrupted breath, he promised again to return to life and find each other again. He didn't care if it took hundreds or thousands of years, but he would do it again. Hell, I would wait for her, and then he would manage to keep her safe. So I curtly called his name and asked for forgiveness because this was her last life. The protagonist would never undergo reincarnation again, but even in such a moment, she was grateful to have met Healy again, to have seen each of them. The girl was glad because she was lucky enough to spend time with them. And since this was their last time, she wasn't going to keep everything inside her. They were the best nights in her life. Her lips touched his cheek gently. His rough hand slid over her skin, lifting her head slightly. He was her knight forever. Their lips came together in a final kiss. The moonlight illuminated their figures who were enjoying each other's touch. Suddenly, a bright glow formed around Suha, and the magic accumulated after the ritual was released and traveled towards her wounded body. The princess froze in the space that enveloped her in warmth. After that, all the wounds on Haley's body began to heal. The same thing began to happen to the other lords as well. The water-assisted light seemed to fill them with magic. The vampires got to their feet and began to watch what was happening to the main character. There was a look of alarm or admiration on their faces, but they continued to watch as her figure bathed in unusual magic, floating above the bloody altar. Tears washed down the face of Healy, who abruptly knelt down. Khan remembered the words of the wolf god who had given him the hint to join his tribe and use the power to serve his master. At that time, the lad didn't understand which master was being talked about, but now an enlightenment appeared in his mind. He also bowed his head to Suha, who continued to release magic, drawing patterns into the spaces. It was mesmerizing, and each of the lords and werewolves saw her as their princess. They saw her as their salvation. Suha was like a star that had fallen from the sky. Her transformation even made Manje's tears start to flow, as if the woman had been waiting for this very moment for a long time. The protagonist exuded magic that saturated the earth and played with the waves. Darden looked at this miracle with wild amazement and shook because of the real power of the princess. The feeling reminded him of the pressure under which an entire room was divorced. He could not control his body, but he continued to believe that Suo would not be able to curb his power. He had another thing coming first. He still craved revenge for Heli, who had incidentally kneeled down. Blinded by hatred, the first vampire rushed towards him, unleashing magic, just what the Lord had noticed. But suddenly the villain's body was overwhelmed by another's power, causing him to collapse to the ground, screaming and searing pain. The carnage was taken by Soha, who only increased the pressure. She proclaimed the end for him. Her bright pink eyes made him shiver, even more so when all her power returned to her. Darden, with his head down, angrily called her name. All he wanted was Selin's love. He loved her, but if his status was any higher, the vampire wouldn't have done all this evil. He wouldn't have to. Once again, it all came back to his origins. The water surrounded him, washing in small splashes over his skin and clothes, rasping into bloodstains. Just as Mange had said, it was respect that kept the royal family going. Only those born with shamanic blood could wield royal power. That was exactly what Darden lacked. His body literally tolerated that power, yet all he had to do was swear his allegiance to gain a little of it from those with shamanic blood, and even the lycanthrope, the leader of the werewolves. Only someone approved by both tribes would be able to inherit the king's power, and the first vampire had tried to take it away, and so the magic had eluded him. It was like a duel for someone's heart. Darden realized it himself. Tears washed down his face, mixing with the scarlet congealed blood. He knew he couldn't make someone change their feelings. He knew from the beginning that she wasn't in love with him. 
When they were at social events together, her gentle gaze fell in a different direction. The blue eyes looked only at Lord Healy. Even realizing this, Darden hid behind a mask of class status. No matter how hard he tried, he would have no chance of affecting how Selene felt about him. His head bowed in a bow, pulling his body, which was held by his sword. The first vampire asked everyone who heard him to take care of the princess for him. And to Selene he said one last thing, that she would forever be his princess. His body could no longer hold its weight. Dardan fell breathlessly, gradually turning to ash, making all the vampires that were at the altar or in the city of Autumnal begin to disappear. Meanwhile, the lords and werewolves were bathing in the sunlight that brightly emphasized Suoha's figure. Healy looked into her eyes with pleasure which brought tears to her eyes. She rushed to him, binding him in a tight embrace. At last, no one interfered with their enjoyment of each other's company. But it seemed to have lasted so long. Ainge turned to her highness from behind her back, apologizing and putting her hand over her heart. But Soa didn't want to be called that because she was still barely used to it. The kingdom was already gone, so now she was so hot. The main character thanked Mond for waiting for each of them, finding the lords and taking care of them all these years. The woman glowed with joy and bowed in a bow, saying that she was just doing her job. The girl then turned to Heli and the others to thank them as well for all of them coming to save her. Everyone could now exhale in relief. It was their duty after all, and moreover, it was what their hearts wanted. Mange interrupted their eye contact by asking what was in Miss Sua's plans. The protagonist's face reflected resentment as she wasn't sure. The kingdom and Darden were gone, and she was now no longer a princess or even a queen, so she wanted to get back to her own life. She would return to her life, being Soha in high school, becoming the person she was before the protagonist asked what Healy wished for. He answered the same thing, except now things wouldn't be the same. The boy held out his hand to her scrutinizing her satisfied look and squeezing her small hand. Indeed, something had changed. There were already rumors floating around the school that vampires had finally disappeared, turning to ash. Moreover, most of the residents of Atonal Town were these creatures. Fortunately, the place had become a ghost town. Everyone was freaking out at the mere thought that this could have happened on Earth. Either way, they were all safe now. There was no need to fear the vampires anymore. Moreover, they shouldn't suspect other humans of it. So I was happy to hear this from the girls of this school, who suddenly became excited when they saw Healy and his friends walking towards them. The schoolgirls greeted the guys with admiration, which was mutual. Everyone was worried about them because the vampires had disappeared for a while. A bunch of fans surrounded them, not giving them a pass. Of course, it was stressing them out. Healy sharply replied that they had personal reasons, but Sean brightened up because everyone could take it easy since the vampires were gone. The brothers didn't let him finish, adding that it was for family reasons. Somewhere off to the side stood Sua. She slowly turned and strode away when Healy mentally called out to her, wondering where she was going. The protagonist was caught off guard. She intermittently replied that she was going to the teacher's lounge because someone wanted to talk to her. Thankfully, it was good news. Sua Ha would be able to move in, although she liked her old room too. But the teacher kept insisting because she would have new roommates waiting for her in the new place. She hoped the student would like them. It didn't take long for the protagonist to find herself in her new room. There was no one there, causing Sua to start twirling around in different directions and snagging the bed. It was at this moment that her new roommates entered the room, before whom the picture of the girl holding the bed was revealed. But this did not frighten them in any way. On the contrary, they were surprised at her strength. As it turned out, the screws were lost from the bed, and the girls keep forgetting someone to fix it. But they were glad Suha didn't hurt herself. The twosome ran up to her and together they pressed the bed. Healy appeared out of nowhere and heard that the girl had changed rooms, so he wanted to help. John armed himself with construction tools and took it upon himself to fix the bed. Sean, on the other hand, volunteered to clean the room, pretending that he loved doing it. The others were also persistent in asking what else they could do to help. The girl exhaled a sigh of relief as she was soon to be finished. She was interrupted by a mental contact with Haley, who was asking her out on a date to the plaza. 
just the two of them and no one else. So about her head, hiding an embarrassed expression on her face. But it sounded so great. Except Sean exclaimed that they all had to hurry up and go to the plaza. It was as if the guy had heard their thoughts. But even so, Soahe and Healy could hold hands while spending time together. At Sunshine City School, Khan was celebrating his birthday. The main character happily congratulated him and slipped him a gift she had bought. The other werewolves were also happy that she had come. Today was going to be fun. The gift was a little wolf cub with a bow, which made the birthday boy blush. At that very moment, a foot crossed the threshold. Its owner spoke as if the party was terribly boring. It was Cheyenne, followed by the rest of the vampires. He could sense the boredom as soon as he entered, which was lame. The guy suggested that Soa hurry up and finish up and leave, which made the werewolves furious. They had only invited her, so why did the vampires deign to show up here? As it turned out, the wolves were the first ones to ruin their party, so the guys wanted revenge. Najak demanded a present and tried to escort the uninvited guests out, causing the two to clash even more. The rest of the vampires gambled on, presenting their gifts, which included a bone, a frisbee, and a card on toilet paper, but Sean had brought something worthwhile, a portrait of himself. The werewolves were already starting to dispose of them when Najak asked why Solon had come empty-handed, though that didn't mean he didn't have anything. The boy held out his hand, causing everyone to stare at him tensely. Angie shook the handshake in response. Soha thanked Khan for the invitation. The guy was also glad she had come, but suddenly asked how things were with Heli. For that sentence, she flashed red and turned into a tomato, but everything was fine. Suddenly he repeated his words. Werewolves love the first person they see on the night of the eclipse for the rest of their lives. Khan would love her, but she also needed to know that this feeling wasn't just because he was a wolf. So I had taken a liking to him long before that fateful night. That was why he had been so happy to see her, and now he was glad that she was the one he would love for the rest of his life. The main character felt resentment for him. Khan didn't want to make her feel uncomfortable about the situation, because when someone really loves someone, they will wish them happiness anyway. He asked her not to worry about him. Instead, just be happy. Soha thanked him until suddenly she was interrupted. The stranger bowed, recognizing her as his princess. It was Luca, a holy knight of the kingdom of Varga and a descendant of Wolfsbane. He was honored to meet her, which even made him kiss her hand. Suddenly someone on his right apologized for his brother's act and surprised the princess. It was Louis, Luca's twin, who was looking after his clumsy brother. Khan didn't expect them to come here. The boys had heard that he had fought Darden, so they were in a hurry. But now the twosome would be protecting Soaha. The protagonist was embarrassed, thinking that it wasn't necessary because she wasn't a princess anymore. Suddenly she was interrupted by Healy, who mentally said that she would forever be his princess to him. After a while, they decided to return. But the werewolves only invited Soha to return defiantly ignoring the lords. It was dark outside, so Sean asked Gino to start the fire even though he could see perfectly well in the dark. The vampire thought it was a great chance to use his abilities because there would be few chances now. The guys couldn't even remember the last time they had used their magic or used it to an unworthy degree. At least Solon had last done it. At the slaughterhouse, Sean countered that there was nothing to be done being a wolf, though he could ride them. The werewolf got angry, deciding that he should do it just to attack his brother. The most useful ability was the one Healy possessed. When the boys turned to the two sum to mumble this, they noticed their confusion. It was clear, they were talking mentally, but for how long? But what about the others? It was so cold on winter break that it seemed strange to Soha. She thought she had taken everything with her before the vacation. But now the girl was realizing that she had forgotten some things. She switched to running until she spotted the girl. An exact copy of her? The stranger recognized the protagonist as the one who had taken her place. But there was something secretive and familiar in her gaze. Solon gave himself up to memories of Vamfield, where he and his brothers had lived as if in a prison. It had been a hellish time. Selene, on the other hand, seemed to be in a dream. Her body stepped confidently across the water until someone called out to her. 
It was the Wolf King who had granted her power. For this the princess was immensely grateful. But was she worthy to form this kingdom? For now the reflection became bloody 